I saw like a like, code that I could actually like analyzing data sets. So. School students and also like particularly like women in my degrees because they also are under representative. Come on over here. The golden line. Yeah, Yale does a lot of outreach to high school students. Right, and that's what Michelle is yeah. trying to do. Yeah. So. So I will be the person along with one okay. other person that's walking yeah. around doing Q and A. So that's why I need to know specifically about the handheld mics. Okay. So this is their. Um, I don't think they need this because you know they don't need it because it's LCDs. But this is their more close back. Mm -hmm. I need to okay. Put the mics. Well, well, the, well, the, oh, for the Q and A, yeah. Mark has them over there. Okay. So he'll just hand them out to you, and um, for housekeeping, housekeeping, if you could tell everybody, if you have a question, because we're streaming this, and 
Please raise your hand and wait for the microphone. Okay. 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 Okay, I'll let you take the helm, Scotty. Because you know where it is. Are you the first presenter? Uh, I am the first presenter. How did you, how did you uh, pick that straw? Look like you have keynote. Oh, this, well, this is there, so I'm, I thought they oh. had everything on here. Um, okay, then you know what? Bring your bring yours up here. What's this going to be like when it grows older? <laughs> okay, we, we don't care about that. We don't care about that. Open the display. Uh. Okay. There you go. Okay, now you can close it. You are. Okay. And I just click right out of it. Uh, yeah. I would actually not like mirroring. I would like it as a secondary. Oh, okay.
be surfing the web while presenting. So well, some people have stuff on the web that they want to show. Oh, up okay. Or whatnot. But this will, will not work. Um, no, I don't need it. Thank you. I'm first after um, the introductions from the first panel. Okay, you don't want to stay hooked up and just hit your B button so it blacks out? Hello, everybody. We're about to begin. Uh, my name is Michelle Hudson. I'm one of the organizers of the Day of Data. So if you have any questions, you can find me and ask me. We have some logistics to go over before I introduce our speakers. Um, this is being live streamed. So if you are uncomfortable with that, please do not ask questions that you don't want the whole world to hear. Um, in addition, the cameras are here. So if you could walk behind them, if you need to exit the room, that would be great. Coffee and snacks are outside. Restrooms can be found if you just keep turning left. So go out the door, turn left a bunch, there will be bathrooms. This event is sponsored by the Yale University Library, Yale ITS, the Yale Institute for Network Science, the Yale Institution for Social and Policy Studies, and the Office of the Provost. Uh, so I think that's everything, and we can just start. So I'm going to introduce Susan Gibbons from the Yale University Library. She is our director, and she will open the day for us. Good morning, everyone. Um, if you are following us on Twitter and, and wish to um, make comments, the hashtag is YDOD2014. That's YDOD2014. And I hope you will um, comment throughout the day. So again, my name is Susan Gibbons, and I am the university librarian. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you 
those of you who are here physically in the room, and I know that we have many of you who are joining us online, and we appreciate um, that you are able to join us today. This is the second Yale Day of Data, um, and this emerged as a result of a workshop that three members of the Yale community participated in, Ed Karras from University IT, Michelle Hudson, who you just saw, and Jill Parchek from the library. They attended a national e-science institute, and as a part of that institute's workshop, they were asked to go around campus and interview faculty and interview administrators about questions around data. And one of their findings was that there was a disconnect, let's say, between the two. That on the one hand, administration thought that, that um, faculty and scientists were quite satisfied with how they are handling their data. And on the uh, side of the scientists and the faculty, there was a sense of there could be more services, there could be more assistance, more help in that area, and we wish that Yale would provide it. So we decided to put together this conference with the help of all of our partners because we wanted to start a dialogue on campus. We wanted to bring attention to the importance of data. We've always been using data, but the role of it now has increased. The scope, the scale, the complexity has gotten much um, deeper, and we hope now that we can see that there's truly a community of users on campus, and perhaps collectively together we can solve some of the problems that we're currently facing, whether it's a tsunami of data, a tidal wave, or whatever, however terminology we'd like to use. So I'm very glad to say that um, our day of data will be uh, begun with our keynote speaker, um, Ben Pollock, who is our university provost. He's also the William Brainard um, professor of economics, and I wish to thank him personally for joining us again in the second year and kicking off our day of data. Ben. So thanks everyone for being here, and thank you, uh, Susan, especially for your leadership here, and uh, 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 Len and others uh, for, for helping organize this and working so hard on this. Uh, I'm very pleased that the provost office is uh, co-sponsoring this event. This is, uh, as Susan said, the second annual day of data, and the response to this has been tremendous. Um, uh, 120 people registered to attend the event, and the demand was so great, there's another 160 people on the wait list, which I think probably indicates just how much interest there is in data around campus. And as Susan said, the events are being uh, live streamed. Uh, I have to say, I've never been on Twitter before. I don't know what that means. I was, I'm a little bit intimidated by that. Uh, it's what a fuddy-duddy I am. As we did last year, there's going to be a bunch of Yale faculty uh, presenting uh, talks about their sort of data-intensive research and talking about how they navigate the problems, the challenges associated with curating and stewarding data. Uh, Yale's had some exciting developments in this area in the past year, uh, one of which uh, I mentioned actually last year, which is the new Census Research Data Center, and the leading force behind that, Pete Schott, will be presenting later on in the day. Uh, I'm pretty excited to see that getting up and running because it's been a long history going back to my time as chair of economics trying to get that to, to, to happen, and it is now happening. Um, we're also going to be talking about the Yale Open Data Access Project at the School of Medicine. Uh, I wanted just to, to talk a little bit about how important data is becoming in research. Data is changing the way in which not only we do research, but the way in which we approach research in general. And this is fairly well understood in the sciences and the social sciences, I think, at this point. I mean, uh, big data has become a bit of a cliche. In fact, sometimes I don't quite know what the border is between big data and small data, but it, it's, I mean, we all understand that's important. We understand university-wide at Yale that things like computational biology and biostats are, are incredibly important in the future of what we do in the life sciences. Uh, but it goes beyond that. So uh, I'm going to give an example from the law school which is a possibly apocryphal story. Uh, there was a, a lecture here maybe 18 months ago, uh, a, a highly empirical, highly data-intensive lecture in the law school. And as people were going out, one of the slightly more, um, I'm, I'm, on, I'm being live streamed, so I probably shouldn't say it, but let me say it anyway, slightly more fuddy-duddy uh, uh, law school professors uh, uh, complained to the person uh, he, he was walking out with, it was a he, I'm not giving away too much there, um, uh, that this talk had asked no new questions. This, this very empirical talk had asked no new questions. Uh, and this was meant to be a criticism. And the reply he got was, 
uh, yeah, it didn't answer any new questions, but it answered a bunch of old questions. And that surely is the point, that there are things we can do with data. We, we can ask new questions with data, but we can also, for the first time, uh, answer questions that have been speculated about for decades. Uh, we're learning in, in the uh, humanities and the social sciences that things that we used to answer with anecdotes look very different when we apply data, and in fact, the things we thought were the answers turn out to be wrong. So these questions about how to handle big data that are well known in the sciences, little known in the social sciences, are going to affect all of us. And we're seeing this right across campus, uh, uh, extending, I mentioned to the law school, but to the digital humanities projects as well, that Susan has been a big uh, leader in. Uh, they do raise new problems, and we'll have time to talk about some of those problems today. The first day of data was primarily, primarily about internal collaborations at Yale. Uh, the way that people here at Yale are addressing cross-disciplinary challenges of working with data. And this year, we're expanding this view to look at collaborations that extend beyond Yale. Collaborations within uh, and with industry, government, and other academic institutions. We have a number of people visiting today from other institutions in Connecticut and beyond, and a warm welcome to all of you. We also have two visiting speakers joining us. Philip Bourne is the Associate Director for Data Science at the National Institute of Health, and he will talk about initiatives uh, at the institutional, state, and federal levels. And Cathy O'Neill is director of the LEAD program at the Columbia School of Journalism, and she recently wrote the very popular book, Doing Data Science. She will address the cultural aspects of data, which has different meanings for different people. Today's program reflects the year that 2014 has been the year of big data, not only in universities, but in the public sector as well. The rising awareness of the issues surrounding data policy have been very much in evidence here on campus, and at the institutional level, we're responding to this a number of ways, in particular with various advisory committees meeting right now to look at some of the uh, key questions to address. Uh, at a recent conference of provosts I was at a couple of weeks ago, I'm finding that similar committees are forming right across the country. Uh, there are new regulatory issues to worry about. There are issues about the uh, uh, new compliance we have to do with data uh, coming from uh, public funding agencies for research. So I'm very pleased that this is not a one-off event, but the start of a series of programs involving Yale faculty, postdocs, and students that will, hope will continue throughout the year, and we hope that this day of data is going to be an, an annual event. Uh, I'm very grateful for being here today, and I encourage you, all of you to be involved in the year ahead. I, I don't want to hog the floor here, so I think what I'm going to do here is stop and allow uh, people to ask questions, either of me or of Len or of Susan, but I might first just ask Len and Susan if they have any comments they want to add. All right, so I, I think I want to focus my comments on what some people might be wondering is why exactly is the library involved in data? And why is the library pushing this question? Um, because in many ways, um, the traditional view of libraries is the physical book. And yet, here we are uh, co-sponsoring uh, an event on uh, data. And the answer to that question is a shift that we're seeing very much within the library world, which is libraries moving beyond just the care of the physical collections and moving upstream in many ways um, in the research process. So traditionally, libraries were involved in collecting the end result of research, which was often in the form of a book or a journal article, and bringing that to a campus so that others could build upon that knowledge. What we're seeing now, though, is that the same skills that librarians have been applying to that process can now be applied to the research much sooner. An example being, as you go out for your grants, you're often being asked, and you will increasingly be asked, to create a data management plan to submit with that grant. That plan will ask you, how are you going to store your data? How are you going to arrange it? How are you going to curate it, preserve it? How are you going to make sure others who need access to it can identify it, find it, and use it? That is what libraries do. We have been curating and collecting and preserving and helping people to discover and gain access to information all along. Now we can start to help doing it in a very different realm, which is with um, data. But in order for this to happen, I think the librarians need to be involved earlier in the process, almost as soon as the grant writing happens. 
And we now have on our staff two data librarians who are available to work with you to create that data management plan so that when you're ready to submit, you have some um, guidance on how to do that. And we don't work within a vacuum. We are working with other data librarians across the country who are familiar with the requirements and the growing requirements of those federal funding agencies. So as you can see, it's the same skills we've had all along, but we're trying to apply them now in a very different way to help all of you in your research. Um, and I hope you will, through this conference and through conversations with us, start to see the role that the library can play with you and um, we welcome being one of your collaborators. We welcome being someone who can join you in this process. And it'll be our job to sort of bring to that conversation an understanding of the resources that are available to you from Yale, whether from University ITS, from High Performance Computing, from the other institutes and centers. And perhaps we can be that networking function. Perhaps we can be that node on campus that is aware of what others are doing and to say that what you're trying to accomplish has similarities, has patterns that we see in other research that's going on, and we can perhaps be the ones to help you come together and think about collaboration in ways that you might not be aware of because it's so difficult to move across the silos of the university. So libraries support the entire university and we move across all disciplines. So to leverage that cross-disciplinary nature of the libraries for the support of your own research to help to find those colleagues, those who can help you. And we can hopefully also build a community of practice. The um, intellectual powerhouse of Yale is incredible. And as you struggle with your questions, your methodologies, or even how to store my data and how to do it in different ways, Again, perhaps the library can be that source that will help you find others who can think about the problem with you, that we can be the collaborators and the glue that brings it all together. So I wanted to take that opportunity to make that pitch because it is a very different way of thinking about libraries, but it's one that we are now well positioned to serve that role. We're ready to hang out our shingle and say, come to us with your data questions. And I hope you'll take that as an invitation um, to contact us. And now I'll turn it over to Len. Good morning, everyone. How's everyone doing today? Everybody seems kind of quiet. That's OK. Um, so uh, first of all, thank you to all the organizers who put this day together. I, it really is a fantastic event on campus. And it probably is uh, w the thing that's going to be the catalyst to really move us forward. Because at the end of the day, when you think about what it's going to really take to move things forward, um, it's people. So I'm sure you know, the CIO is here in front of the room. And probably the thing you're kind of wondering is, what great technology am I going to talk about? Um, and I would love to do that. Um, but I don't think this is necessarily the forum to get into all the details. Suffice it to say, there's a fair amount of things going on within IT that are very exciting, particularly in the area of high performance computing. We've been expanding our capability in that space. Uh, I'm very pleased to announce that in partnership with uh, faculty on campus, we've received our second NSF uh, grant for cyber infrastructure. Um, our first grant was approximately $500,000 to implement a science network, very high speed network, 100 gigabit network that connects our major labs on campus to our high-performance computing clusters. That's very exciting. And our recent grant is approximately $800,000, again, awarded through the NSF. And that's going to allow us to um, put some new technology in that's going to increase the efficiency of the network. It's a, a technology called software-defined networking. And we're working very closely with the computer science department on the implementation of that technology. So we're going to continue to build out uh, infrastructure. Uh, we're growing in other spaces as well. We're growing in the space of security and privacy. So as we think about some of the high performance computing, continuing to work in areas like genomics and bioinformatics, we're actually looking at ways that we can put in high performance computing capability that's HIPAA compliant. Uh, so we can, we can deal with uh, the privacy issues and the regulatory issues we have around data. So you'll continue to hear more and more and more about those things. Um, so. Um, I was asked actually to respond to some of the comments Ben 
uh, uh, was talking about. So first of all, don't let the man fool you. He's not a fuddy-duddy. He's a very highly sophisticated uh, technology user. I know it firsthand. Um, uh, the, uh, and he's, he's, he's very much like many other faculty and researchers on campus that have great demands of technology. Uh, one of the things that uh, Ben uh, did say is uh, this notion of answering old questions and answering new questions. And, and I wanted to respond to that by saying sometimes we don't even know what the new question is. And, and, and the, the capability we now have with big data uh, conceptually, we're starting to look into areas where we're looking at a predictive uh, modeling of big data sets. We're looking at prescriptive analytics, and data that can start to find new discoveries and answer the questions before you know what the question actually is. So uh, we continue to do that. We're looking at ways to implement technology like data visualization. Clearly, you know, big data is a, is a very popular term, um, and I often ask people what they think big data actually is, uh, but uh, it's, to me, it's just simply, it's something that uh, just takes too long to process. If, it's, if, it's, if you can't move it, store it, uh, uh, process it, manage it, uh, preserve it, it's probably too big. And that's the problem. Sometimes we have data that's too big. And it is an arms race. We continue to try and grow our infrastructure to deal with it. Um, but I think uh, the real challenge is going to be how we think about using the data, what capabilities do we have, and what new technologies can we implement. So uh, IT continues to grow and evolve. Uh, in the last several years, we've been uh, building a stronger unit within the organization. We're currently searching for Senior Director of Research Technology, and the exciting uh, thing about that position is that we're partnering with the Provost Office and the Dean, the Deputy Dean of Medicine, and what we're, what we're doing there is uh, imagining the creation of a Center for Research Computing on campus, something that didn't exist before. And uh, why is this so important? I think it's important because, um, you know, again, at the top of the pyramid, how we get at solving some of these problems is really about people and putting the right people in place to start to work together and build communities across campus. There's lots of benefits of bringing various disciplines together to solve common problems, whether they're common algorithms, common programs that they can share, uh, or just have a place to go and communicate and work with their colleagues on some of the things that the, they're trying to solve. So I'm really excited about some of the changes going on in IT, really excited about the partnerships that we're building on campus, and uh, I'm really excited that um, uh, the, the you know, there, this, about this collaboration that's been formed between ITS, the library, and other institutes on campus to start to focus on some of the big challenges around data. So again, uh, thank you for having me here today. And uh, any questions? So any questions for any of the three of us? Kathy. Yeah, I have a question. Um, oh, hold on, microphone. Right in front, no? Okay. All right. Hello, is this working? Yes. Okay, um, so I'm really excited about the librarian as the sort of um, the data manager or like mm -hmm. consultant of ma data management. And one of the things that it strikes me is like really, really needed for a lot of people I, I talk to who use data um, is this concept of anonymization mm -hmm. and in particular de-anonymization. Mm -hmm. So, for example, I was talking to a startup that is kind of surveillance in New York City, and they didn't understand, because I was a little bit worried about people, you know, the privacy. And they told me, oh, this is not going to be a problem because we're going to open source all the data. <laughs> and I was like, no, no. <laughs> that's not what you do. Um, so it, there seems to be like a real lack of understanding of what it means to de-anonymize so-called anonymized data sources. I know this is just one of many, many different things, but one thing that's exciting to me about the idea of the librarian's role is that they, there's at least a, a person who's sort of like in charge of, of making sure that the data users are informed about this kind of issue. Mm -hmm. I, and it's, it's one where I think the, the one way we can move forward, and I hope we move forward, is sort of in data classification 
and that classification says with this data, this is what can be used. I think what happens right now is we each sort of come up with our own classification scheme. We have a sense in our mind how the data can be used and reused by others, but we aren't able to convey it in a way that makes sense to everyone else. So if we can start to think about what are you know, the five levels or six levels that reflect things such as the reuse ability, um, the anonymization of the material, the, the privacy, the protection that has to be there, then it ends, you know, in the librarian's mind, it ends up being a metadata field. It ends up being a classification that we express as we uh, index that data. Um, but first we need that classification system for us to then apply it. Um, and privacy for librarians is an issue that has always been on our mind, and there's, there's many federal laws and state laws that require us to protect, um, you know, if you're circulating a book, no one can, can know what books you're using. So for us, that, that's something that we've always been on the forefront of our mind, and I think we can apply to it. But in order for it to work, we need some standardization. And standards is another area where libraries are, have, have been at the forefront of creating national and international standards so we can communicate without having to pick up the phone to say, with this data set, you can do the following things. And so I, I think you're right to, to point out that there's classifications and other things that we can be applying to the data. Other questions or comments for me or for Ben? Yes, sir. Hold on, we have a mic coming over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm an epidemiologist uh, who is on the edge of retirement. <clears throat> and as I think back over my career, I've, I've got massive data sets sitting on, uh, all, all at Yale, mm -hmm. sitting on either very large, now brittle tapes or floppy disks that nothing can read. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's, it's a very practical question about actually how do we physically store these um, these data sets now, mm -hmm. let alone make them available to everybody else, which we want to do. But it's just, it's just a, a, a very, uh, so far I've, I've not found an answer to this problem. Topic. Yeah, my favorite. it is my favorite topic. Ben knows this is my favorite topic because digital preservation is an area that, that I, I'm trying to bring um, a lot of attention to. So you're, the problem you are describing is a problem that we see in many different fields. So for example, when, when the Beinecke Library receives the papers of a great writer, what we receive are boxes with papers, and then floppy disks, um, audio tapes, every kind of, of, of format you can imagine. So we've built up a digital forensics lab within the library to help us either emulate what was the operating system, the software, um, and the computer to try to get that data off, um, or to, if we're lucky enough, we actually get the parts and we reconstruct what that computer was. So there's actually groups on campus who are thinking about the digital preservation problem, which I think then connects very nicely to your question, which is I now have content, regardless of what the content is, a manuscript or if it's data, that needs to make it to the next generation. And how do we think about what activities we can do today to either catalog that it exists, it's in this format, to get from you as much knowledge as we can about the data so that when you are, have retired and you're no longer on campus to help us, we have enough information to try to do our best job in stewarding that data to the next generation. I'll be over next week. All right. Maybe Len has comments on that as well. Yeah, I would just I would just add to that that you know that I I think as we continue to um, evolve, we'll start to see technology that will kind of fill fill in some of the some of the middle space there. So so clearly preservation, uh, curation are some 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 very key things. But uh, we need to start to build platforms that have uh, the capability of ingesting high volumes of this data across the institution. So we have a, a question of of uh, ingestion or the creation of the, the data. I think we have a question of storage, where we're gonna store that, and not have people necessarily think about some of the, some of the typical things that you would wanna do with data, like you know, after a certain amount of time, maybe you wanna move it to uh, less expensive type storage devices, maybe you wanna archive it somewhere else, opposed to you know, very expensive, uh, fast running disks. Um, so, so we have the, 
the ingestion to capture. We have overall management on an ongoing basis. I think we'll need to continue to work in that space. And then last piece is uh, dissemination. And I think you know new technologies, that's going to give us the ability to actually take some of this curated data, some of this data that's being preserved, um, and make it available to the world. I think that space in between is also an important place where technology is going to play a big role. Hi, Amy Justice. I'm from the medical school. One of the things that I think needs to be considered in this discussion that hasn't been mentioned yet is the whole role of the uh, Human Investigations Committee IRB review. Because typically, when one puts in a proposal, uh, one is asked to say when they're going to destroy the data. And the feeling is that that's a protection for the patients who are involved in the study. So that comes in direct conflict with with the goals that you were expressing, and not to mention the goals of many investigators who are very nervous about destroying data for all the reasons that you might think of. So I would just suggest that it, I think it's very important that IRB leadership and national leadership, really, in terms of how IRBs are set up and what they are expected to do, must participate in these discussions, or once again, the investigators are going to be put in between the two groups who are telling them very different things. I don't know whether to respond or just say, I, I, I don't think that we've sorted out nationally where we are on this. Uh, we've got this real tension between uh, IRB and, and HIPAA on the one side, privacy rights, as, we, as the first question uh, alluded to, and uh, the wish to make data available and to preserve data and to be able to reproduce results and so on. And I don't, I'm not, to be honest, I'm not that confident we're going to end up in a good place. Uh, I, I, I mean, again, this isn't going to be a, I don't mean Yale end up in a good place, I mean the nation end up in a good place. I, I think that these tensions between uh, privacy rights and, and uh, access are real tensions. Uh, and in some sense, the history of the IRB, the history of the human subjects uh, law and, 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 and practice in, in the US doesn't fill me with enormous confidence. Right? I mean, we, we, we've kind of groped towards procedures, and we kind of know how to do them, and we, then we all copy each other. And we're looking around, what should we do with this case? We go and see what whatever Florida State did last week uh, or last year, and so on. And uh, it, I don't think any of us think, but maybe I'm wrong, I don't get it, but I don't, I'm yet to meet somebody who thinks that we arrived at where we've arrived at with IRB rules by really sitting down and saying, how should this be? Um, so we end up with over-regulation in some places, and possibly insufficient privacy uh, um, uh, regulation in others. Uh, so I, my, my, my worry here is we, we will see this, we will see that historical process, that sort of accumulated regulation and law without necessarily thinking it through abstractly and saying what we should do. I think we may see that occur again in this area. Um, uh, it, it's, uh, it's a frustration for many researchers, uh, the tension between privacy and big data. Uh, that. that uh, uh, and, and, and just what has to be private. If we, if we, if we apply the full sort of IRB standards to some of these large data sets, uh, then we end up doing what we all have to do this morning, which is sign a form saying we're allowed, it's okay to see our faces on TV, which, which my gut feeling says at some point in time is over-regulation. Right? And some, at some point, some part of me says, uh, are we really going to live in a society where we can't have a discussion with, the, with and broadcast to Twitter without everyone having to fill in a form? That's, that seems a pity. Uh, but I fear that this this isn't going to end up in a great place. And by the way, it isn't just going to be a U.S. debate. It's clear that the European law, particularly on the privacy side of things, may end up being what drives it, because it's, it, it seems like the Europeans are being more restrictive on privacy, in some ways in a good way, right? Because there may be a lack of protection in some areas in the U.S. But I'm not confident. I mean, other people may have different views. I'm not confident this is going to end up in a good place at all. I've often thought that if the American taxpayer knew how much money is spent in research for regulation, that they might have a very different view of the roles of IRBs. Uh, I chaired an IRB. I certainly, I was a patient advocate before I went to medical school. I certainly am a believer in patients' rights to privacy. But much of what goes on in that discussion has to do with protecting the institution rather than protecting the individual. And it's really not about communication and information. It's really about protecting uh, institutions. Uh, 
I'll have something to say about all of this later on. But um, I wanted to ask a different question, uh, which is something that to me that seems quite fundamental and I haven't actually heard mentioned yet, which is the notion of cultural change. So with this emergence of the importance of data, uh, it seems that there's a, there's a cost uh, of time and energy associated with that. Um, that and it also speaks to a different kind of scholarship, of valuing scholarship in a different way. If, if you're expecting investigators to spend more time uh, helping with the process of making data more usable, that sort of, in a sense, elevates data, the value of data within the realm of scholarship. And it needs to, clearly, if that's going to happen, there has to be give and take. So there has to be reward for that. I'm interested in what Yale thinks about that cultural shift and um, anything that's happening that reflects that. I think it's a discussion for everybody. I and mean, the reason it's difficult to say it, the, the sentence that caught my eye or the phrase that caught my eye is, is quote, what Yale thinks. And, you know, the, the, uh, there are whatever, some number of thousand people at Yale, and my guess is you've got a thousand different opinions uh, on, on that. I think we're all uh, struggling with this. Um, uh, I, it's interesting when we talk about this, these preservations of data issues that, that Susan mentioned, uh, and, and you know, given that the students coming from the libraries. Um, we've dealt with thinking that the preservation of information, uh, we, we've dealt with the idea that that's important in the humanities uh, for, for hundreds of years. Right? So our traditional view of the libraries is, is, uh, as storing uh, written text and preserving written text, or in the case of our libraries, uh, also uh, uh, storing um, uh, uh, ancient pre-manuscript texts on, on uh, which are written in, uh, what are they written on, they're clay? Uh, so th th these issues are, have been around for uh, libraries on the history and humanities side for a very, very long time, also in art history, uh, and so uh, we're seeing them spread, we're seeing the same issues now spreading into the, into the sciences. Uh, I, I, my gut feeling is that the, is they're not that, that, that they're new issues in that the scope is much bigger now, but they're not really new issues, right? The idea that it's incredibly important to preserve information and to make information accessible to others, and with all the uh, uh, accompanying uh, problems of privacy and regulation that go with it, I think that in some sense they're just the enlargement because if the data is much bigger. They're the enlargement of issues that we've we've been uh, struggling with for a long time. I should let Susan. Okay, this is really Susan's area more than mine, but that, that's that. I, that my gut feeling is, again, there isn't what Yale thinks, but I think, that, I think that this isn't quite as new an issue as we're claiming it is. It's, a, it's, a, it's the same issue writ much larger. I think the perspective I'd add to that is um, I see an interesting tension within the humanities as the humanities moves towards more data use and the digital humanities are emerging. There's a natural tension within the humanities as to whether that is good research and whether it is okay to be a digital humanist and be accepted within your discipline, particularly when your output might not be a book or an article, but may take a very different form and may take a digital form. So there's an interesting tension on that side of it. And on the science and social science side, there's an interesting tension around um, the burden of caring for your data and, and sharing it with others. Um, and so in many ways, I think there are, there's, we're all sort of coming together around a similar set of problems across all the disciplines. Um, in a way, in the past, we had seen ourselves in, in very different places. That for the humanists, the end result was the book. And of course, you saved all of your copious notes of how you got to, and the footnotes identified everything very, very carefully. Now in the digital, humanities world, how does that look like? How do you reference? How do you point back to? So I think all the disciplines are, are struggling with this new world where you need to convey much more of the underpinnings. And how you convey those underpinnings is, is sort of what we're struggling with, and then allowing replication or reuse. Um, and so while I think we look at it right now as a burden, as soon as we're on the other side of the equation and benefit from reusing someone's data that has been really nicely documented, curated, preserved, and easily accessible, we'll start to see the value and, and start to internalize that value, and hopefully as institutions, start to recognize that that's an important part of the dissemination process.
So I'm a, a professor of sociology in the School of Forestry and Environmental Studies, and I teach a course on, uh, or teaching a course right now on big data. And one of the things that I'm ha having a hard time with, and I'm wondering if the library or IT is going to help with, is just as important as the data are the, the methods we use to analyze them and, and that sort of thing. And I know that's not the focus of the today, but I'm wondering, is there going to be more, are there going to be more resources uh, in terms of, it, when I think of my students, I, it would be nice to be able to send them to some sort of workshop instead of having to work with each student individually on different methods and things like that. So some sort of maybe intensive training or opportunities like that on whether it's like uh, programming skills or working with databases. And so as we've been uh, imagining what uh, the Center for Research Computing would look like, uh, we've been thinking that uh, one of the key things that they need to do is not only create community and bring people together that can share methods and techniques, but also provide some other services from the center, one of which would be uh, something like the equivalent of application development or programming support. So someone who can work with your students and with you and with other researchers that you're working with to help develop your, your code. Uh, that's one important thing. <clears throat> and the other thing that we realize should be part of the mission of the center is, is to provide seminars, workshops, training, so that the infrastructure and the technology that we're providing to you you'll be able to, to leverage it the best way possible. So, so the hope is that uh, the center will be providing that for you. Let me comment here too. Um, going right back to the CYC, the committee that, that changed the curriculum at Yale, which is more than a decade ago, uh, we've been struggling with uh, how to coordinate better our, our early uh, entry-level statistics classes. And, uh, and one of the struggles that was there then, and I hoped would have gone away by now but hasn't, is that different fields feel very strongly about, have very strong disagreements about what are the basic packages you need to learn. Uh, so in, the social, in my area of the social sciences, we end up teaching our students uh, essentially boot camps on how to use uh, Stata, uh, and it, we just think it's just a waste of time for them to learn some of the packages that they might learn in, 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 in the stats department. Uh, and the stats department has similarly strong views the other way. Uh, so, uh, um, and these are, these, these are strong and difficult social norms because it's fr frankly true that in my field, if they don't know Stata, they can't get a job. Uh, so uh, uh, you know, it would be nice to have a common standard across the sciences, statistics, and the, and the more quantitative social sciences, but we aren't there. Um, uh, I don't actually know what the solution to this is. I think some of it needs to be uh, kind of boot camps for, for in, in the relevant fields where you learn these things. I don't particularly think you need to have a whole semester's course on how to use Stata, for example. It's really just uh, you know, a couple of weeks to teach people how to be an RA and teach people how to have the, the, the necessary techniques. Same with, same with some of these programming skills. Uh, but there is this slight, it's unfortunate that we see this divergence of what are the right packages. Because really what you're talking about, I think, is basic programming and the ability to use a basic statistics package. Uh, wrapped up our session. Please join me in thanking Ben for coming here and sharing some time with us today. <laughs> and we are now going to shift over into our uh, next session, and Gary Kidney is going to be our moderator. Thank you, and hang in there. We'll be right back. I'm Gary Kidney. I work in academic ITS, and I'm going to introduce three people to you who will be part of uh, the next panel. This panel is an interestingly diverse panel. Come on through. You're going to hear from a grad student, a postdoc, and a professor. You're going to go from black holes in the center of galaxies to Australia's outback for, uh, and to political behavior of America. So uh, the first speaker will be uh, Vivek Ashok. Uh, Vivek is here to my left. He is a PhD student in the Department of Political Science. His interests are political behavior, quant methods, and politically, uh, political economy. His research looks at the effects of information about income e inequality in voter attitudes and behaviors. And in addition to that, he manages the ISPS Behavioral Research Lab. 
Uh, sitting beside him now at the moment is Hannah Haney. Uh, Hannah is substituting for Clara Bowern, who would have been our speaker today on uh, uh, Australian languages. Uh, Clara is uh, unable to be here. Hani is the postdoctorate associate of linguistics at Yale University. Uh, she's a specialist in historical linguistics and language documentation, particularly on the languages of Australia and some American Indian uh, angles. Her work involves not only the linguistics, but also cross cuts to anthropology and evolutionary theory. And I'll introduce our third speaker, who doesn't appear to be here yet, but we hope he comes popping in before his uh, uh, time to present comes up. Paolo Coppi is a professor of astronomy and physics. His main interest is in high energy astrophysics, particularly what happens with gas and radiation physics near where black holes meet in the universe. Uh, in addition to that, he leads a, uh, a project called Yale Quest in Chile that looks for non-stellar fo variable phenomena through the world. So first off, Vivek. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being here, and thank you for letting me present about uh, what we've been up to at ISPS. Um, so my name is Vivek Ashok. Uh, I'm the lab manager at the Institution for Social and Policy Studies Behavioral Research Lab. And over the past year, we've set up a behavioral research lab, and we are we are open for business now, and I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the lab, about behavioral science research in a laboratory setting. And so the brief overview of the talk is that I'm going to first talk a little bit about lab research in the social sciences. I'm going to talk about what we did at ISPS and what we're doing differently. I'm going to talk about the data gathering process, and I'm going to talk about what we're thinking about moving forward. So just like the sciences, social scientists have developed a number of theories over many, many years. And a number of these theories uh, give rise to questions of cause and effect. So as a political scientist, I'm interested in why people vote. We have a theory that tells us that in closer elections, more people turn out. But in closer elections, also see greater media coverage and more campaign activity. So how do we, how do we disaggregate the effects of each one of these things? Uh, and a good way to do it is in the lab, in, in, in by performing an experiment. Um, in a more practical terms, uh, governments and academics care about the effects of policies. So if we roll out a school voucher system, what is the effect of the voucher system on standardized test scores, let's say? So, Social scientists have been doing randomized experiments since the 1920s, and they're attractive because we have control over both the treatment and the assignment to treatment. More specifically, a lab experiment of the social sciences uh, contains some common features. Uh, first, uh, subjects are recruited and brought to a common space, a common physical location. They engage in behaviors that are recorded and are tracked, and they do so all under the direction of a researcher. So these are the common elements of a lab experiment. And they've been very commonly used by psychologists and behavioral, behavioral economists uh, in their research. The unique features of a lab compared to other contexts where we can do experiments are the following. So we can more precisely administer treatments. Uh, so when presenting a video, I know the quality of the video is going to be equal across all participants viewing it. We have control over outside influences. So I can control the level of interaction people have with each other while taking part in the study. And I'm able to collect a lot of data before and after the session, building a richer data set than average. And finally, sometimes we do want outside influences, and we want people to, people to be able to collaborate and to compete with each other in the lab. And so we're able to assign them more complicated tasks and monitor their behavior. So what's different about the ISPS BRL? The first thing is that we are truly interdisciplinary. 
So we're allowing for research of many different types in the lab. We're equipped to deliver behavioral gains using a software package called Ztree. Uh, we're able to deliver survey experiments with tighter control uh, using Qualtrics or any other web-based platform. And we also have Media Lab, which allows us to deliver rich media, like very high quality videos. Uh, and I think probably the most important thing about our interdisciplinary focus is that we're constantly evolving at the BRL. So as researchers approach us with new needs or new methodologies pop up, we are ready to incorporate them into what we can deliver. So how did we set up? We, we set up with the generous support and encouragement from a number of people, um, primarily the Institution for Social and Policy Studies, the Center for the Study of American Politics, uh, and the Yale Law School. Um, and specifically, uh, we'd like to thank Jacob Hacker, Alan Gerber, Greg Huber, Robert Post, John Bullock, and Ernie Marinko. The first thing that we thought about was the space. So we needed a place where participants could enter the lab from the street with minimal disruption to anyone else in the building, and they could proceed conveniently to our lab space. The second requirement that we thought about was our technology. So we purchased 16 workstations and a server that can handle delivery of these three different types of experiments, primarily. And we worked with network operations to set up a network with the bandwidth and the re reliability we needed to deliver rich media to the workstations. We worked with the Human Subject Committee for us to develop a participant pool to have people that are willing to be invited to take part in sessions, and also just maintenance of the lab. And finally, we worked with Treasury Services to develop a payment protocol where we can pay the participants that come into the lab in cash and then reconcile those with researcher accounts later. So what we, what we had when we did all of this was a lab space. So this is our entrance between 87 and 89 Trumbull. Uh, I'm sure many of you have passed it. And if you see the sign hanging, it probably means we have a session in progress. And then the space itself. So this is, this is the lab. Um, in setting this up, there were challenges, however. Uh, and I think what our greatest challenge was is control. So the advantage of a lab, as I said before, is that the researcher can control almost every element of the participant experience while they're in the lab. Uh, but what that means is there needs to be control over the workstations, and there needs to be a lot of uniformity between the environments that participants are experiencing when they're in the lab. So we had to control people's access to programs, to drives, um, make sure that uh, a participant couldn't plug in a USB flash drive and copy data, um, along with websites and other system settings. And the way we attempted to do this was by using local policies in Windows. Um, but they were pretty ineffective. Uh, the first thing is there are, are hundreds of um, selections that you need to make, and once you change one on a workstation, you have to go to every workstation after and make that same change. And so it was very ineffective. And so um, ITS endpoint engineering really came to the rescue on this. Uh, and we added the workstations to the Yale domain uh, and then created different user accounts for each type of study. Uh, and now what we're able to do is we merged these local policies into a group policy. Uh, and all the accounts are managed centrally on the server. And so if I make one change or allow new access to one part of the computer or a new website that's reflected across all of the workstations. So while we did most of this in-house and wanted to have a lot of control over the way we saw this lab developing, um, we did run into some obstacles and, and ITS really helped us out. So now we have the lab, how do we gather data? Um, we gather data both in and outside the lab. We gather data at three specific points. The first point is at registration, the second is in the lab itself, and the third is any after session data that we might choose to gather. And all of this data can be merged into one data set. 
So upon recruitment, and we've been doing this since spring, where we've been reaching out to Yale students and staff to join our participant pool, uh, when they register, they're assigned a user ID and an account and asked to take a pre-survey of about 30 questions. And this pre-survey asks questions about demographics, the background, some political attitudes, um, some personality traits. And um, this is managed by a cloud-based tool developed by Sona Systems. Um, and what's very nice about this tool is that we are then able to create researcher accounts for the researchers that will be using the lab. And what happens on this cloud site is that participant data is updated in real time and researchers have access to it immediately while protecting the confidentiality of the participants. So partic participant data is updated and then researchers can invite them to take part in studies that they would like to field in the lab. And based on these 30 different criteria, they can get the sample that they want. And they can invite them directly. And all that communication happens through the Sona Systems website and is monitored by uh, administrators in the lab. And finally, the, so this data is not only interactive to the researcher, but is also downloadable as a data set. The second point of data collection, of course, is in the lab itself. So during, the, during a session, we collect data on all the behaviors that, uh, that participants undergo. And we also uh, compensate participants about $15 an hour for their time. That's what we're asking researchers to compensate participants. And depending on the type of activity, there might be financial incentives as well. And so participant uh, Participant behaviors as well as their payment and attendance is recorded. And throughout the sessions, participants are only identified by this user ID that's generated upon registration. And at the end of the session, now we have data on attendance, your behaviors, and your payment. And so what this allows us to do at the end of a session is build one big data set um, of the pre-survey and the session. And we also document the protocol itself, uh, the experiment itself that's delivered, where the randomizations take place, so on and so forth. And we reconcile the cash payments that we advanced from the Treasury Service with the researcher accounts. We update the participant profiles online uh, with their attendance information. Uh, so future researchers who may wish to disqualify participants that took place in a certain that took part in a certain type of study can do so and depending on the discipline of the researcher uh, they may get pushback from reviewers at certain journals uh, about how representative their sample is and so we have a way of directing researchers to outside sampling firms to replicate their protocol so moving forward, what are we thinking about? Uh, right now, we are mostly spending our time on recruitment. We would love to get as many students and staff members as possible in our pool. Um, we're inside Yale at the moment, but are certainly thinking about uh, recruiting subjects from outside the Yale community. While at the moment, it's pretty streamlined for a participant, uh, we're thinking about a way of gathering all the materials that a researcher would need to be acquainted with the lab, uh, the things that we ha are able to offer, and put it in one place. So uh, part of the website that we have at the BRL should be dedicated for researcher use. That's something that we're developing. Um, and something that we've been thinking a lot about is how to archive protocols, not just data and the programs people write to analyze data, but how, uh, how, what is the best way to archive an experimental protocol, especially when some of these files are very specific to programs that might not be in existence 20 years from now. And we would like researchers to be able to find a protocol and run it. Um, even if the original program used to deliver the experiment is no longer available. Uh, and I'm sure we're missing things, so I would love to hear from the audience about what your thoughts are about the lab, what we could be doing differently, and what you would like to see us do in the future. Thank you, and please sign up.
So I'm going to take a, an entirely different tack here and um, talk a bit about how data has changed the field of linguistics in, the in terms of the types of questions we can ask and answer. Um, I'm going to be speaking in place of Claire Bowern, who's unable to be here today. Um, but I'm talking about a joint project that we worked on together, so hopefully I'll be able to do her justice. So um, linguistics is a field that has always relied on data. It's a, it's a field based on empirical observations about how people use language, how languages change over time, um, and how languages are. Um, so we use a lot of different types of data to understand speech, language, and the use of language. Everything from fine details of acoustic signals to broad corpora of actual spoken or written data. So data has been an important part of linguistics for a long time, but the scale of the data that we have available to us has been evolving, just as it has in many other fields. Um, linguistics is unique in that it cross cuts a lot of other areas, including both humanities and social sciences. Um, so we find interactions between linguistics and fields such as anthropology, um, and even harder sciences such as biology. Um, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about a specific question um, that we've been able to get better traction on using a larger data set than has been available in the past. Um, and specifically, I'm going to talk about sound symbolism in Australian languages. So what is sound symbolism and why do we care about it as linguists? Um, well, one of the fundamental ideas about language um, that can be traced back to Saussure in the early 20th century is that the relationship between sounds and the meanings they represent is an arbitrary one. So we as English speakers know this this thing here in this picture as a horse. And there's nothing about an H or an O or an R or an S, those sounds that uh, that has any relationship to this animal, right? They don't represent its, the sound it makes, or the way it moves, or the way it looks. And in fact, in other related languages, like French and German, entirely different sounds are used to represent this thing. So there's really no relationship between the sounds that we use to represent this object and the object itself. But we know as linguists that there are, there are places in language where that arbitrariness assumption gets violated. Um, so there are places in language where the associations between meanings and the sounds that represent them are iconic in nature. So just for an example, we'll look at a different creature. And if we're speaking northern Sierra Miwok, you would call this hekeke, which if you know what a California quail sounds like, you might recognize that as something that resembles the call of this quail. So here we have a really non-arbitrary associ association between a thing and the sounds we use to represent it. We find this in English, too, with conventional patterns, like the use of gl, the, the sound sequence gl, to mean something about luminosity. So we have words like glimmer and glisten and glean. And if we had other words come into the language with this gl sequence, um, we might expect other words that come into the language to represent things about luminosity to also use this gl sequence. And finally, we have a more, art, a more abstract type of symbolism that's been studied in linguistics, where higher acoustic frequency sounds are associated with meanings of smallness or nearness. So this is, this is a, a rather abstract or synesthetic type of sound symbolism, where people use specific sounds and specifically uh, capitalize on their acoustic properties to represent things about the real world. So an example is the word kuchuk in Turkish to mean small, uh, small or little. Um, and people have found examples of this in languages across the world. Um, so there's a whole um, number of references listed here where people have looked at meanings that mean small or near or large and far and have found that there's sort of a cline where high acoustic frequency sounds are used to represent those things that mean small or near and low acoustic frequency sounds are used to represent those things that mean far or large. But this is kind of a problem in that um, people have gone about finding data to discuss this problem um, by pulling out examples from languages, sort of at random as they find them. So many of these resources that I've listed here, um, they, give, they provide cherry-picked examples of sound symbolic forms in many different languages. <clears throat> But one of the questions that's remained largely unanswered um, through these earlier methods where people have looked at small samples of cherry-picked data are why sound symbolism arises. So is it something that happens as an accident of history? Um, 
where related languages just happen to inherit the same forms. And so we find the same sound meaning patterns occurring in multiple languages because they have, incur they have inherited cognate forms. Or is it something cultural, where speakers learn to associate sounds with certain meanings, such as the English glimmer, gleam, GL means luminosity example? Or, in fact, is sound symbolism actually something more universal? So thinking about these magnitude-related sound symbolic categories, where acoustic frequency is correlated with size or distance, um, we need to ask, is this an accident of history? Is it something cultural or is it something universal? And debate has centered around this question for magnitude related symbolism because when we have a small sample of, of forms, we can't really answer this very well. So today, um, I'm gonna talk about some claims related to magnitude sem sound symbolism. And that is the old question. So the old question is, uh, what, what causes magnitude sound symbolism to arise in, in many languages of the world. And the new question is, how does, it, how does it emerge in Australian languages? What representations of magnitude sound symbolism do we find attested in Australia? Um, so quickly, I'm gonna take you through a little bit about the prior work, um, talk about the data we've used, and then um, talk about how our results suggest new conclusions about the nature of sound symbolism. So the data we have to work with for this particular study is quite different than what's been used before. Whereas earlier researchers looked through dictionaries or maybe word lists or just their own knowledge of say Indo-European languages, we've actually got a large data set available to us. So Dr. Bowen has collected a lexical database, a database of words from Australian languages that has nearly 800,000 items in it. For linguistics, this is big data, <laughs> especially for an area like Australia where the languages have not been well studied. So some of these languages have very minimal documentation. Uh, we're going to look at a sample of 104 Pamanyungan languages, that is 104 languages that belong to a large language family of Australia, and also 16 non-Pamanyungan languages, so 16 languages that belong to about nine other families from the same geographic area. This is a type of sample, this is a type of sampling that wouldn't have been available to us earlier in the history of linguistics. And we're looking at languages for which we have large lexical samples. So languages for which we have more than 400 words available, which covers a good percentage of Australia. So when we look at our 120 language data set, we have good coverage over Australia, except where you see kind of the broad, empty Western desert, where simply there isn't a lot of uh, population. There's not, not, not a lot of um, languages spoken there. So we've got an empty spot, but we have good coverage of the actual linguistic diversity of Australian languages. So for Australian languages, because they haven't, because no data set like this has ever existed before, we don't know a lot about symbolism. But we do know that in a hand, handful of uh, Australian languages, there's anecdotal reports of symbolism, for example, in things like onomatopoetic uh, animal names and things like that. Um, and there are, there's one systematic study of sound symbolism, but there's nothing that compares across languages. So we don't know much about sound symbolism in Australia in general. And in the few cross-linguistic studies that do exist looking at sound symbolism, Australian languages are underrepresented. The data just simply has not been available before to look at symbolism in these languages. Now, Australian languages are, are an interesting case study to look at for sound symbolism because unlike the uh, more familiar Indo-European languages where some of these ideas about sound symbolism were first developed, or the uh, North American languages where further study of sound symbolism has occurred, Australian languages have unusually small vowel inventories. So if you look at this diagram, we find just three vowels in, that are typical of Australian languages, whereas they have large consonant inventories. So we might expect symbolism to be manifested differently in Australian languages than it is in other languages. So what we did um, was to compare uh, sets of vocabulary that we expect to be associated with sound symbolic sounds. Um, so things that express meanings of bigness or smallness or nearness or farness with the general vocabulary samples we have for each individual language. So we looked at 
um, we looked at lexical samples between 400 and 8,000 items for each of these languages and split it out into categories, general, um, distance, and size related categories. And what we're able to do with this large data set is instead of looking at individual forms and individual languages and using that as, our, as the entire basis for our understanding of, of sound symbolism in that language, we're able to pool language data and examine patterns across the languages of this region more generally. So we looked at percentages of vocabulary. Since we have word lists of different lengths, we don't want to throw away any data. Um, so we looked at percentages of vocabulary that seem to show sound symbolic patterns. Um, and we looked at relative frequencies of sounds within these samples of, um, samples of vocabulary items so that we could see whether observed patterns match our expectations or differ from them. Um, in the past, one of the big questions that's arisen that's been unanswerable about sound symbolism is when we find evidence when we find attested examples of high frequency sounds corresponding to smallness meanings or vice versa, lo low frequency sounds and largeness meanings. Do these things happen by accident? Is it just because these languages have these sounds or these sounds are frequent in these languages that we find these patterns? Or is it something about these words themselves or these meanings? So we're able to better answer that with our, um, with our comparative process. And we're able to measure the contribution of relevant sounds to symbolic patterns in different ways. So we can look at the percentage of sounds in a sample that are of a particular type, or we can look at the percentage of words in a sample that contain a particular type of sound. So we're able to use a simple one-tailed paired t-test to compare our symbolic categories to our general vocabulary samples and answer the question of whether the frequency of sounds in magnitude-related vocabulary is higher than its frequency in the general vocabulary of the same language. So we did this for a number of different categories, overall uh, kind of high acoustic frequency symbolism categories, overall low acoustic frequency symbolism categories, and then subsets of these symbolic word lists that represent meanings of size and meanings of distance. So just to give you a, a little sense of what we're looking at, we're looking at words like these um, for our magnitude-related vocabulary, words like low or shallow, um, words like far or deep, um, and also words like thin, wide, fat, large. So these are the meanings we're interested in looking at. So the results we found are interesting in that they support some of the ideas that have been proposed by earlier researchers, but they also open up new questions. Um, so we were, we were able to identify patterns relating palatal consonants, um, which are a particular type of consonants that are associated with high acoustic frequencies, um, with the kind of overall category of words that mean smallness or nearness, and also individually with those smallness and nearness categories, we found a very strong pattern here. But when we look at front vowels, which are a type of vowels, um, things like E, A, um, that are typically associated with that um, smallness or nearness sound symbolism, we find that they don't uh, generally uh, correspond with these, this high frequency category of symbolism but within the nearness category, we find strong associations. So smallness doesn't necessarily seem to be associated with front vowels as has been proposed by earlier research, but nearness does. Um, and then when we look at high vowels, we find similar patterns where there's a, a less clear um, association overall between the sort of uh, smallness, nearness, and high vowels. But when we look at smallness, High vowels seem to represent smallness in particular. So here we're able to get a finer grained understanding of what's going on with different types of sounds and different types of sound symbolism than was possible before. Um, when we look at nearness, we also find a, a, an association between nearness and high vowels that's not quite as strong as, uh, as what we found for front vowels. And then when we look at the opposite patterns, things are a little bit messier. So we found pretty good associations between the smallness and nearness meanings and some of the sounds that have been proposed to represent those types of meanings. But when we look at largeness or distance, we find that the patterns aren't quite so clear cut. So we find, um, we find relationships between velar consonants like k or g um, and meanings of distance, but we don't find very good associations between those same consonants and meanings of size. Um, when we look at back vowels, which are another uh, category of sounds that are supposed to be symbolic, so vowels like oo or o, um, we find 
kind of mixed results. Um, we don't have a very clear cut pattern for how these relate to distance and size meanings. Whereas low vowels seem strongly associated with both distance and size meanings. So we've got complicated results happening here for distance and size. So looking at the results more generally, we find good support for the sort of high class symbolism and more uh, messy support for this low class symbolism, but there's a stronger association between high frequency sounds and smallness or nearness meanings than there is between low frequency sounds and distance or, uh, distance or size, large size meanings. We find better support for magnitude symbolism in consonants, in the distribution of consonants across words, than we do with vowels, which is an, another interesting finding that's not been, it's not been discussed before. And we can relate this to Australian languages and their, their relative inventory, relative phonological inventory sizes. So as we discussed before, Australian languages have relatively few vowels, but a lot of consonants. Um, and so we can help to determine whether this is a function of inventory sizes or an independent fact. So we expected associations between these high class sounds and front vowels and palatals and high meanings, and we found that. We also uh, expected uh, associations between these low class sounds, so back vowels and palatal, uh, back vowels and velars, excuse me, there's a typo, and uh, low meanings. And we found symbolism in both meanings that are associated with size and with distance. So magnitude symbolism seems to be robust in both of these domains. But we found some unexpected things as well, that earlier studies that were based on, again, these sort of cherry picked examples from a small number of languages wouldn't have predicted. So we found that for Australian languages, consonants are more robustly associated with magnitude symbolism than vowels. And we also found that smallness seemed to be uh, better supported, uh, seemed, to, seemed to be associated with more symbolic sounds than largeness. So um, just looking at what's going on with sound symbolism more generally, here's where we have an opportunity to answer questions that weren't very answerable when we were just looking at small data sets. So for Australian languages, do these patterns of sound symbolism that we find across languages arise from some sort of universal tendency for people to express meanings of size um, or distance with certain sounds? Or does it arise for other, meaning, other reasons like language-specific origins, where these languages just happened to have, by chance, uh, uh, developed words for these meanings that happen to include these sounds? Or could it be that these languages, because many of them are related, have inherited the same words and sounds and sound symbolic patterns from a common ancestor? Or could it be, as we find in the Americas, that sound symbolic patterns have spread aerially from one language into neighboring languages and so on and so forth? We're able to gain traction on this with our large data set. So we're able to find that um, it's unlikely that this is a language specific thing that just happens to co-occur at random in uh, many languages of Australia. So we find very widespread patterns of sound meaning associations. And specifically, we find um, symbolic associations between sounds and meanings in 54% of the languages in our studies. So using Fisher's exact test, we can compare uh, the occurrence of sounds in magnitude and general samples for each individual language. And we find good evidence that most of the languages in our sample show sound symbolic patterns. There is some variation though in exactly which type of sounds get used to express these sort of symbolic meanings in these languages. So although most languages show some evidence of sound symbolism, they employ sounds differently in symbolizing meanings. So, we can see that there's a widespread preference for using certain types of sounds for certain meanings, but there's a lot of local variation in how these things are manifested. This isn't necessarily a surprising finding, but it does help us to, to rule out language-specific origins for these things. We can also figure out whether there's evidence for sound symbolism being a genealogical uh, process in these languages. So looking at Pamanyungan and pa non pamanyungan languages, that is languages from these 10 different language families, we can, we can demonstrate that sound symbolism shows up in languages across all of these language families. <clears throat> we also find that within different subgroups of the Pamanyungan family, we find 
significant sound meaning associations. Um, and finally, when we, when we run more sophisticated statistics on this data set, we can find out that there's very little phylogenetic signal in the sound symbolic patterns that we find. So using a measure of, um, of phylogenetic signal, Blomberg's K, we show that there's very little evidence that this is something that traces through the phylogenetic trees that relate these languages to one another. Um, I'm gonna skip a little bit through this aerial origins uh, section. Um, we tested for spatial autocorrelation in the data as well. Again, something we can do because of our, the data that we have and the coverage that we have of Australian languages. And we didn't find any specific spatial autocorrelation within this data set. So this leads us to believe that there's good evidence for sound symbolism in Australia. Um, that we find some of the same patterns, especially in terms of the types of vowels that are used symbolically in these languages, as in elsewhere in the world. But we have a more complex pattern arising where we've got evidence for vowel height and vowel frontness to be involved, and the significant use of types of consonants that have never been reported to be associated with symbolism. So we, in, to sum up, we have support for this frequency code idea, this idea that there's a universal tendency for people to use acoustic frequency to encode information about size and distance. But we have a lot more information now about this, the language internal factors that uh, help, uh, help to determine how this sort of symbolism is implemented from language to language. Thank you. There are questions later, right? I'm not sure who. It was Kopi. Okay. Let me get it. Right here? Yep. Uh, under, 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 underneath that one. Underneath that one? Underneath that one. Let's that one. close that. Move it out of the right. way. Yeah. Yep. That's it. Yeah. Okay. Because you can make it full any inch. Yep. Let's see. Where is it? Inch. Where is it? In the thing? Uh, slideshow. Full screen. Oh, slideshow. Okay, thank you. So um, I'm here, I guess, to tell you a little bit what, what's going on in astronomy and uh, astrophysics. And uh, astronomy is a branch of physics. Some people will disagree with that, but it has uh, um, connections uh, to that. And the talk will fall on a bit on the themes that came out last year, where there were talks by physicists and another astronomer, and also um, some people doing um, climate simulations. Uh, <clears throat> this is a big overlap. Okay, so this is the kind of stuff I do. This is our introductory. Uh, slide when I show up and give a talk. The guys I started out being interested are these, which are mass, supermassive black holes that uh, you might think are strange systems. They have gravitational singularity. They eject matter at the speed of light uh, with, with these jets. Um, but through big data type things, through, in, in the sense of we develop surveys that can find for, more and more objects, we found that almost every big galaxy has a black hole at the center. All right? And moreover, if we take our galaxy as a black hole, and if we take the matter that fell into the black hole, and we think we kind of understand what's going on, um, and compute how much energy was, was released by the matter as it fell in, it's a huge amount. And if we spread that energy all over the galaxy, our galaxy would be blown to bits to infinity. So these little black holes that turn out to be everywhere can dramatically disrupt and change the structure of the universe that we see. So as time has gone on, this used to be a kind of esoteric study for people who like built atom bombs and stuff like that, because that's the kind of regime you're in. But now it's connected to other different kinds of astronomy. Okay. So first thing, um, if in terms of computing and big data in astronomy, what often happened, the first real need of big data was in studying systems like this. The reason this kind of system is complex is um, in order to figure out what's going on, you're in a regime where you have gas and radiation going around, but the gas often has a low density. So that means two gas particles hitting each other. Um, they're not really particles. They can go through each other. So at a given point in space, you can have uh, photons and particles passing right through each other. So to understand what's happening, you need to understand how much stuff there is at every point in space. But not only that, you have to understand how much is moving in every particular direction with, with which velocity. So your problem is not a three-dimensional problem. Where is the stuff? It's also where is it moving and how is it moving. That's a six-dimensional problem. 
And as you quickly discover by looking at the universe, I'll show you in a second, the universe and astronomical objects are not steady in time, so you had to add the time dimension. So if you have, I don't know, you sample some d dimension, like, okay, I'm going to study this system, and I'm going to take a box a meter in size and chop it into hundreds, okay? And I do that for all the other dimensions. My problem grows uh, as a complexity of hundredths to the seventh power. You, you double the amount of resolution you have, your problem gets in incredibly complex. So the reason why certain provosts and, uh, and general deans that recruit faculty in astronomy always groan when the astronomer walks into the room is, Whatever you throw at it, I, I can suck up whatever computer power you need. And it's the same situation um, if you go to the climate studies people over here. If you do weather prediction, you need to have great uh, control over the boundary conditions and lots of computers, uh, the initial boundary conditions. So you need to sample, for example, the temperature of the Earth on meter squares. That's what we kind of do now. And then evolve it forward in time. And if you want to get to 10 predictions 10 days down the road, you need massive supercomputers. Someday we might want to go for hundreds of days or do global climate change. Our computers are not up to the task yet. We're getting there. And it's a miracle we managed to get uh, where we are now. Um, but that's why there's always, from the theory side, okay, try and understand climate, which is not astronomy, but the climate, the weather around here, there's an insatiable demand of computer power. All right? And why is it big data? Because um, you need the largest number of computers, clusters. These days you do things in parallel. And for example, a cluster at Yale has 10 terabytes of RAM. And so if I'm a simulator, I don't have access to the full cluster, but if I'm at supercomputing clusters, national supercomputing centers, I do. Um, I'm going to be dumping out snapshots of what's happening around this black hole as often as I can, all right? Uh, which means maybe you're going to let me have 100 snapshots. So 10 terabytes times 100 snapshot is, snapshots is one petabyte, which kind of counts as big data. So that's always been happening. The thing that's changed, and I'm actually here to talk about, is the other aspect is connects to her talk. Um, when people did astronomy, the stereotype was as a per person climbing up on the mountaintop, looking through his telescope, freezing to death, and finding some really weird object that exploded. And as often the case in her case, that was a cherry-picked object, okay? Because um, they were looking at one point in the sky, and we'll see about stars exploding later, and they just happened to see this one. And for the first, from 1950 to 1970, there were maybe a, sort of 100 supernovas known. A supernova is a star in a death row that explodes and makes a very violent explosion. And um, they're all over the universe, but you have no idea where to look, and they last for 10 days. And if you don't happen to be looking in the right direction, they're gone. Okay? Um, and so people made up theories of supernovas. This is the archetypal supernova. This is what they all should look like. And everybody went to work explaining it. And then as the time has gone on, we now have samples of thousands of supernovas. And guess what? They all look different from the first one that was discovered. Okay? Maybe uh, uh, like the sounds, the frequencies are all wrong in her case. And um, maybe a better example is we look at our own solar system. Um, at first, we thought we were unique. Then from studying the motions of wandering objects in the sky, we discovered planets. All right, there are a few planets that are a bit different from us. But um, maybe everything else looked like us. And you open books, there's a nice theory for how the solar system formed. Then now we found hundreds of solar systems, and most of them look nothing like ours. Okay? Um, so we're learning something from a lot. So it's the stage where big data and technology allows you to expand the sample sizes that, where the big progress comes in. And to extend, expand the sample sizes, um, where we're at these days in astronomy also is big data in the traditional sense of petabytes of data. So let me tell you a bit about that, <clears throat> okay? Um, and there's a project at Yale which kind of classifies uh, as big data. I'm sorry, the quality is not quite so good. Um, what happened was <clears throat> that in high energy physics, there's a person called Charlie Balte who worked in uh, building physics, uh, cutting edge physics detectors. And one way that you measure uh, how particles interact in a particle collider is you put a bunch of silicon strip detectors that basically capture the charge from when a fast particle comes in, and you collect it, and those are called charge couple devices. And at one point in his life, he got sick of particle physics because we've discovered everything that we can discover, kind of. So he went down a few floors and talked to these astronomers. You know, I know a lot about this CCD charge couple device. I know how to build lots of them. Can we do something with that? And yes. And so he put 112 of them in here and made a camera with like 161 megapixels, okay? So that's still better than an iPhone, but maybe not for long, all right? And this camera, through various permutations, has ended up on an instrument called the Schmidt Telescope, whose sole purpose is to take large pictures of the sky. So people have always known that they need to make large samples. So what do they do in the old days? Well, all we had was photographic plates, so people literally spent years photographing every single part of the sky. And so our previous knowledge uh, came from photographic plates, but they're not very good compared to CCDs. So basically, this project 
replaced the photographic plate holder with a modern uh, <coughs> optical detector. And, um, and this, to get the project working, also not only do you have to retrofit the telescope, but you have to put in data links. Um, there's about uh, 100 gigabytes of data a night that has to get transferred from Chile, where this telescope is, um, up to Yale, and then some of it is shipped off to Berkeley. And, uh, oops, let's see. Just to put it in perspective what this camera can do, though, um, this picture is more or less right. If you hold your thumb up, that's sort of called one square degree in the sky, and the moon gets blocked by that. This is kind of what the moon looks like on this camera with the sky projected on it. So uh, this takes a picture of a relatively huge swath of sky, all right? Not as big as you'd like, but it's a lot. And in, in, in one night, you can cover approximately a 20th of the sky. So after a month, you can have covered the whole sky, and then you start repeating it. Okay. So that's what we're at. Okay. Um, and this shows you, slightly out of date, how much sky has been covered. In this orange band right here, we visit the sky more than 100 times or 200 times, which nobody else has done quite like that. <laughs> All right. So what can you do when you go visit the sky? You quickly discover that the sky is not stationary, all right? And if you have appropriate software to remove all the noise, and you can see our CCDs, our cameras were cheaply built, and so they're not performing that well. But if you have good noise reduction algorithms, all right, um, you can clean stuff up. And I don't know if you can see this, but there's a spot here, and every two hours, you take another picture, and the spot moves across. This turns out to be a Kuiper Belt object a big asteroid moving slowly on the outer fringe of the solar system. This same camera installed at Palomar um, found an object that was quite massive, in fact, more massive than Pluto, and it caused the demotion of Pluto to be a minor planet, if you've heard about that. This was only possible by scanning the whole sky and looking for things uh, moving across there, all right? The other stuff is, of course, you can find things that go bump in the night. Here's one of these supernovas. It's a star inside a galaxy, and here's the galaxy flattened out, and then if you look very carefully here, you probably can't see it. There's a bright spot that brightened. So this star is actually outshining the entire galaxy, which is, contains 100 billion stars. So that tells you it's a special phenomenon. What you can do is you can subtract off the, the light before the supernova appeared from the, the galaxy plus the supernova, and you see something called a point source consistent with one super bright star. All right? And you can measure that luminosity. You can plot the luminosity. The brightness is a function of time, and it looks like this. And um, after you collect enough of these objects, you see that there's a pattern associated with them. And you can, there are some systematic effects. The shape looks slightly different. You can correct for it. After you've done that, you can turn this supernova event into something that astronomers really love called a standard candle, where you know the brightness. And knowing that, if I take the apparent brightness and I know the real brightness, I can use the, the brightness goes as 1 over distance squared that you learned in high school. I can get the distance of the object. And using this, um, people have proven, not our data, our data is part of it, but um, have proven that the universe is flying apart as if there's anti-gravity, dark energy pushing it apart. Okay? And you can also do other fun things like this. This is a particular uh, pretty bright star. And when you look at it and you, you plot luminosity as a function of time, you get a point here. You do it the next night, the point's way up here. You go down, you've got a complete scatter plot. You say, what the heck this is going on? This star is crazy. It's stochastic. All right? But if you're clever and you mix around, you discover, hey, what if I take all the points separated by 1.5 hours, and you discover, hey, they're all the same brightness, okay? So this is a periodic blinking star with a frequency of several hours. And if you take the luminosity, and you, it's called phase folding as a function of the period, like every 1.5 hours, you plot those points, you get a beautiful diagram. This is not random at all, okay? So how do you find this, okay? Well, what you can do is you can take intensity as a function of time, and uh, it's kind of a mess because um, this telescope you see has data gaps. There were clouds, stuff broke in the telescope. Um, there are points that are off. This is very noisy, bad data, which causes all sorts of problems for uh, standard applied mathematics stuff. Okay? But if you just go ahead and blindly Fourier transform it, um, you'll see that some strong periods pop out. If you do a modified version, this is a different statistic, same thing happens. And then if you fold this and just require that the points do not scatter randomly and you have a measure like how close are the points clustered, you pick out the same period, and that's what you get. All right? In order to do this, though, I have to go searching. In order to catch this, reduce this curve, for every object, every light curve, I have to search through 200,000 periods okay? and do some other cleaning stuff. So there's actually a non-trivial amount of computation in doing that. And how many objects there are on this sky? Well, it depends what you want to search. But for this telescope and its size, there are up to like 500 million objects that you could search. So if you want to make a complete all-sky survey of these, 
there's a non-trivial amount of big data, pattern recognition, data cleaning, and stuff that needs to go into it. <coughs> All right. So just to give you a feel for what we're dealing with with this particular project, uh, how much data we're talking about here, um, uh, if you consider what you can do from the ground, um, we've reached an interesting point in time. Um, because stars twinkle, unless you do something special, you can't do better than one arc second of resolution, whatever. And that means that there's no point in building uh, higher pixel detectors, except unless you want to somehow sample the resolution better. But um, to zeroth order, okay, this is the best you can do uh, until you play tricks and go into space. And in one square degree box, I had the moon inside it. Therefore, I'll end up having 4,000 by 4,000 pixels, which is twice the resolution of an ultra high definition TV frame. All right? um, and there are 40,000 degrees in the sky. And if you interpret how many frames is that, okay, that would correspond to about six hours of uncompressed progressive ultra high definition video at 60 frames per second. So it's actually not that large amount of data anymore. This was unthinkable when I was in graduate school, but as often happens, this was also unthinkable. Uh, my thesis was done, partly done on a computer, one of the best supercomputers of Cray 2, with two gigabytes of memory, which is unheard of. This thing has two gigabytes of memory, okay? So, um, and then if you put in standard color information, you end up with, um, okay, made a mistake, two times 12 to 12 bytes or two terabytes. Okay? You can hold the entire sky as detectable by human eyes with reasonable telescopes in a few terabytes. Okay? And therefore, you might think astronomy is over. All right? Let me assure you there's lots of th things we can do to add another factor of 1,000 to this. Okay? Uh, for example, um, your eye measures three colors, red, green, and blue. Right? But if you take the light that's arriving you and to disperse it as a function of energy or frequency, you'll see all these spectral lines. It's called a spectrum, atomic spectrum. So instead of having three colors, you'd actually like to have 4,000 measurements as a function of intensity. And then it turns out that objects don't emit in the optical. Most of the radiation comes somewhere else. You want to add a few other decades of energy resolution. And so I can blow up this number. But uh, this has been a holy grail for many years. Just let me make a whole picture of the sky. All right? That's what it takes to do it um, for astronomers for the last 100 years. That's what they expect. And then the next step is the sky is changing. So let's do it again. And in Quest, we have like 100 exposures, a third of the sky. So we're dealing with hundreds of terabytes of data. So that's what we need to deal with. Um, OK. And are there any special data needs besides the ability, the need to crunch this rapidly? OK. Um, this data, unlike other kinds of data, like last year we had maybe a talk by Genesis, the gene sequencing machines are getting faster and faster every year. So if you lose all your data, well, that's not such a big problem as long as you're not sampling a very esoteric population. You just bring in a few hundred volunteers and the machines now are 10 times faster than a year ago and you quickly regenerate your data set. Here, that's not good because um, you may know like there's a crab pulsar, a, a, a neutron star that was produced as a result of a supernova explosion and people went back to Chinese records in 1066 to identify this guest star that had appeared. Okay? The universe is changing all the time and what it looked like in the past is extremely important for interpreting what happened now. So it has deep archival value. This is why people have not thrown away these photographic plates. There are a bunch at Yale. Harvard, is when like two years will have un ended up digitizing like 20,000 of them and they'll be converted into a more usable format, okay? But we want to make sure this data propagates in time and is properly curated. So that's one of the, the, the key things. All right, um, so, so that's that aspect of it. And how's it being handled, all right? Um, so to show you why we're a pain in the neck to ITS and stuff, uh, it's okay. Uh, the data is currently handled by um, high energy physics nodes on Omega and maybe about 40 terabytes of disk space. We have 25 terabytes on the RSS server. Uh, and then we have a mirror and comparable computing power at Berkeley at the National uh, NERSC DOE Supercomputing Center. But right now, to be honest, the bulk of the analysis that finds these R. Leary stars and everything is done by two and a half, four U boxes, white boxes, with 12 Intel cores each and 24 disk space filled with three terabyte commodity drives from Newegg, if you know what that is. And it has uh, what used to be, not anymore, a large amount of solid state drives which allow you to move data quickly, and a large amount of RAM, used to use a lot of RAM, fast rate cards. It's a specialized architecture to move data fast. It's putting a lot of data next to CPUs. So one of the themes that is emerging in our field, a lot of other fields, I think, is having an architecture where data and CPUs are next to each other, because moving data is extremely expensive. So you want to do the computation as close to the data as possible. So this is doing it, and we're running a mix of operating systems. The bottom line, though, is depending on what you're doing, choose the best tool for the task, 
these two boxes cost $10,000, and for certain benchmarks, they outperform Omega uh, hardware at the, with, it costs at, at like the $500,000 level. So there's a big performance difference. Imagine what you could do if you had 100 of these boxes, and we tried to put an MRI proposal. We didn't get it, but something did get, get it. And, um, and this isn't so different from what we proposed. At Johns Hopkins University, there's something called a data scope. It's like 100 machines like I just talked about, and uh, storing the data local to the computer. Okay, one to one mapping of users to know to let them run their custom uh, programs, and they add GPUs, okay, and get rid of various bottlenecks. So this is optimized to handle like astronomy type data where lots of things come in, you have lots of little subunits, uh, files that need to get moved around, okay. The old file system on the Omega supercomputer here was optimized for taking terabytes of data and streaming it sequentially and throwing it onto the hard disk as fast as you could. The kind of analysis we do has millions of little files that need to get gone through and cross-correlated and, and, and put together. So it's a different kind of architecture. Um, but one reason besides my great proposal skills why this probably didn't work is um, Johns Hopkins has a great track record in this kind of area. There's something called the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which is a full, really big map uh, before Quest was made of the sky. And it involved millions of dollars and tens of hundreds of postdocs. Um, and Johns Hopkins was one of the leaders there. So they have a track record. Yale and astronomy does not have that same track record. And I think in other fields, we don't quite have it either. So I'm hoping by bringing people here together that we can all get together. We have the knowledge, because I know we've got people spread all over, and uh, enhance our ability to do stuff like this. Okay. Is there a next generation? Where are things going? It's only going to get worse. Okay. Um, there was this picture of a Schmidt telescope. Okay. And the person standing next to it was like this large. Now the person is this large. And you take a big mirror telescope you've seen, and you squash it down. You make it a very fast lens so it can see a large amount of sky all at once, and you increase the mirror size by a factor 10-ish, okay? This is the biggest, baddest, okay, widest, fastest, deepest eye of the new digital age, all right? This thing is gonna be producing data. It's called the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope. Um, synoptic means daily. It surveys the sky every day, basically. And <clears throat> what's the data scale for this? The numbers, the resolution is not that different from before. Um, they wanna sample the, the profile of the light so they have, instead of one point per pixel, they have five or 10, all right? They can do half the sky every night. So they generate four petabytes a year, all right? And that amazed me and other astronomers until you start Googling around and look at the data sizes of data sets like eBay and stuff. They're also in the petabytes. So one thing that's changed with astronomy is we've been a little spoiled in thinking we're one of the biggest, baddest data generators in the town. We're not. Um, the industry web is far outpacing us. And anybody who has large sensor networks um, they're generating huge time series, just like we did, and you can you eventually will have thousands of sensors, or imagine taking, you're predicting traffic patterns, Google does this to make your uh, Google map, you track 100,000 cell phones and how their velocities go, and you can find traffic. That's a huge data set that's even worse than what astronomers are doing. So we're not necessarily the biggest, baddest guy in the town. In fact, my feeling from looking over this was, help, a lot of stuff is going on. Technology is evolving very fast, and I need to get up to speed and I, even though I've only been here 20 years, a long time, I'm not that old, but I was not trained in any of this, all right? And in our department, I would say mostly the postdocs we hired recently know some of this stuff. The graduate students coming in don't. So somehow we have to change how we teach, acquire the technology, train the new generation of grad students, maybe some of which will have a specialization involving computing uh, data aspects. So uh, not only do you have to, this thing generates some interesting uh, science cases because when the supernova goes off, you have to jump on it with many instruments, and we're not ready for that. But you better know something about data cleaning, which is a, before you do the data mining, and there's an article in the New York Times that said 80% of data miners spend their time cleaning, so they're better known as data janitors, okay? And how to pull signals out of messy data, and then um, you're not gonna deal with the full data set. But I wouldn't be surprised if you took some subset of it, like 10%, 5%, 1%. We're gonna be pulling in hundreds of terabytes over the network, and we need to push it around with ease. That's not quite possible today. So we need to evolve as a university, I think, to be able to do this, because other fields are in the same uh, boat. And <clears throat> that's um, pretty much what I wanted to say. A um, uh, general comment about where our astronomy is going and where the emphasis uh, was needed. At various times, people said, oh, we need the biggest, baddest computers. And other times, people said, no, 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 think before you compute. And what's actually happened is, since I graduated from graduate school, our ability, for example, to simulate the universe from the first perturbations that made the microwave background then collapse to make uh, the galaxies we see today, that ability has improved by a factor of a million in 20 years. Okay? Um, 
half of that in log space, the factor of 1,000, came from the hardware. The other half came from novel algorithms and ways of thinking about the problem. So the people and the knowledge about the problem and the physics and the hardware are both equally important. And to make the best progress, you need to push on both fronts. And um, one way to do that is because uh, astronomers are not necessarily the forefront. It's for all of us to get together and talk. So a proposal might be some of us could meet semi-regularly and talk about what are you doing that's cool in your department, and hey, maybe I can do the same thing uh, too. So that's where I'll leave it at. So astronomers generate and use lots of data, and we need to learn how to move into the big, really big data era ourselves. And some of the tools that you can use are not available off the shelf. We have to develop our own. Okay, thank you. So all three members of the panel are available to take questions. I think we've got about 10 minutes. So, please. Hi, about uh, astronomy. Um, I guess, you know, all the photo pictures are optical, right? So how the weather would uh, affect on that, and how much, you know, you would have discussed, so what would be the cutoff for, uh, for the pictures are not, uh, would it be usable? Right, exactly. That's, that's the name of the game. Um, and so if you require the pristine conditions, depending where you are, if you're in New Haven, none of the nights are usable. Where this telescope is mounted in the middle of the desert in Chile at very high altitude, where there are very few clouds, even then 10% of the nights are lost. But some of them you can recover because um, even though there's a cloud, um, the distortion is not so bad from the wind. The cloud absorbs a lot of light, so the stars are dimmer than they ought to be. But if you have enough area on the sky, you can see, hey, all the stars are dimmer, and you can compare in the past, and you can actually correct that out. So there's some real-time corrections you can apply that enhance your probability of success. And, but as you saw in those gaps, we were losing 5 or 10% of objects. And um, some people take the attitude, I only want clean data. But if you do that, you lose, oh, sorry. You lose the, some of the time series, like for, you're looking for periodic objects, and you throw away all the bad data with some criterion, uh, you will lose detection power. So what people tend to do is you specify how much data do I throw out, and you assign a quality criterion, and then you adjust that. But one of the tricks is to figure out how is the weather. And so astronomers now have weather classification systems or auxiliary telescopes like this LSST, well other telescopes whose sole job is to figure out what's happening with the weather and the transmissivity of the atmosphere and everything. So that's a, that's a crucial point. And one way to get around that is to put your telescope in space and forget about it. So there'll be a next generation space telescope, for example. But that's what makes our life so difficult, is we'd like to have a nice continuous data train that's evenly sampled and you apply your Fourier theorem. Well, no, you lost data for three hours and this data, the error bars are twice as large. And so you need a system for doing knowledge inference based on fuzzy, messy, yucky <laughs> data. So that's, that's the future for us. Just a quick uh, note to the panel speakers. As you are answering questions, please come up to the podium to answer the questions. Thank you. Sorry. Ideally, uh, the data would be uh, saved uh, raw in archive form. Um, but it, are there efforts to period of time? The changes in all of these images would be just slight. And, and uh, is there an effort to like, compress the data over like? Yeah, you, you can absolutely do that sort of like video compression in the same way. The problem is though that the range of astronomical timescales um, is large. I can show you like one of these blazars, the black hole, its luminosity changes by more than luminosity of a galaxy in five minutes. It's, it's a trick involving relativity, but it's doing crazy stuff on five minute timescales. Okay, and other things take years or uh, 100 days. So uh, coming up with a suitable time frame depends on the science that you're doing. The people in this LSST project are doing exactly what you're saying, but they're having big debates. All right, how are we going to compress it, and what are we going to analyze it by? And different scientists want to have different algorithms. So the best thing is if somewhere in a vault somewhere you still have the data, when someone comes up with a clever idea, you can, you can find it. Another thing that compresses data is if you look at our data and make a picture, most of the sky, 95% um, is filled with noise, all right? But unfortunately, if you know where an object is and you have 100 exposures and you add them together, what was previously noise, the signal will actually pop out. 
And so if someone else later discovers an object and you threw the information away because you compressed it because I didn't find anything there, you've lost some discovery potential. Of course, there are funding and space constraints and everything, so you do what you can. Ideally, though, every single pixel has information. Um, it's for people down the road who have different ways of analyzing it and different thoughts and, oh, that was a really interesting phenomenon. What? You threw away <laughs> all that data. So, um, and the human eye um, um, doesn't care about things with frequencies much faster than 20 per second and stuff. So we can throw away a lot of data and JPEG stuff um, that you can, you can uh, help with. Um, you can do some compression. There are lossless compression algorithms. You can gain factors two or four, and people will use those. And we use that. We have a gain of factor of two by compression, but not factors of 10 or 50 like in video uh, compression. So that's a huge topic for and something to be discussed. Hello. OK, it's on. Um, first of all, that's messed up about Pluto. I think we can all agree on that. Um, my question is, I have a quick question for you and also a question for the linguist. Um, first of all, um, what do you have an explanation for why the things that we observed, like the supernovas, are, were outliers in two different ways at the same time, one that we observed them and the other that they looked nothing like the ones you then later saw? And I'd love to hear that explanation. And my question yeah. for the linguist is, um, as I understand it, and I might have, I was in the bathroom, so I might have missed the part of the talk where you talked about your data. Is this like a snapshot of the current state of languages? And to what extent, I mean, obviously languages evolve over time. That's why we have a, a genealogy of, of languages. But what is the time frame that would, where you could actually see that happening? Because that's like one of the most fascinating questions for me about language. Thank you. Yeah, in our case, it turns out, for example, if you look at the sun, and that's the first star you ever saw. It turns out to be completely average, okay? But when you have, it's just small number statistics. Um, there's some chance always that you'll find a guy, and, uh, to be honest, yeah, most objects are not such large outliers. But if they were rare and you take the first one that shows up, oftentimes it's not represented. Like if you're admitting students, you want to talk to several people. Never do, uh, unless you absolutely have to, don't trust what the very first person tells you. That's, and if you have to bet, okay, you'll bet that he's an average person, but there's always outliers. Just regarding the, uh, the situation with language documentation and the language data we have, um, in some places we're really lucky to have historical documentation. So for the European languages, we have records that go back quite a while. For Australia and many parts of the world, it's, it's very like many parts of the world, where all we have are the things that were attested in this century. Um, and many of these languages are not spoken anymore. So we have a snapshot of what these languages looked like, perhaps in the early 20th century, perhaps later in the 20th century. Um, but that's what we're looking at is one snapshot in time. And what we as linguists are trying to do, especially we historical linguists, is trying to leverage that data to figure out what the data tells us about the past. So those phylogenies you were talking about, those have actually been constructed from data about attested languages, not about historical languages for most parts of the world, where we're actually able to use the contemporary data to reconstruct the past. So we've got a window of about 10,000 years, most people think, for that. Yeah. So about language, I mean, have you looked at the relation between emotion and the actual acoustic signature of the words? Because this must be com common across languages quite a bit. There is work on that. Um, so uh, it's one of, it's called corporeal sound symbolism in the sort of Hinton et al schema of sound symbolism. So there's, there's definitely work on how acoustic frequencies signify things about emotion and state of mind and things like fear and anger, yeah. We don't have data about that for these Australian languages. We don't have any, um, if you have a corpus of actual conversations, you might be able to extract information about that, but we have limited data. So in order to keep us on schedule, let's take a few moments and thank the panel and then maybe five minutes to get set up for the next uh, uh, speaker. Thank you.
Okay, let's get started with the, uh, the next session. Test, 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 one, two. I'd like to introduce our first of two keynote speakers today. This speaker is the first Associate Director for Data Science appointed at the National Institutes of Health. Formerly, he was the Associate Chan Vice Chancellor for Innovation in Industry Alliances, a professor in the Department of Pharmacology in Skaggs of the Skaggs School of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences at the University of Cal California, San Diego, the Associate Director of RCSB at the Protein Data Bank, and, and an adjunct professor at the Stanford Burnham Institute. I welcome to you, Dr. Philip Bourne. Thank you, Karen. It's very nice to be here, and uh, I've enjoyed the morning so far. Um, so, as was said, I'm actually the first person in this job, and it's really, um, I guess I don't know how far I can think ahead, but I decided you're having a day. Um, I'm thinking in months, and also grants tend to be the, on average of the order of four years, so that's sort of uh, at least some of the thinking that goes into the title. Um, so what, what I'm, the question I'm going to kind of address here today is, uh, what is NIH's overall approach to data and what does it mean to you? Uh, and I know some of you here are not, uh, in fact, in the biomedical arena, um, and so, but I think this kind of generalizes, uh, and, and certainly based on discussions I've started to have with the other agencies, uh, which I've, frankly there hasn't been enough of in the past, um, I th you know, I think it translates. So just let me give you a little context of how um, things got started, at least in the NIH space. Um, uh, the director of the NIH, Francis Collins, uh, realized several years ago that, uh, that, the, that the data revolution was coming to biomedicine and uh, uh, convened a working group to look at it. And that led to a report, which the findings you can see here on the screen, um, the kind of things that are fairly obvious, um, sharing, uh, cataloging, training, the kinds of things we heard about today already. Um, one thing I would emphasize that is the idea of support for all of this throughout the research life cycle. So this has to go on from almost from the, the moment that ideas are formulated to leading to hypotheses, to uh, questions that are asked, to data that's generated using software, uh, which leads to results which are then disseminated, including uh, in the literature, but now increasingly in other ways, which is, has been mentioned. And another part of that was the idea that there would be someone to sort of uh, lead this initiative, and uh, which I think is an expression of the importance of this, this, this kind of role. And in fact, I report d directly to Francis Collins in this role, and it's seen very uh, important within the NIH. It got kicked off uh, by uh, Eric Green, who's the director of the Human Genome Inst Institute initially, uh, and that led to something called the Big Data to Knowledge Initiative. So I'm going to sort of uh, not talk too much about uh, these things or that initiative per se, but some of the findings and some of the directions that we're going in, uh, which I think is important to institutions like Yale, uh, because not only will it tell you where the funding uh, areas are likely to go, but I think it also speaks to uh, a general philosophy of what we're, how we're thinking about things within the NIH and how I'm interested, I'm interested to see how that mirrors to what goes on uh, in an institution such as this. Because we refer things, as you'll see in a moment, to the notion of uh, the NIH becoming a digital enterprise. And in many ways, that's kind of what we're talking about here. And that has some very interesting connotations, I think. Um, so let me just give you a little, uh, my own bias, because uh, so you can take with what I say with a grain of salt. Uh, until six months ago, I was a tenured faculty member at UCSD, and I gave up the sunshine and tenure to do this. Um, but uh, I certainly don't think as a Fed at this point in time, and hopefully I never will. Um, and I'm also very much into the e-science and open science movements, of which I've been part of for a number of years. So let me give you a few observations that uh, we haven't necessarily heard about. Um, uh, I'd say... Uh, today so far. So first one is we talk about the promise of this big data, but I would argue we don't even know 
uh, the value of the little data. We don't really know the value of the data that we've already got. At least from the point of view of the federal agencies, we don't actually ask the right questions. We ask questions like, okay, well, how many terabytes are you generating? How many people are accessing them? And, and, and that's about it, you know. But when you start digging down into the granularity of the data, who's accessing what data object or research object, when and why? And those are the sorts of questions that are not asked, which is kind of ironic because those are the questions that data-oriented companies ask themselves every day. And one of the reasons I would surmise that we don't ask these questions uh, is because we don't actually think as a business. We don't think in terms of supply and demand about this. And my argument would be going forward, we're going to have to think about this uh, 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 as much more as a business than we do today. Because what we're doing, as you'll see, and I'll emphasize this a few times, just doesn't scale. Um, so we've already heard about the value of curation and, and so forth. And, but, you know, that is expensive in terms of time and money. And when you do that, it's at the price of something else. And the question is, what is that something else and how do you evaluate uh, how much you should, you know, how much time and money should be spent. These are not uh, simple questions. And then if you start to look at data retroactively, it becomes really expensive. And I know this from personal experience with something like the Protein Data Bank, where for several years we spent about 40% of our budget retroactively reviewing and, and essentially homogenizing the data that we already had so that we could actually com you do comparative analysis that no one perceived as being important when we first started collecting this data, but became comp uh, important later on. So we're now much more educated about the importance of, uh, of, of this kind of activity, um, but if you have to do things retroactively, it's very expensive. And then I would say, and you'll see how we're structuring our thinking in a moment, uh, but I would just say that good data begats trust, Trust, trust begats community, and community is God. What I mean by that is the idea that nothing that we do, being the NIH, uh, should really be done without the, the community driving it. And we just know from previous experience in a, a series of different resources that that community gets, has to trust in what we, what's being done. And you know, good, da good data is, is essentially key to that. And we certainly experience that in, again, I'll just cite my experience with Protein Data Bank, um, that getting that community trust probably took five years of running the resource. Uh, and that involved engaging the community in every single step of what we were doing around defining standards, uh, around uh, the kinds of uh, applications that we provided uh, on the data and so forth. Uh, as I said already, what we're doing is not sustainable. I mean, you can be a first grader and you see two graphs. If you look at biomedical research and you look at the current um, funding levels, and I, I'm anticipating that these aren't going to change significantly in the next several years, they are decreasing uh, in biomedical uh, adjusted inflation dollars. And yet, any, any graph you want to look at vis-a-vis -vis the data, it's growing uh, at, at huge rates and in the way that we just heard in the previous talk. So, you know, how, how do you reconcile this? And I think, uh, so s this then comes into this idea that we really don't have a business model right now, uh, for currently for scientific data. If I look at a few observations vis-a-vis uh, -vis what's going on at the NIH that needs to be addressed, is we have a little idea how we spend, uh, well, how much we spend on data. I went round, there are 27 institutes and centers at NIH focusing on different diseases, different organs and so on. I went round to every single one of the directors and I asked two fundamental questions. You know, how much are you spending on data-related activities? And, how, and then the harder one was how much do you think you should be spending? Um, what we do know approximately, because uh, we've scraped extramural databases and so forth and looked at things intramurally that we're probably spending well over a billion dollars a year on data-related activities. It's probably much more than that, actually. And of course, how you define it makes it a little difficult. But uh, we don't have much idea on what we should be spending. And that brings out a natural tension. Um, the tension is a sort of a culture clash between the more observation, in terms of biomedicine, the more observational history and the new analytical approaches to discovery. And there's tension within uh, organizations uh, 
whether they be uh, you know, medical centres, um, uh, academic medical centres, or whether they be the NIH, uh, about those relative those constituencies. So th it's it's these are all things that uh, that need to be considered. So let's see here. Uh, okay. So the observation I would make for an academic medical centre is the idea that the it, it's not that different to what we have at the NIH. You have a set of, effectively, uh, of, of silos of information. And what, you're trying, what we're moving towards with this notion of a digital enterprise uh, is really breaking down those silos to some extent. And I think data is an example of a catalyst that can make that happen. So an example of that would be, and maybe it exists here, but I haven't actually encountered it anywhere else yet, is, and I actually wrote about this in an article, but the... Uh, is the idea that if you look at students coming in, increasingly those students are doing at least part of their training online, they're, they're, they're taking online testing and so on. But if a student does exceptionally well in a particular fragment of a course, then at, there, there's no way currently for really that information to be conveyed to the professor who has a profile which, which would indicate that they're an expert in that particular area. So that kind of cross-connection could highlight to you the kinds of students uh, that would be, uh, would be really valuable. Unless you're actually teaching that course, you probably wouldn't uh, make that connection. And that's just one trivial example uh, of the kinds of cross-cutting that can take place. Um, and that, to me, is the whole idea uh, of this digital enterprise. So within uh, the Associate uh, Director for Data Science Office, we've come up with a mission statement that sort of reflects this. The second part of that uh, in italics is really just taken from the NIH mission itself. But what, what we're trying to do and what's going to be reflected in funding calls and so forth is help enable this notion of an ecosystem that takes us to this digital enterprise where we uh, increase the rate of discovery uh, by virtue of how we use data. So it's, it's more than just about big data. Although big, and I, I'm not necessarily a fan of the term big data. Uh, for reasons I'll get to in a bit, but I think the important thing about it is it brought me here. It brought, you know, it, it actually brings attention to the whole problem, and, and I think that that's uh, that's that's definitely a good thing. So I guess the, one of the things we need to ask ourselves is what what are the kinds of things we're trying to solve. So one of them, which I've been harping on already, is sustainability. So uh, if if we have this model where we can't currently sustain what we're supporting, what are we going to do? Well, right now what we do as a federal agency is we fund something, we fund something, and then one day we say there's no more money. And, you know, that's not a healthy model. I mean, another model is, to, is would be what I would call a 50% business model. So we're going to say, here's a grant. This year you're going to get all the money you've had in the past to sustain this data. But that's going to ramp down by a certain amount for the next four years until it's at a 50% level. So you've got this amount of time to actually figure out how to uh, sustain that data more efficiently, and that could, that could mean a number of things. Um, it can mean a partner, it can be merging, it can mean a, a whole a series of things. Um, so, you know, the, that's just one example. Other examples, efficiency. Uh, we already heard a little about the issues with patient data and, and, and having uh, access. Uh, one of the things that we're looking at is the notion of uh, the trusted investigator. So right now, if you want to, for example, access data in a resource called dbGaP, which is uh, genotype to phenotype information, every time you want to do that, you have to go and, and get uh, new approval. Uh, there's the notion of being a trusted investigator where you actually have a blanket approval that allows you to access this data. Of course, if you lose that trust uh, through some event, then um, it's like being uh, disbarred, I suppose. So we're looking at this kind of model. I'm not saying that's actually going to happen, but I think uh, there's definitely a uh, need for creativity in this kind of space. Uh, reproducibility has been touched on here today a little already, but clearly this is something that really worries uh, the folks where I sit at the NIH. So you can imagine the situation that the, uh, a congressman and woman is sitting there reading the newspaper and reads, as has been published, that whatever it was, 60 to 70 percent of seminal cancer studies could not be reproduced. Um, and they say to my, themselves, why on earth are we giving the National Cancer Institute four and a half billion dollars a year if all this work can't be reproduced? This has potentially very worrying ripple effects uh, 
throughout the research enterprise because all of that would trickle down uh, if that happened. So there's a, a very avid effort right now uh, with across all of the 27 institutes and centers to actually look at this reproducibility problem. And clearly, data accessibility, software accessibility, in fact, accessibility of all the research objects within the enterprise um, uh, is, a, a, is a, a, a step in that direction of dealing with it. Um, and then the whole accessibility. We were in a situation where when clinical trials are run, uh, there was suddenly a discovery that many clinical trials weren't even registered, even though that's the law. So there are lots of uh, these kinds of nuances around clinical uh, data as well. And then I'll say a little more about trainees in a second. So the idea is to create, uh, help foster an ecosystem. And I see that ecosystem as effectively a three-legged stool. There's the community, there's the policies that go uh, into place, which is sort of the top-down. So I would see that these are essentially the policy is sort of a top-down approach and the community is a bottom-up approach. And then, of course, you need the infrastructure to support all of this. Um, and then on top of all of that, I think what you really need is you need uh, the notion of a virtuous research cycle. And this was actually drawn at a recent workshop we had, um, a, a sort of advisory group that came in to uh, provide some information. This was actually d drawn by uh, uh, Dave Glazer, from, uh, the chief engineer at Google. Uh, and the, the notion is that none of this is going to happen without there being the value to the investigator who's going to be required to do some of this. We can put policies in place, but if there's no value in doing so to the investigator, getting them to do it is going to be extremely difficult. So these things need to be harnessed such that when we do some of this, whatever it is, whatever policy we were put in place, whatever infrastructure we put in place, we do so in such a way that it's, it adds value to uh, what can be done with research. So that's, that's the notion behind all of this. Uh, what are we doing to seed this kind of uh, new ecosystem? Uh, well, my office is actually very small, uh, but there are a whole series of people across the 27 institutes and centers that participate. And this year we're spending about $30 million on this, and next year it's gonna be of the order of uh, $80 million. Most of that money goes to the extramural community to uh, enable, help foster this uh, ecosystem. So uh, we have a whole organization associated with that, and I won't go into that, and a whole bunch of people are doing it. So what are the kind, so let's, let's take each leg of this stool and look at what it is that we're dealing with that we need to deal with. Well, at this, you know, that we're talking about a pretty complex system here. So aside from the agencies, the NIH itself, there's many other agencies uh, that are all part of this that we're now uh, interacting with. And there are many other government uh, branches that all feed into this. And at the same time, we're all driven by uh, various initiatives, particularly the Holdren Memo, that relates to open data. So there, there is now you know, a mandate that this data has to be made available, which is really the driver. What I've learned in my brief time in government is it's also referred to, of course, as a non-funded non mandate. So all of this has to happen without any additional funds from the federal government to support it. So this, you know, this, this brings into question uh, the sustainability issue again. And then the private sector is involved in all of this. And I think one of the uh, pushes that I really wanted to have in going to the NIH that uh, Francis Collins is supporting is the idea that we do much more with pr the private sector than has previously done, been done before. And so that involves pharmaceutical companies, uh, IT providers, and so on. And then there's a whole series of organizations uh, that play into this. And I think what we're doing uh, and looking to do with these, uh, with these folks is they, they're representative communities we haven't actually necessarily interacted with very much in the past, particularly, for example, statisticians, computer scientists, mathematicians. So we're really looking, and I'll give you one or two examples of things that we're doing to foster that kind of uh, new interaction. But it's clear that this, this, all of these types of people need to be brought into the mix if we're going to uh, enable this ecosystem. So that's one leg of the store. Uh, so what about policies as another leg? Uh, well, clearly, we need much better data, clinical data harmonization. So the idea that if you have uh, one set of representative clinical data 
uh, that's being collected uh, in, in one type of electronic health record that in fact, uh, and another, that uh, there's some level of synergy between, the, the, some a level of synergy can be got. That is very difficult right now. Anyone who's worked with this kind of data, and this is true of other data types as well, um, it knows what the problems are. Even though we have standards for, for some of the information that's within those records. So, but we, we need to do much more. We need new standards. Uh, we need uh, reasons to adopt those standards. Uh, and we need examples where they've actually been adopted and they're working well. Um, another example policy which is uh, relatively new within is much more of a notion of adoption of the cloud. So there was, there's been a lot of resistance within NIH to the cloud uh, across the NIH, but now there are a series of cloud pilots in different institutes, and I'm going to give you an example of something that's going on in a minute. Um, but dbGaP is this uh, genotype to phenotype database that is uh, we now have a go-ahead to move that into the cloud, into a HIPAA-compliant cl cloud. Uh, another thing is the notion of data citation. So it, this is what I was alluding to when I made a comment earlier this morning, is elevating the value of data within the scholarship enterprise. And the idea is that, uh, so there's a technical nuance with this which makes it uh, uh, feasible, uh, more feasible than it was before, so what happens when a journal article gets published uh, in the biomedical sciences? That's represented in an XML format that's JATS, so-called JATS compliant. So that's then ingested by PubMed and PubMed Central and made available to the community, either as an abstract or as a full text. So what's happened is that there's an extension to that JATS which supports data citation. And so that means you can have a machine-readable representation of a data citation, which of course you can then use to generate, as we do for paper citations, different human-readable forms. So we, we're moving towards saying that data citation at the NIH, that data citation is a valid uh, ent entry within your uh, scholarly record, whether it be in your bib sketch when you apply for a grant, if, whether it be in a report uh, associated with that grant. So this, this begins to elevate uh, the value of data. And this is in keeping, of course, with the fact that data journals are now emerging where good quality data sets are valued as part of scholarship. It was mentioned earlier at the beginning that the, the libraries are helping with data sharing plans. This is good. Uh, unfortunately, and I say this as a PI, that the current status of data sharing plans is, is basically a joke. Uh, you know, in, in the, first of all, in the NIH, only grants over 500k direct uh, budget per year are required to provide data sharing plans. Well, this, this seems to me to be crazy. It's sort of saying that, uh, that uh, you know, small grant, uh, data generated on small grants doesn't have any value. Uh, d this doesn't make any sense at all. There's a move to move that all will come into play fairly shortly, that all grants, and this is part of the uh, directive from uh, the Office of Science and Technology Policy anyway, that, uh, that has to be, all of that data has to be available. Um, so that means all grants will have data sharing plans to describe how that's going to happen. But, you know, we have no, they're not, there's no way that right now that anything is done with, a, with, that, with those plans. They're not enforced. So there's no incentive to do anything with them. But what we're moving towards is the idea very soon that they, there will be more, more enforcement. So that enforcement will come from the idea that, first of all, the machine read, the data sharing plan needs to be machine readable. So, which is ironic actually right now that it isn't, at least parts of it. So for example, we will be able, and you apply for a grant, we will be able to extract from that, that on year two of this grant, you, you're going to put data in resource X. So after two years, there will be an auto automatic trigger that will go out to resource X and see whether, in fact, there are data objects within that grant, uh, within that resource, sorry, that actually have the grant number that, uh, that, uh, you, that you, you, you have. So it's a way of automatically closing the circle. And then, of course, if the data's not in there, there could be good reasons for that. But if, uh, if the data hasn't been shared when it should have been shared, then, you know, we can put a bit of pressure on, uh, on getting, that, uh, in, getting that to happen in a, in a fairly automated way. I mean, these things need to be introduced slowly and carefully, so it's not like this is all going to happen overnight, but this, I'm just giving you a sense of the general movement, uh, which is essentially saying uh, more data should be shared and we need to value that, uh, the, the, the people who do that. 
Um, on that note of value, we're also looking at different review models. So there's a general notion that data-centric grants within the NIH framework are no, don't necessarily review very well. That the study section's doing it, they're, they're generally part of uh, other study sections, or are they part of a study section where the, the emphasis may, for example, be more on experimental work and the data part doesn't get reviewed very well. So we're looking at ways uh, of dealing with that. And we're going to do some experiments this FY15, which starts actually next month. Um, so one of the things we're going to experiment with, with some of this uh, big data to knowledge funding next year, is in fact open grants and open review. So if you have a, you know, and, you know, many investigators won't want to do that. They'll feel that they're giving too much away. But we'll see whether for more data-oriented grants there's interest in doing this. So the grant itself would be open and accessible for people to look at. Uh, and also um, the review process itself and, and the reviewers would be open. Uh, it may be that we don't get any applicants and we don't get any reviewers. Uh, but, it, you know, these are the experiments that I think we want to, to action. I mean, of course, the one driver, in an optimistic sense, might be, well, you know, supposing you're writing a grant on, a, on some form of uh, rare disease. Well, it doesn't get funded, so what would happen to that now? Essentially, it would go into a black hole, uh, potentially resurrect itself in a different form in a year from now, you right? know? Um, here is an opportunity that it would be out there and an advocacy group or, you know, a blue button or red button, whatever you want to put on it, could actually be put onto this to, to try and raise funds to support that grant. So whether that will how foundations and so on could potentially pick it up who wouldn't normally have known about it. Um, so, and there are other, I won't go into a lot of details, but there are other uh, sort of approaches for this. Okay, so let's, let's go to the, another leg of the school. Let's go to the, uh, the commons. Uh, which is part of the infrastructure. So we're actually, in the next week or two, we're standing up something which we call the commons. Uh, and effectively what that is, is we have, what, by these directives that come all the way from the President of the United States, we have the why for data sharing, but what we don't have is the how. And then we have an end game, and we have different types of data. So those different types of data, a lot of which is, of course, the long tail. So it's all this data that, according to these directives, is going to need to be made accessible in some form, which right now probably languishes on a lab desktop or somewhere in the lab for a while and then disappears. Um, that is, you know, an example of long tail data. So potentially, and, the, and often that, that data doesn't have a home. It doesn't fit into a traditional resource where uh, things go. And then there's a whole series of high throughput experiments that are done in biomedicine. Uh, you know, what happens to that data? Right now there are core facilities that provide that data to investigators, which are funded by the NIH, but they don't actually maintain that data typically for very long either. So that's another uh, form of data. And then, of course, there's the special needs of clinical uh, and patient data. Uh, and then associated with that is the end game that we want out of all of this, of course, which is, you know, some high quality data that's usable for which discovery can be made and so on. And then in the middle is a series of stakeholders. It's not just NIH awardees. Uh, it's the rest of academia, it's the private sector and it's other government agencies. And so what we're doing is we're putting together an environment uh, that only we're, only, we're standing this up and we're going to test it out. It's going to be a small project, a more small agile approach um, through a thing we call the commons. And the, the awards that we're about to make, are need, those folks that have those awards are going to need to be commons compliant. So what does that mean? Um, I'll explain that in a second. But the, the basic idea of being in the commons is, at the, at the simplest level, it provides a Dropbox-like storage. So you can drag and drop uh, NIH-related or other, for that matter, information and data. Uh, it brings compute to the data because uh, uh, in, large in large part, this initially at least, will be with cloud providers. And it provides a place to, uh, in principle, to collaborate and discover. So that's sort of, you know, the, the beginnings of what it's going to look like. But I don't think any of this is going to work without what I alluded to earlier is a new kind of business model. And what we're looking at in the longer term uh, is uh, a business model that changes the way that we currently fund computing uh, across uh, the, uh, the NIH. Again, this will not be, ish, this will not be done en masse. It will be done in, in, a, in a set of trial agile experiments to see whether there's value in this. 
but we believe we can get much more compute value than we currently get. So you take a series of commons compliant resources, and their compliance it revol only involves two things, which is still under discussion. But one of them is that whatever goes in there, whatever research object goes into the commons, has to have some form of identifier. So it can actually be indexed and found. And that, that finding will be done by an award that's already been made that's going to be funded as of October the 3rd. Um, and then beyond that, there will be a set of provenance for each of those research objects, and then a series of metadata depending on the object type. At the, at the beginning, that will be very, what's required will be very, very uh, cursory and limited. It's really about providing attribution for the, whatever's put into the commons. And so that's, that's the commons, and there's a set, with a set of commons compliant resources that could be HPC facilities, they could be government labs, it could be public clouds, it could be private clouds. As long as they conform to these rules, we can find the information, the, the research objects are in there, and they can be operated on. And then the value of this is the business model. And the business model basically says, um, rather than giving you money to go out and buy your own computers and other we're going to give you credit to spend in a commons compliant resource. And you can spend that credit wherever you want. So if you do work that has, is very compute intense, but on a limited set of data, you'll probably go to a different provider than if you have a lot of data and minimal compute, because they have different charging algorithms associated with that. So that drives competition in the marketplace. Uh, then what happens is you get that credit, you spend that credit, at a commons comp compliant resource. The resource bills the bro a broker service, the broker bills the NIH, the NIH pays one bill a month, which goes back to the broker that distributes this across all of the, uh, the commons compliant resources. So this is something that uh, we want to try, and we believe that we can get uh, significantly more compute resource for the dollar than we currently, in the way that we currently spend uh, compute money. So, we will be experimenting with this uh, across uh, 2000, uh, across FY15, again, with specific applications that support the whole research life cycle. So there's, there's actually motivation for working in this space. So it's the opportunity to actually do real science in this kind of environment. It's not just trying to build it and they'll come kind of thing. We'll look for specific applications that are really going to work in this kind of environment. Um, so, and then I think the last thing I would say is really about uh, training and diversity. We've touched on this, but I think the, there's really the need, uh, it's sort of at the center of these, uh, of these three parts of the, uh, these three legs of the stool. But uh, without that, uh, you know, I think we're, we're going to be in some trouble. And part of the issue I would say that, that, that bothers me, I can illustrate with a little story. So when I was in San Diego, um, Google didn't have an office in San Diego. They had an office in Irvine, which is about you know, 60 miles away. So what they would do is they would run a pretty fancy bus every day uh, from San Diego to Irvine to take Google employees up there. Well, what I noticed over a period of several years is more and more of the folks in my lab were actually getting on that bus. And to me, that was, that's somewhat disturbing for a variety of reasons. But now I'm at the NIH, it's disturbing because quite often those people have been trained to do various types of biomedicine, and yet they're now perhaps doing something completely different. Now, that's not necessarily a bad thing, but um, it, it's, it illustrates a strain or a loss to the biomedical infrastructure and research enterprise. And when you, when you probe as to why some of those people are leaving, yes, on an NIH grant, you're never going to be able to offer someone the salary they're likely to get at Google. But some of those people did not want to leave. They, want, they were scholars, and they wanted to be appreciated as scholars. And they felt, as data scientists in the academic system, many of them weren't treated as, as, as formal scholars. And I think there's a general recognition that this, this is a problem, and in fact, we're in the throes of organizing a workshop with the National Science Foundation to actually bring in uh, VPs of research, vice chancellors of research, and so forth, to actually sit and address this sort of problem of how to uh, really recognize these people. And I think there's a willingness to do this because there's a growing uh, realization, and I know this because I was a, a part-time administrator at a university until recently, that 
there's a, the potential to lose money, i.e. through indirects, because grants are going elsewhere because there aren't the cadre of data scientists to support them within that institution. And the kind of centre I heard about earlier today obviously is a, a good way of addressing that. And I think we, we would be uh, very uh, interested in, in con figuring out ways for how we can support that kind of enterprise. Uh, so, you know, uh, you know, and I think another aspect which where a place like Yale could be really helpful is really, I think, uh, given uh, the, the proportion of our budget that goes into diversity, the idea that we have uh, partnering grants with, uh, with other and smaller institutions uh, where, where you know, that can foster diversity, where those people can come and they can do joint training in places like, uh, like Yale. Um, uh, you know, th this is something we're exploring for next year. Um, and we're actually really doing a whole assessment of what we fund in respect to training in data science across all of the NIH. Because uh, it's clear that in, in we're, not, we're not necessarily being uh, as effective as we could be. There are certain institutes, for example, that are all, all funding the same kind of thing when that could have... Act, uh, and then there are other areas of important data science that are just not getting addressed. So these are just examples uh, of what we might do um, with respect to training. Um, and there will be certainly diff uh, additional uh, training grants. Uh, I was mentioning earlier that there's also, I think, we definitely support the idea uh, of libraries being an active uh, player in the data science arena. Uh, and I think we're actually going to uh, provide some grants probably this, uh, this fiscal year where there will be the opportunity to apply for funds where to encourage librarians to further engage with researchers uh, around the data curation, uh, the data distribution, and the data use uh, problems. So I guess it's much better to have a dialogue, and we, we're going to hear some other comments. And I've, I've purposely not said too much about the clinical space, because I think that's going to come up next. Um, but I'd say the closing question is, you know, uh, I sit each week now in the office of the director and we have a meeting every week where we spend half of that meeting really describing the efforts that have gone on on the Hill that week to try and get more money for the NIH. And, you know, there's a very, it's very interesting going from being an outsider to an insider. And I think every researcher ought to have a window into the NIH to see how, peop how much they try to get more money to support biomedical research. But the fact of the matter is, as hard as they try, uh, you know, it's, that hasn't changed. Uh, you know, so, you know, so the question is, we're now asking ourselves, given that flat budget, what can our office do to improve data science activities? Because it's absolutely clear that this, the, level, the types of analytics that are coming in biomedical research through the advent of this data really require us to change the way we're doing things. And that's the sort of cultural shift I was sort of alluding to earlier. And that's, out, without a doubt, the hardest thing to do of all. So I'll just stop there. And uh, I guess we're going to have. Our next speaker is Dr. Amy Justice, who will respond to Mr. Bourne's presentation. Um, Amy is Professor of Medicine at the Yale School of Medicine, Professor of Public Health at the Yale School of Public Health, and Section Chief of General Internal Medicine in the VA Connecticut Healthcare System. She has conducted research focusing on outcomes in chronic HIV infection for more than 20 years. Please welcome Dr. Justice. Thank you. Uh, before getting into a response, I thought it might be helpful to tell a story. Uh, I came into the informatics, big data world by accident. I, I'm a general internist. I went to medical school. And when I went to medical school, I told the interviewers I wasn't interested in doing research. I wanted to be leader in primary care. I was very interested in figuring out how we could provide primary care more efficiently and appropriately to all people in the United States. That was my my goal as a young individual. And as I went to medical school, I began to realize that uh, I came from a legal background, and I questioned everything. 
And you know, that doesn't work very well on the wards. People don't really like that. They say, we do this because we do this. They don't want to have 20 questions about why we are ordering this test or that test or the other test. So I, I quickly realized that maybe research was a little bit more my cup of tea, because in research, it's good to question everything, right? And then I started to rotate onto the VA health services. So uh, for those of you who don't know, the VA has a national electronic medical record system. It's had it for a very long time. Uh, it's extremely complete and integrated uh, with the VA healthcare system. So pharmacy fill and refill data is in there. We know about what medications people are taking. We know all their laboratories. If they go to one VA in Florida during the winter and another VA in Connecticut during the summer, we can follow them from those two places. It's really a pretty amazing system. And it's been fully paperless for more than a decade. So as I was training, I began to realize this is a gold mine. There's an incredible amount of data in this system. And so I started to ask people, so if I wanted to do some research on this data, how do I get it out of the system? And people said, I don't have a clue. You, you can't get it out. Once it goes in, it's there. <laughs> it was sort of this magical thing. Well, then I began to talk to some programmers and to learn a little bit about what was behind the scenes and about how you might be able to get that data out. And eventually, I was able to pull the data out in a small way. And that was the beginning of my career. I've built a cohort study of veterans aging with and without HIV infection in the VA that now has 15 years of observational data from the electronic medical record system. And it's supplemented by a number of other sources. The reason I drag you through that story is that I think that it tells you a some of the issues that we're going to face as we think about at least one form of big data, which is medical record data. Uh, I have been asked questions at NIH like, OK, so you're going to build the cohort. Who's going to do the science? Just to illustrate the divide between what's considered science at NIH and what isn't considered science at NIH. I've also been told, well, this is a purely observational study. Uh, meaning that, therefore, it's not scientific. Uh, these are biases that if team science, if big data, if all of the things that Phil mentioned as being really important are going to happen, have to be overcome. We have to get over our biases. We have to understand that people who understand observational data are an important member of the team. And along those lines, we need to learn to trust each other, which is something that Phil was absolutely mentioning. Um, something that is not easy for people who need to get their next grant funded to do. It's also sometimes not easy because our institutions make it more difficult. And Phil and I have discussed some of those issues. But one of the things that I would like to hear about is how are we going to improve the responsiveness to observational science and the value of observational science uh, in this new domain? Oh, here, yeah, sorry. So let, let me just say that I think there's some precedents for this history here, uh, perhaps it's in slightly different domains, for what has happened. And uh, Mark Gerstein and I can certainly attest to this because we're in the area of computational biology. But I remember, and so it's really a, a his, tracing a historical com, uh, progression and then comparing it to what you're, you know, where we are and, and what, what, what you want to happen. So I'd say that what in the 80s, when those of us doing uh, biology or uh, medicine playing with computers were, were really outsiders. We were novel, we were geeks, we were very strange people. And then what ch happened is that the Human Genome Project came along. And that was really, in my mind at least, uh, a milestone because not for, for merely for the fact of what it produced scientifically, but it actually legitimized uh, the informatics enterprise. because. At the time, I was working on a, uh, at Columbia, and we were looking at the physical and genetic mapping of chromosome 13. You could not take that grant on without having not just a data sharing plan, and not sorry, not data, data uh, storing and, and manipulating the data, but you had to make that data available. You had to do a series of things. Uh, and of course, the analytics associated with that data became, uh, became important. And in fact, we actually were able to improve the experimental protocols by virtue of what we could show analytically. So that, for the first time, forced us together and created a synergy between, between those, two, those two groups. 
Um, and then, you know, things went not quite as planned. I'd say what happened at that point uh, is that there was a, a sudden realization, well, maybe this, this, this is the next big wave. And so half of the, the few of us who were doing bioinformatics uh, actually went off to industry because industry was offering great packages and so forth. Uh, with the belief that this was going to be the next huge wave. Well, five, three to five years later, those people are all looking for academic jobs again because it hadn't actually realised, re uh, it hadn't been realised. It took much longer to appreciate for that value to become a uh, part of the mainstream. And then I think we went into a mode where uh, doing this kind of science became almost was considered a kind of service provision. It was necessary now, but it was a service provision to, um, to the, the, the traditional way of doing biomedicine. And then I tell you, where we are today is at a point where, yes, you can get tenure and you can get all sorts of rewards for being one of those analytical people uh, working with other people's data. So the, the, it has been within the system, it's been legitimized. And so I think that's, that's a good thing. But I think what I would, I would argue is by the end of the decade, these guys are going to be driving the ship because it's going to be the fundamental part of discovery making. And I think what we're, what we're, that was one of the reasons I went there was to try, to the NIH, was to try and help foster that along. So we're still, we're still at this point where there's, there's sort of a clash of culture. But uh, I think there's, I just, having talked to the leadership across the NIH, across all these institutes, I think there's a realized that when I, I, I essentially just gave that exact spiel to the advisors, to the directors when, uh, not that long ago, a couple of months ago, and no one really pushed back on that. Um, so I, I think there's, like it or not, there's this belief that that's, that's sort of where, where things are going. And I think it's how, it's how, we, make that, uh, how we make that change. And I think from my point of view, when I think about how it's, it's worked the best, it's come from a situation going back to the original field of bioinformatics. When people started doing it, there were a, a group of biologists or biomedical folks, uh, and there were a group of, of different types of people, physicists, chemists, mathematicians, computer scientists, who started to come together. And there was quite a lot of tension in the beginning, uh, and quite a lot of misunderstanding. But then what happened is, the NIH and others and the NSF started to offer training programs where they were training people at the interface. So they had to have dual mentors. And it was those students, ultimately, that f made the glue that really started. And of course, those students now, some of them, of course, are, are full professors in, in, in institutions and, and going forward. So I think we, you know, so we, one of the points is we need to start training people for this new, much better now for this new world order if, it, if it's to come. Uh, and put those at the interface between these traditional uh, disciplines. So, and I, that's happening, and I'm encouraged by that. I guess where partly where I'm a little discouraged is when, in, the, in what we're doing with this big data to knowledge initiative, we needed to have um, a multi-council working group because all of the different institutes and centres are NIH funded. So, and the councils, uh, if you don't know, are essentially eminent scientists who advise each of the institutes and centers on, on direction and so forth, and very valuable bodies. But when I looked at those from the point of view of who would be good data scientists to, to help us with our initiative, you know, frankly, I came up short. So, uh, but, you know, I, and then there was a realization, well, that's perhaps true. We, we are my council, I really ought to have someone capable of doing this. So it's a, it's a process, but I think we are moving in the right direction. And then along those lines, uh, once people buy the idea of data sharing, that's not the end, that's the beginning. So uh, our database we share routinely with lots of different investigators, but it's not as though you can just go pull the data, go off, analyze it, write the paper up, and be done. Getting the data elements is the beginning of a dialogue. Uh, what are these elements? What about the missing data? How do I interpret this? What are the standards that have been used as other people have used these da data elements? There's a whole process of back and forth if the science is going to be excellent science. Yeah. And I would imagine that's true in genetics as well, although I'm sure Mark could comment on that. Uh, so there's really a long-term commitment 
that needs to be made on the part of the investigators sharing the data to the other investigators using the data if the quality of the science is going to be at the highest possible level. Right now, there's no support for that process or that time or that energy. So uh, thoughts about how that might change? Okay, so it's true, and I think it's, it makes no sense to when these resources, the one end of it, uh, clearly have uh, a need to have a very long lifetime, and yet they're funded in you know, three, four, five year cycles. And that really doesn't lead to sustainability of the system. It leads in part, of course, to the Google bus syndrome, because <laughs> if you know that if you're doing a good job maintaining this resource, and you're communicating with the communities and you're building this rapport, and yet you know that in three to four years you're going to be reviewed and you're not clear it's going to be funded, if and an opportunity comes along for another job, well, you know, it's hard to keep people in the system. So, you know, I think the, the, the longevity uh, aspect has to be dealt with. But at the same time, I think there, there are other models that need to be thought about. So what's really important is that that the people who do the data work are often very passionate and very knowledgeable about that data. And we have to be very careful that we don't disrupt even the system that we have that to, to uh, make sure that that level of quality persists and even improves based on you know, it's working with the communities. And of course, that's the key. The community tells you, if they tell you it's crap, then, <laughs> then you're going to do something about it because you know, it's part of the cycle. Um, but, you know, I think at the same time, so that needs to be preserved, but at the same time, the way we currently operate a number of these resources, I'm not convinced is necessarily the right way anymore. And what I mean by that is the idea that, first of all, what we've done over many years now is to create effectively stovepipes of information within these resources. And, um, because they're funded often by different agencies and in different ways and so on. And that was quite effective at a time when you used to go just to a small number of resources to do your research. But now in this translational era, we're going across everything from you know, genomic, proteomic, meta metabolomic, all the way up to, to patient information. And each time we do that, we're, we're struggling with every single one of these resources. So I think at some level, um, uh, obviously, uh, confidentiality notwithstanding, some of that, that data has to be sort of brought, and the idea of the commons is essentially to bring that quality data into a more open framework where, uh, in a sense, it could be more or less crowdsourced. So you might still have the resources you have, but you're now allowing more people easy access to the data to take and build collections of subsets of data that meet these sort of translational needs. So, you know, I think just experimenting with this and seeing whether, in fact, there is any uptake uh, will be an interesting experiment. So one of the things we're going to do with this commons idea is to seed that commons with a set of uh, a, a series of research objects, uh, both data and software and uh, narrative. that are already essentially out there, but not necessarily very accessible. Yeah. To give you an example from the narrative side, um, you know, PubMed, we had all this movement in open access. So we're talking about data now, but open knowledge through open access publishing has been around and been uh, policies that were put in place a number of years ago. And it's, you know, it's, it's been somewhat ex successful. About 15 to 20% of all the biomedical literature this year will, will be uh, open access um, from day one. Um, if it's funded by the NIH, it has to be open access after, um, after a year anyway. But, so that's all available, but it's not to actually do something. So that means you can read a paper much more easily than you could otherwise. It doesn't necessarily impact institutions like this, which have a lot of access to literature. But if you believe me, if you're in a uh, developing world, it's a huge deal. And there's some beautiful stories of successes that have come from open access, but that's another story. The point here is, you know, you have, you, 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 that is, which is currently in PubMed Central, uh, within the, the NIH is not particularly accessible. So the idea that that was actually also, was also maintained in that way, but was also seeded into this commons where it could be, you know, it could be dealt, it could be analyzed by, uh, uh, easily by a larger group of people and combined with other forms of data to make collections. I've seen, 
you know, and, and these are pressing issues. I've seen some very interesting collections recently associated with Ebola. So the idea that, you know, you know, there was a whole series of these research objects out there that reflected narrative on papers around uh, Ebola, uh, diff, you know, drug databases where information associated with Ebola could be extracted, where this could be started to be put together. This is, you know, there's precedent for this, but it's not it's easy to do right now. So the idea that this, could, this kind of aggregation could happen in an easier way uh, is definitely something we want to explore. And then finally, my question, it, at one point, journals were talking about requiring that a data set be posted supporting the analysis that was being presented in the paper. And I'm curious, is the NIH going to get involved with that? Is there some way that that could be a requirement at the time that the paper is accepted for publication as a way of jump-starting this idea of sharing at least uh, de-identified data? Yeah. So the. the this is happening with some journals uh, already. The Public Library of Science, for example, and I, I was actually involved in this, will not actually publish a paper unless the, the associated data sets are available. And I think one of the ideas is that those particular data sets would have these digital object identifiers assigned to them in the same way that papers do, and they would be uh, accessible and linked uh, through, for example, through the Commons, but also to uh, activities at, uh, in, uh, at the NIH, and that, that, that's actually ongoing. So, you know, but I think there, there needs to be much, you know, that's, that's one set of publications and others are following, but it, it's not all of the biomedical literature. But there are drivers for this, and the reproducibility driver uh, is a big one. Mm -hmm. um, the idea that, you know, that funding may be lost to the system if we can't reproduce things better is driving uh, this, you know, this kind of notion. And the point that was made earlier about uh, software, and software is another part of this, uh, is, a, is an equal part. But there's, there's more to it than that. There's even all of the physical parts as well. Um, so if there's a biospecimen database, there ought to be, if, 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 if you're using specific elements from that resource, then that should be you know, well characterized in the paper. So at least there's a, you can return, you can resolve the source of that content, whether it be virtual or physical. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there's moves afoot, for example, for assignment of identifiers to antibodies and so forth, so that there, uh, so that there can be, you know, you, you, we begin to characterize a paper in a much more quantitative way than we've done in the past. So let's just open it up to audience Q&A for five minutes, and then we can uh, go up and have lunch. <laughs> Great presentation, thank you very much. I have a quick question. Uh, one of the things that is uh, you know, obviously necessary, and many people mentioned that constantly, uh, is access to full text articles to, you know, to do natural language processing and analyze it, et cetera, et cetera. And one of the obstacles is uh, the fact that there is no API or, you know, or programming interface to these types of uh, data resources. And another one is the copyright itself. So how NIH is involved or trying to address this, because that's a big impediment in finding, like a concrete example, finding um, you know, a potential drug target for um, genetic variation that nobody have ever seen. And uh, for that, you need uh, you know, computers. People cannot do that kind of stuff. I'm, I'm not sure. The first part, uh, I think the, the idea, I'm actually on the PubMed Central Advisory Board. And that's where the idea of putting that content into a much more accessible way. But I have to say that um, even with the literature, there are problems. So an example of that is that the, the literature itself is represented as XML, but it's not necessarily as standardized as it should be. Mm -hmm. so that because, and so the licensing record, which defines who can do what to that, that publication, is, is in a number of cases missing or just uninterpretable. So we're not absolutely clear uh, what, what the issues are. And this is, again, history repeating itself. So as people start to use the data on mass as a corpus, 
uh, they realize these problems and you know, they start to be addressed. So that kind of thing is now being address addressed and it involves getting the publishers to, to, to sort of conform better. But you know, publishers, it's very important that they be in PubMed and PubMed Central. That's where the main access points are after their, their content. So, you know, and then I think this Commons idea, one of the, the, the thoughts there is that, you know, it's no good waiting for a small group of people at the NIH to build APIs to this stuff. Let's make it accessible and then encourage the community to develop the APIs, which of course will be characterized. So that you'll be able, to, what you can't do now is you can't, how do I find an API to this stuff, right? Uh, and I think the idea is through these, these discovery indexes is not only you'll be able to find the API, but you'll get some sense of its value because you'll be able to see how, of, how frequently it's been used and any commentary that people want to say about it. So this starts to take on, I don't, I don't want to necessarily use this term, but sort of almost like a Yelp-like uh, you know, context. Um, and so that was, that's sort of the, you know, the way that I see this heading. Um, and your second question was about resources to do, I'm sorry, I didn't quite get what you were trying to say in the second part. That, that, that was just a concrete example of where this type of analysis would be critical because it is impossible to do, you know, to, to keep in memory, uh, you know, all the types of genetic variations that can occur. You have to do, you know, really good, uh, you know, natural language processing of uh, the body of literature to find out some obscure things. So. Okay, so I think that would, this, I would, Again, this needs to be, every part of this has to be evaluated. Mm -hmm. So I think if we, put, if we put this out there, maybe we, you know, we, 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 we make some awards to, I'm probably not supposed to be saying these things, we make some awards to uh, actually develop APIs to this content. And then I think equally important is we have to evaluate what the usage pattern is. And then we need to make you know, adjustments accordingly. You know, this is, I, I don't want to give the impression that any of the things that we're approaching here these big monolithic, you know, build it and they will come kind of approaches. This is really to do some nimble experiments over the next year or two uh, and see where we go with this. Could, if I could just add something. Yes. So one of, one of the things that concerns me about the explosion of information is that we need to pay careful attention to what is not there, to missing data. Uh, patterns of missing are very important. We know in, in the uh, research literature that there's a real publication bias right, for positive findings, especially for smaller studies, et cetera. And I know in my own work with the electronic medical record system, studying where the patterns of missings were really helped us understand what the problems with the data were that we were dealing with. And if you don't ask those questions in a very systematic, very rigorous way, you can make very uh, ill-founded conclusions from the data in front of you. And I think when we then go up a whole other level of sharing data across data research sites, we have to be really, really careful about thinking about missing as creatively as we think about the data in front of us. Hi. Um, so when I was teaching my data journalism program this, this summer, we had a guest from ProPublica come talk to us about an interactive that they had developed there in their small data team where they sort of explained, they let people like search th through the Medicare data that had recently been open sourced. And then they sort of showed little graphics that explained, you know, for the doctor you found, maybe your doctor, this is their percentile rank in terms of how many times they've done this procedure, or this is, you know, this is how many procedures they do, et cetera. And I remember thinking like, why is it up to a newspaper mm -hmm. to do that? Like w why isn't that being done by the federal agencies? And why don't they have teams of data journalists who think about how the taxpayers who fund this stuff would like to interact with the research studies or with the data itself or, you know, or just the results or just even the funding for the research. <laughs> Consumer Report uh, would agree with I've that. only been there six <laughs> months. I don't have good answers. I mean, uh, there, I don't have good answers to it. I mean, it, there's no good reason. I mean, that's, that's the bottom line. I mean, but... Uh, I think but there's, there are steps along the way. I mean, I think the, direct, the directive that, that came down from, you know, essentially the president about open data 
that is really driving things in, in a different direction. And it's, op you know, the fact that, that people are now thinking for the first time, well, there's all this open data. You know, we can be doing, you know, we're doing these kinds of things. And, you know, I think it's, it's almost like, you know, uh, the internet in a sense. What we've done, what we, we're, it's a th we're creating a thin layer on top of the internet. And then before we had that, we had no idea where it was going to go, but it went to amazing places and uh, lots. So I think just by opening things up, in that case, it was creating a protocol, uh, you know, to allow communication. I mean, we need that here as well. It's not just about making the data open. We've got to have, you know, the idea that you can cause, you know, that there's commonality across these data elements that you can actually make these kinds of connections. And that's going to start, the, the, the value of that is going to start to come. And ultimately, you know, in my mind, all of this only gets driven by economics. The, 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 you know, the, the value proposition has to be there. And so it, it, you know, it may not be a value proposition for the, uh, for the, uh, for the feds to do it themselves, but it should, be, it should be done through some kind of public-private partnership so that there's, there's value all around, so that you could get that kind of information, but that whoever did that, let's say it was a third party, that they actually, that whatever revenue they generated in so doing, uh, actually got fed back to support some of the, the, the public data itself. So this is the ki these kinds of models, you know, and then you say, well, uh, would I pay for this service? And then maybe you wouldn't. But, you know, you know, there are lots of creative companies out there who offer tons of free services but make lots of money. They're bringing it. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me just, can I just respond to that? It brought me up the other thing I wanted to say, which is I'm going to push back a little bit on this concept of a business model in the context, because I've worked in business, I've worked in industry. Um, when we're talking about like NIH, we're talking about something that is funded by the taxpayer with lots and lots of money. And what I just mentioned is like a data science team, which would take maybe $100,000 to do, um, maybe $200,000 to maintain like for a longer period of time, it's not going to pay off because it's going to be free. It's not going to pay off directly, but and it's very hard to, to gauge what it means to be worthwhile in that context if it's a free, open source, you know, if it's open to the public. But on the other hand, the public will probably appreciate it, at least the ones that interact with it. I'm just, I'm just making the point that when we talk about business models, it, it sends off red flags that you want to be able to measure like the, wor the worth of something, which isn't always easy to do when you're talking about public interest. This is a public interest agency. So to some extent, we have to assume that, that things that open it up to people are in their best interest. We can ask them if they think so, but you're not gonna be able to get revenue from that kind of thing. And I, I don't think you should. That's just my opinion, but no, I No, I mean, I take your point, and it was the best answer I could come up with. <laughs> <laughs> but as I said before I started saying that, I don't have necessarily have good answers for this. I mean, I, I, I've become way more sympathetic than I was in the past to that this would only cost a couple of hundred thousand dollars to do this. Well, the problem is, of course, there are many different of those kinds of, of opportunities, and it's actually, you know, and it is a lot of money that the end but it is still nevertheless limited, you know, it has a limit. And so maybe we just need to prioritize things more. But I can tell you, talking to investigators who, you know, when that priority doesn't agree with what, you know, the fact that they're no longer being funded, it's really tough. And, you know, but I think keeping the public's interest at the forefront of all of this well, clearly is obviously, you know, critical. Yeah. So, um, Phil, sort of following on from this uh, question, you talked about the fact that, um, you know, good data is very expensive. It's expensive to generate, expensive to maintain. And I was curious, do you have now or will the NIH be developing literally a, like a distribution of data costs or values that one could look at? Like, do you have a sense now of, like, what's, what's expensive, you know, in terms of dollars per gigabyte or, you know, what's an expensive data set, what's an inexpensive data set? Are there actual numbers that you can quote or that we could find on a website? Um, no, I mean, I don't really have, and I have to say a lot of this comes from my experience with data and various resources over the years of what I observe uh, in, the, in, in these other resources. But what I would say is that what we're not doing enough of by the virtue of the way we fund these things and I kind of alluded to this, but just to restate it, perhaps hopefully a little better, 
is we're not transferring best practices enough. We're not, you know, we're not, we're not working enough together to, to understand what really works well for tools that are really useful to curating this data set, methodologies we've used to curate this data set. You know, those, those, even though it might be different data, that often, tra you know, the process can often transfer. And that, off, that you know, d doesn't happen. And I mean, I'm not talking just about uh, what happens in, in different areas of genomics. I'm talking about what could happen. What I've learned recently is that NOAA uh, is doing some very interesting things with atmospheric and ocean data. Uh, and they have models for public-private partnership, and they have models for curation, and they have models for the, that I would, you know, as a researcher, I never discovered. So I think if, if we can start to, you know, we're now all meeting because of these open data things. Maybe there's hope. I mean, I'm a hope, you know, I have hope that, you know, I, you know, I, I, you know I say I'm not a fed. I, I'm just not worn down by trying to do it. But there is, there is all this crosstalk going on, and maybe some value can come from it. But I don't have specific examples. I do know, I mean, I can tell you, as, as you know, just one data resource right now, something like the Protein Data Bank, just in the US, that's a $6 million a year enterprise. And probably $3 million of that is spent, uh, more than that, actually, 4 to $5 million is spent on the curation activities for that data. And we could, we could talk a little about that offline, but I think uh, that clearly has had enormous impact and value on that community. But I think going forward, we, we ought to be thinking about you know, uh, other models as well. There's a question here. Thank you. Phil, can you say a little bit more, uh, I know we don't have a lot of time, but a little bit about the expectations that the NIH has for the institutions that are supporting these researchers? What would you like them to be able to offer? What do you think they need to offer um, in terms of infrastructure policies and guidance and so forth? I think what I'm most interested in is what we do with the people. So it's really, because that's the, the lifeblood and that, that, they, that comes from the institutions. But, so these you know, various training initiatives um, and what we can do to really foster this, this training. And also I would say, you know, coming back to my point about valuing uh, people within, within the organization. You know, the, the so-called data scientists and project scientists who are very important to the enterprise and, and I think are becoming more so. You know, are we appreciating those enough in the system? Is there enough soul searching uh, within institutions uh, that these people are being well taken care of? So I'd say, and, and that, you know, and the, and the training and, and certainly the diversity of training, which is a, a big thing for the NIH. So I would say those are just sort of rec recapping or, uh, of things that I'd really like to see uh, institutions happen. And I, and I think also one of the reasons I'm here, of course, is to have much more of a dialogue with individual institutions that are pushing in this direction. Um, you know, I mean, I, I just know from where I came before I was there that there was, in the Southern California region, there was uh, a huge demand for people doing this kind of work. There were 4,500 open jobs. And yet, at that time, UC San Diego was not actually training. We had no data science program, uh, per se. And uh, there was sudden realization that you know, this, this had to happen, in part because we didn't get some uh, important data science grants, which had to show that there was a data science component already in place. That was a wake-up call for our institution. And now I think there's you know, this notion of, uh, of really thinking about this and actually even thinking about it in the context of this digital enterprise idea where you start to break down the silos between these respective uh, parts. I mean, it, there's just no question that there are discoveries that are made of, of connections between investigators, of course, when they read each other's papers. But there's a possibility that th those connections could have been discovered if some tools had actually looked at their data they don't actually have to reveal the data, but if, you're, if there's a tool that looks at pat for patterns in data and finds two data sets from two investigators in two different departments who would never come into contact, and yet there's some commonality there. I mean, you have to be careful of a fatigue alert and all these sorts of things, but there's at least the potential that you would actually discover the commonality, and those two people could be put in contact with each other, 
um, without revealing the data, and they can make of it what they can. And, and that would happen essentially the day that the second data set was actually created and essentially in this commons or in this public space, um, even if it was institutional commons. So, you know, I think it's a way for institutions to create much more collab. There are, the opportunities are beginning to be seen for creating opportunities for collaboration within institutions that don't, which are not, you know, not the traditional ways of doing things and having them happen much more quickly than waiting for uh, the published literature. Thank you very much, Amy and Phil. So we will um, have a poster session now. The Yale Institute for Network Science is on the third floor of this building. They've allowed us to use their space. We'll all go up there, get our lunches, look at the posters. If you're tuning in online, we'll be back at 1.30, but there is a link on the YouTube video to where all the posters are uploaded to our Eli Scholar site. So please visit that and poster session with us as well. And we'll see you back down here a little before 1.30.
All right, Warren, you get up here. I can come up here and change it over for you. Well, you're familiar with computers. I'm not, I'm not saying that. I don't, to, I'm not, if I struggle. Oh, yeah. I'll see. I'll be right there. You're welcome. So to answer your question, yeah, it's up. This is the baby right here. Okay, great. Okay? I'm not going to mess up anything with, with no, your desk. Okay. No, nope. just okay. take it and just drag it right on the... Okay. You in the right one? So. Yeah. Um, I think this is Adobe. Okay, they have Adobe. Okay, great. So now I'll just eject. I can get back to. Yeah. All right. Hopefully they didn't okay. cut you off. <laughs> no, not at all. Oh, okay. Let's just look at my slides real quick, and then I'll. Yeah, and you are. I'm the first one, Mark Kirsten. Oh, yeah. you're. You're this. Uh, yep, let me just take a look. Yeah, here, here, I'll let you do your thing.
I need to use my iPhone. Why don't you do that? Okay. So, are you about 20 minutes? Yeah. Yeah, I'll just I'll split this up. Uh, good afternoon. Welcome to the afternoon session of uh, the 2014 Day of Data. Uh, our panelists this afternoon are uh, Professor Mark Gerstein. Uh, he is the Albert Williams Professor of Biomedical Informatics at Yale. He's co-director of the Yale Computational Biology and Bioinformatics Program. His research is focused on bioinformatics, and he's interested in large-scale integrative surveys, biological database design, macromolecular geometry, molecular simulation, human genome annotation, gene expression analysis, and data mining. That, that is a sentence. Um, uh, 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 the next speaker will be uh, Professor Pincelli Hull. She's uh, an assistant professor in the Department of Geology and Geophysics at Yale. Her, uh, her research focuses on understanding open ocean ecosystems through the Cenozoic, disentangling the causes and consequences of mass extinctions, and quantifying community response to global change. And the third speaker, speaker will be Angel, Angel Hsu. Uh, she graduated from the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies in 2013, and she is now an associate research scientist and lecturer at FES, as well as the director of the Environmental Performance Measurement Program area. Her research focuses on Chinese environmental performance measurement, governance, governance and policy. Professor Gerstein. Okay. Uh, so first of all, I want to thank the uh, organizers for inviting me to the uh, Day of Data, which I've enjoyed immensely so, so far. And I just want to say I really appreciate the introduction. But one word was missed out of the introduction. It's my new word. I now think of myself as a data scientist. <laughs> so I'm <laughs> focused on data science. And that, is, that encompasses now my, my research. So that's what I'm going to be talking, uh, talking to you about today, uh, biological data science. And in particular, how we can use that to make a map of the human genome and use that as a tool against uh, cancer. So first of all, I want to put. Uh, big data in uh, biology in the context of big data in general in science. I mean, you've probably all heard throughout today that big data is transforming science, many different types of sciences. Um, it's obviously transforming biological sciences. And the big thing in biological science, which is a little different than in other disciplines, it's really been transformed by a pati one particular technology. And that is really diagrammed in this um, slide here. That is the amazing advent of next generation sequencing, the ability to generate just gargantuan amounts of data uh, quickly. And so this graph <clears throat> shows um, the decrease in cost of uh, genome sequencing since the uh, G Human Genome Project finished around 2000. And it's on a log graph, so of course you can see it's kind of exponentially um, going down in price and it's paralleling uh, Moore's law for uh, the increase in speed and memory of computers. But around 2007, um, due to some tr uh, tremendous advances, some of them here in New Haven by uh, 454 uh, Biosystems, next generation sequencing really took off. And you can see this, the, it's a, that's an incredible you know, decrease in cost, which is now leveling off. But that really has led to this tremendous amount of uh, new data. And that's really changed the dynamics of um, the, the economic dynamics of um, genomics, where it used to be initially that most of the money in genomics went into sequencing, <laughs> because that was the center of genome sequencing. Now more and more what you're really seeing is money devoted to analysis of genome sequencing and also procuring interesting samples. It's not just a generic human genome, it's a very particular uh, genome of, say, a disease patient and so forth. So the, this large amount of sequencing has given rise to these huge databases that have um, terabytes and petabytes of information. And then when I thought I'd give you a sense of the, um, the sort of database world in genomics at the moment, this uh, picture is from uh, Heidi Sophia at the NHGRI. And she's made this kind of um, astronomical view of our, our databases. Now, um, but I, I think it's interesting to see. This is a little bit old, so I think these numbers have went up uh, considerably since then. But basically, the public databases, you can see they're sort of terabyte scale uh, databases. The biggest one is about a petabyte uh, scale. 
that people uh, download. And what is in those uh, petabytes? The biggest one is the cancer um, genomics database called TCGA. And if you look at that, you can see it. This is a little text, a little hard to see here, but basically it's split into many different cancers. Say this uh, line represents breast cancer, which is one of the most intensely studied cancers. And then if you split that up, you can see that it divides into different experiments that people have done, such as genome sequencing, RNA sequencing, and so forth. And these experiments have different profiles in terms of the amount of data they generate and so forth. And I'm going to be coming back later to this cancer genomics data. But what do people do with um, big data? So what is the goal of amassing these massive uh, data sets? Well, fundamentally, I think the goal is to answer questions and really also to make models and use those models to make predictions about the real world. And in, in kind of doing that, I kind of divide the approach up into two ways. One is where people just want the answers to the question, and they don't care so much about the explicit uh, structure of the data. They don't care about how the data is set up. They just want to answer their question. And I think of this as kind of like Google search. You know, you don't really know how the internet is all structured. You put in your query into the box, and you get your answer, and that's what you care about. Another one is where people intensely care about the explicit description of the data and what does it look like. And of course, I think the paradigm here is also Google, but it's Google Maps as opposed to Google Search, where you really want to understand this is what the Earth looks like and that structure means something to you. So how do we think of uh, genomics and scientific uh, computing in, these con in, these, um, in terms of this dichotomy? Well, let me start off with um, uh, contrast. So last year, we heard about this amazing um, discovery of the Higgs uh, boson. And I think, and maybe some physicists here will disagree, but I think this represents a kind of um, example of the first type of thing, where they had just petabytes, gargantuan amounts of data, but at the end, they were searching for this tremendous needle in this haystack, you know, to find a few events that really support this, this particle, this god particle. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, so, so and they were happy with those, those events in that context. And the contrast we heard about earlier today is really, I think, the astronomer's view. And so we heard earlier about this Sloan Digital Sky Survey earlier today, but I think this is an inspiration to a lot of people in large-scale data science. I mean, this is kind of, you know, the universe, the seeing it all in one whole, and that's a tremendous inspiration. It has been uh, for me. Uh, and so what I think we want to do in genomics is actually very similar to that Sloan uh, Digital Sky Survey and uh, drawing inspiration from that. The only problem, of course, is that we don't have as an intuitive model as the celestial sphere or the Earth. So we have to make a model to make a map of. And so the ENCODE project that I'm going to talk about has been trying to make a map of the human genome. And what we want to do with this map is layer on all this different type of data. But the problem, of course, is the map is a little bit less intuitive. And so I'm going to be talking about that map today. And I should also want to say a little bit about the ENCODE project, because I think this relates to how big data is done. Big data is generated by big crowds, crowds of people. And uh, crowds are also known as consortia, um, and they're organized to some degree. And so the human genome is, uh, is annotated by this big consortia called ENCODE uh, that really um, kind of was created after the sequencing of the human genome around, the, around 2001, 2002, and it's went through a number of very um, organized um, pilots, first looking at 1% of the genome, then looking at model organisms, eventually to whole rollouts on the entire human genome, giving some sense of the annotation. So what does the annotation of the genome look like, or how do people think about it? Well, I think a big thing in the ENCODE group is to try to present all this information in an organized way. And so we, I think a, a good model for the organization is a hierarchy, okay? So the idea is you don't want to go straight to all the data. You want to kind of approach it in a structured way. And so you can imagine at the bottom there's the data. And the data, actually, if you start with the images, it would be gargantuan amounts of it. But if you just start with the reads, you know, you're talking obviously many terabytes of reads. Those reads, of course, turn into so signals or sort of... Um, noisy signals on the genome, and then they're processed into progressively more simplified representations that I'll show you, sort of peaks, networks, models, and eventually people write papers on them. But even in writing the papers, people want to do this in a kind of organized fashion. So the public presentation of the papers is there's many papers, they're arranged around a central paper that's kind of meant to be looked at first, and then there's maybe 20 or 30 papers around, around that that are kind of referenced that central paper and are referenced by it. And they, in turn, describe the methods for particular data sets. And so the thought process is you can traverse this huge data trove in an organized fashion, and that's really the goal of the consortium. So what I've 
this is the outline for what I was going to talk to you about today, and I might not have time to go through all bits of it, but I, at the beginning I wanted to just tell you about big data and genomics, this map making. And now I wanted to do a little bit of a dive and kind of show you what we're doing. What does the data look like? What are we really trying to do to show you a view of our sort of linear annotation, how we annotate the genome, and maybe this higher level network annotation. And then I want to give you a sense of how we can apply this in a practical way, you know, in medical context for, say, um, prioritizing cancer mutations. So first of all, the linear annotation. So how do we think about the linear annotation of the genome? Well, I think of it very much like the way people would annotate books in libraries. And, you know, how that, that's where the word comes from, right? So here's a bit of text that I've taken. It's actually from American scientists, and I've tried to annotate it. And for me, annotating it often is get a highlighter out of a different color, and you highlight it, and then you put a little marginal note that says what is that, the significance of that piece of text that you've highlighted. You've functionally highlighted that piece of text. Another thing that people do when they annotate text is they take a number of texts and they compare them. They say this text is like another text, or they say within this text there's a particular phrase or leitmotif that's repeated over and over again, and that forms a type of um, annotation. So let's take those ideas and now think about the genome, and we can sort of think about the same way. So first of all, let's talk about that comparison of text. That comes about in terms of thinking about conservation in the genome. We can take the human genome, compare it to itself, compare it to other people in the population, or can compare it amongst human and other model organisms, looking for conservation at different levels. Then let's think about the highlighter. We can highlight the genome. The way we do this is by doing a functional genomics experiment that gives a very noisy readout of what the genome's doing. Is it being read out? Is it being bound to? Is it being wrapped up? What's happening? And then, of course, the computer people process this signal and turn it into these little highlighter blocks. That's the kind of mindset, very similar to what we do with text. So now I'm going to take a little bit of a dive and show you what this actually looks like for finding regulatory sites in the genome. So here's a signal. This is a very noisy signal. This signal has a variety of things we use to process it. We have to compare it versus in, uh, control. We have to deal with the mappability and so forth. And we find little regions that we call regulatory sites. These are bound to by transcription factors and are kind of the wiring of our, our genome. Now, one key aspect of all this wiring in the genome is most of the wiring sits outside of genes, okay? And so people refer to this as being in the dark matter of the genome. And this, of course, is a very astronomical analogy also. And I thought it kind of fun, and I hope there's some astronomers here to uh, correct me, to kind of compare this to real dark matter. So supposedly this is a picture of dark matter, and supposedly the way I understand it is you cannot see dark matter, but what you see is you see its effect on the light of, from coming from stars and the way it lenses the light of stars. And this is very similar to the way we want to think about the regulatory bits of the genome. You look at their effect on the genes. The genes are like the stars. They're regulated and lensed by the regulatory regions in the genome. So that's what we're looking at. Now, the next thing we're going to do is look at the kind of conservation of the regulatory sites, that second type of annotation. So in general, people, and this is a bit of a technical graph, and I'm not going to describe in detail, but basically people have found that they have, a, they're very weakly conserved, and mostly the genes are very strongly conserved. But if we break all the regulatory sites up into more specific sites, we start to see some of them are conserved to a degree. And if we actually look in detail at the mutations that hit them, we can see um, they particularly disrupt the binding sites of things in certain ways. And so the long and short of this is that we can find groups of regulatory sites that are both functional as being bound to, but they're also conserved. So we start with a list of 677 categories. We develop smaller lists of groups of sites that are conserved. And they're actually as conserved as genes. And we see lots, and because of that, we see lots of the known deleterious mutations are in them. Okay, and so this allows us to find regions of the genome that are very sensitive to mutations. We're going to come back to this. So that's sort of the linear annotation. So now let's move from the linear annotation to a higher level annotation. So the linear annotation is very nice, but it's a very unstructured type of annotation. It's very much like the parts list. And, you know, if you're a true molecular biologist with a capital M, you want to look at molecules, also with a capital M. You want to look at how molecules work, how they move, what happens in three-dimensional and four-dimensional space and time. That is unfortunately too ambitious for the current world we are in the genome. We can't do that for every molecule in the genome. 
So what happens is this network representation, which is kind of like a 2D sketch in between the 1D parts list and the 3D molecular picture, is a kind of nice way of thinking about things functionally. So this network representation is very powerful. And we find in molecular biology that we can input a lot of ideas that we have about molecules, such as their transcriptional regulation, their physical protein-protein interactions, in this same representation. And one thing that's also very powerful about networks is there's a whole new world that's, I'd say, part of data science now springing up called network science, where people study networks. So we have a new institute here at Yale, the Yale Network Institute. And the neat thing is you can also draw these network pictures for lots of other disciplines. So in particular, one of the favorite ones is to draw pictures of social networks. And the nice thing about these other disciplines is people have much better intuition for them than they do about the kind of bizarre molecules of the genomes, it's kind of tables and chairs for this world, if that makes sense. So here's a social network that I've drawn, I've taken from the New York Times. It's called the blame game. And it shows the, the arrows represent blame at a particular event that happened. And notice how one person is even blaming himself. And the, the key thing about this picture, though, that's amazing, and this is our social intuition, is if you just look at the arrows, you immediately get a sense of who's in charge. Who's the master regulator, right? And so what we want to do is we want to take those intuitions of how we can look at those, those arrows and replace the, the talking heads here by genes. And then we can understand the gene regulatory network. So practically, what do we do to make up a gene regulatory network? I'm not going to go into the details, a little bit of a dive here. What we do is we find these sites in the genome, okay? And then the simple thing we do is for the sites that are right upstream of genes, we basically say they control the genes. And if we do that, we end up with a network that connects a transcription factor to a target gene through a binding site that has about a half a million edges in it. It's a big hairball. And for a lot of people who don't like networks, it represents a very messy hairball. And so to simplify it, we've developed ways of cutting this hairball down to about 25,000 edges, okay, that we can analyze. Now, the distal sites that are far away from genes, we have to do other things for that I'm not going to talk about now. So now if we take this hairball that connects the, the 25,000 edges, and we also relate it to all of the um, other networks that contain genes, we, have, we get this sort of human network that's 100,000 edges. Now, you can look at this. This is a criticism people have of a lot of big data science. They look at that and they say, that doesn't mean anything to me. It just looks like a huge hairball. And that is true. However, one of the neat things about mining that data is if you look at it in detail, you can actually find some really interesting things. You can find that the genes that are more essential in the human genome, they tend to sit more at hubs. And because of the way this network is drawn, you can almost see it as more in the center of this network, whereas the less important genes sit more at the periphery. And so we're going to come back to this idea of the hubs being more essential. Okay, so now we've talked about big data in genomics, the making the maps, just how we develop a kind of simple annotation, a linear annotation, developing a more elaborate, synthetic, second-level network annotation. And so now I want to talk about, well, what do we do with this? How can we use it? And how do we think about how it works with big data? Okay, so the problem we're going to approach is how do we prioritize mutations in cancer? This is a big problem. Let me explain the problem. Uh, if you contract cancer, and unfortunately many people in this room probably will, what will happen when they sequence your tumor genome? Well, they'll find thousands of mutations. Uh, cancer is a disease of the genome. So on order, they'll find maybe 5,000 mutations, okay? And now 5,000 is, is a small number. It's much less than the normal number of variants in a person, but it's a lot. You know, what are we going to do with 5,000? How are we going to target drugs to that? How are we going to do experiments to that? So what we want to do is we want to reduce that 5,000 down to a few key mutations that are going to give rise to the drugs that doctors are going to prescribe and the things that people are going to focus research on. So it's called prioritizing those 5,000 mutations. So we're going to talk about how we can use our map now to search through those mutations and prioritize them. So we're going to start with all that big data from cancer, and we're going to look in particular at the cancer genome sequencing. Here I just show a selection of whole genome sequences of prostate and breast cancer. It's about 100 in total. Now, most of these mutations in these um, in these cancers, 99% of them occur outside of genes. And so there's, been, there's always a myoptic focus in genetics on genes because that's what we understand most. But when you look in an unbiased way at the mutations that occur in a disease, most of them occur 
outside of genes. So 99% of these mutations occur outside of the genes. And so we want to understand which of those mutations are driving the cancer, which are important. So what we're just going to do is we put together a very simple scheme that we're going to use to prioritize based on our annotations. So we're going to take our mutations. And basically, we're going to say, do they go into any of the, are, do they hit into those sensitive regions in the genome that are both functional and conserved, okay? Then we're going to give them, say, a point. And then we're going to ask, are they particularly disruptive? Do they mess up, the, say, the binding site? And then we're going to ask, do they hit one of those network hubs? You know, if they hit a hub, maybe they're more deleterious, okay? So we're looking for mutations that are very different from the normal pattern of variation. And then we upweight it and prioritize that. So what happens when we actually do that on a real cancer genome? So this is a, a one prostate cancer genome sequenced in about probably 2000, or at least described initially in 2011. And it contained about 2,000 um, um, uh, mutations in it. Too many to look at. But we can ask, you know, how many are in a sensitive region, how many are in a hub, and so forth. And the key thing is at the end, we get down to one, one mutation. And this one mutation, people can do follow-up experiments on. They can drill into detail what's going on in this mutation, and it turns out you can actually see, to some degree, it drives the cancer. So then next thing we did is we tried to go from an idea into a practical piece of code that people can use, which is, of course, much more difficult than actually having an idea. So we tried to develop an actual web server that people could upload variants to and they could use to prioritize their mutations. So we call this web server FunSeq. And let me tell you a little bit about the structure of the web server because I think it gives you a little bit of a sense of how you think about the data. So we have this huge data context, okay, that I'm going to talk about. And then we have our variants, which are much smaller. Our variants are only a few thousand variants. You can upload them to a web server. You can email them around. Now, there's privacy concerns sometimes, but just in general, they're not very large data. We have this huge data context. And so we imagine we put them together. And then we get a prioritization. That's the kind of high level of what happens. But then we think about this data context. What we do in the data context is we put a lot of effort to taking all these very big data sets, such as the 1,000 genomes, polymorphisms, the, the ENCODE annotations, and building kind of a simplified data context that is big, but is maybe not the terabyte scale. It's maybe only a few tens of gigabytes, okay? It's something that people can download. It's something that you can manipulate. So there's, I think there's a big issue in dealing with large data is kind of processing into smaller, more manageable things. It's very much like the way when you take a picture in your camera now, you can't actually deal with the raw image. You deal with the processed, lossy JPEG. That's what you actually deal with. And like we want to deal with kind of simplifications of this large data sets. And then, of course, the, within the variant prioritization, we have all these different features, and we have this idea of recurrence. I'm not going to go into these in any um, detail just to say that we use the, the hubs and we use the sensitive regions and other these sort of site-breaking things and so forth. And we weight them in var this is sort of an entropy-based uh, weighting scheme that we use for the data. I'm just going to zip through because I think I'm a little going a little bit over. So let me just summarize um, what I've told you about today. So what I've told you about is a case study in biological data science and basically how we make a map of the genome and how we use it as a tool. And so first I wanted to introduce you to this map making idea uh, for how to think about big data, which is really contrasting to the kind of search idea. Um, then I wanted to talk to you about practically, well, how do we make the map? You know, one is the very simplified, you know, the continental outlines and so forth, and then another is a more synthetic uh, view with the sort of networky type of thing. And so for the sort of linear annotation, we talked about finding regulatory sites, conserved regulatory sites, and for the network thing, we talked about how we build that network and then also how we find that the hubs in the network are more constrained. And then how we take these two facts, two very simple facts, and use them to build a conceptual workflow to prioritize mutations in cancer, and then how we build a software tool based on that, and how in building the software tool we have to, again, think about separating the very large data context from kind of this sort of medium data context, smaller files that you can move around on the web and you can process with. And, you know, of course I know that most of this is targeted to um, a biological audience, but I think genomics has been a big data discipline for a while, and I think a big part of data science is learning from other, um, other big data disciplines. And so I, I draw inspiration from Pandora, which described its, its um, website as the Music Genome Project. So they've obviously learned from genomics. And, and you know, we, I think through a lot of discussions such as the, at today's forum, we can have a lot of back and forth with um, different disciplines to learn things. And so finally, 
I want to acknowledge a lot of the people involved. And as I've described to you before, this is a crowd, this is crowd science, okay? A lot of people involved in this. And so it's hard to acknowledge people properly and give them credit, right, if there's so many people. So I'm going to try to do that really quick now. So the ENCO consortium, yeah, maybe 500 to 1,000 people. It's broken into a group. And the group that I talked about their work is called the Networks Elements Group. It's about 50 people. These are the people here. And the, the group, it's nice. It's really split between the people who generate these very large data sets, such as Rick Myers and um, Mike Rick Myers at Hudson Alpha and Mike Snyder um, at Stanford, and the analysts, um, some of the large people here. For instance, I'd like to um, acknowledge Joel Rosofsky, who's an associate research scientist with me, Chow Chang, who used to be a, um, a postdoc with me, now has a faculty position at Dartmouth, uh, Kun Kyu Yan, who's another um, uh, associate uh, research scientist with me, who really led a lot of this um, analysis. Um, the cancer prioritization is even more complicated. This is a collision of consortia. So, no, it is fascinating socially. So we have the Thousand Genomes Consortium, which this is formally part of, which is also known as the Thousand Authors Consortium, because we have more authors than we have genomes. There's a subgroup of this, 50 people. That's called the Functional Interpretation Group. That's what this group did. These are all the green people here. And um, they include myself and also Ekta Karana, who is a, a social research scientist with me now. She's moved on to a faculty position at Cornell. And th this group collided with another consortium, really, the TCGA or the cancer group. Um, and this a particular small group here, you see, kind of merged with them, OK? And this was led by uh, Mark Rubin at um, Weill Cornell in New York, um, who helped with the, a lot of the cancer uh, genomics. And also key in this endeavor was um, Yao uh, Fu, who is a CBB uh, graduate student here in the, um, at Yale, who really developed a lot of the uh, software um, that I described uh, for this cancer prioritization. And with that, I'll thank you for your attention. Oh, did I not save it? Don't save it. Okay. <laughs> All right, well, I'm gonna follow up with a talk that hopefully ties in quite well um, off of the previous speaker, because I'm gonna be talking about measuring the shape of life rather than measuring the genomes that underpin it. And because of the broad audience here today, the goal of my talk really is to give you an idea of the different opportunities, challenges, and data that are involved um, in measuring the shape of life, and to talk about what I've done to with my broader group to leverage the resources that are available here at Yale. And one of my big hopes is that in talking to you all, we can talk about ways that the data infrastructure and scientific computing that has been developed in other fields can be used uh, in the shape of life as well. So before I get to the opportunities and challenges of the science, I want to start with a story to emphasize the point that shape matters. So. This summer, I, I was lucky enough to be in Africa following um, a researcher, Guy Western, who studies lions, out into the field one morning. And we happened across these two darling little wildebeests wandering across the savanna. And a few seconds later, <laughs> the five or six lions that were creeping along the edges attacked the wildebeest and killed it. Now, you can imagine that had that wildebeest had slightly longer legs, or had he jumped a little bit harder, or perhaps, you know, had he been a little bit more attentive, because he really did not seem to be paying much attention, <laughs> he might have gotten out of the way of those lions. And so, all of those aspects I just described are things that can be called a phenotype. So the different characteristics, the express characteristics that define an organism. And shape is a phenotype. Certain people have longer legs, can run a bit faster than I can, for instance. Um, certain people ha are better at climbing. There's a lot of different aspects in our morphology that affects how we interact with the environment. So shape matters. And it doesn't just matter when it comes to things like predation. It also matters in, in uh, interactions that can be mutually beneficial to both parties involved. Like here you see this darling little bird also in Africa about to feed on a flower. And the flower is shaped in such a way that when the bird feeds, it, it also gets pollen on its forehead and carries pollen off to pollinate other flowers. And even though we can imagine shape mattering more in things like lions and wildebeests and birds and flowers, it also matters to organisms that are a little bit stranger to us. 
So these are our strange organisms on land. But in my research, I study the strange organisms in the sea. And imagining the causes and the importance of phenotype in the sea or shape is a little bit more difficult because they live in a three-dimensional environment. They can be seen from all directions. They're floating. It's a vast realm. So understanding exactly what their phenotype does is a little bit of a bigger problem. But the most important thing to take away is that even though shape matters for how organisms interact with their environment, we typically measure genotypes much better than we measure shape. And this isn't to say that we shouldn't be measuring genotypes because understanding the genomes or the genes that underlie these different expressed characters is critically important for understanding evolution um, in both the past um, and uh, short-term variations in populations today. But if we're going to understand the link between genotype and phenotype, we have to measure the phenotype or shape as well. And this came in very personal to me because I actually studied both genotypes and phenotypes in these fish here. And the amazing thing was, with next generation sequencing, we were able to sequence the genomes of, uh, across these fish within the order of like a week, a few weeks. But when I went to measure the phenotype, to measure its shape, I sat there for two months painstakingly putting little dots all over this fish and in its, in its jaws to actually describe what the phenotype was doing. So we are measuring the genotype much better than we measure the phenotype. And we need to get on par with when it comes to measuring shape. Because in the end, phenotype or shape is the variation that natural selection acts on. And here, this is my favorite group of organisms. I hope you guys, oh, it's not showing up so well. These are planktonic foraminifera. These are single-celled organisms that have um, that form, a fossil, uh, that form a shell as they grow, and they're found throughout the world's oceans. So even though you've probably never seen them before, there's millions and billions of them in the ocean. Um, and when it comes to measuring phenotypes, it's recognized that phenomics is really the next grand challenge. People are measuring different expressions of, of the um, of organisms, not just their shape, but also their metabolisms, um, or other aspects of their behavior, but we're not measuring it on the same scale. So really the goal of the talk today is to talk through what the opportunity is when it comes to measuring shape, what the data is that we need to be collecting, and what the challenges are. And really, we've been working quite hard at this in my group for the last year, so I'm gonna give our work as a case study. So what's the opportunity when it comes to measuring shape? <coughs> Well, the amazing thing is we actually have the material, the tools, and the methods to be measuring phenotypes, to be measuring shape at the same scale that we're measuring genotypes. To start with, organisms are everywhere. <laughs> it's what makes walking around so interesting. And it, when it comes to thinking about the fossil record, which is where my research lies, there are actually huge numbers of fossils. Ever since Darwin complained about the notorious gaps in the fossil record, I think a lot of people wrote it off. But if you go out into the open ocean today and you look at the bottom of the ocean, in many parts of the ocean, there are literally football fields deep sediments that are made entirely of fossils. Those fossils are entirely microscopic. So you're talking about billions to trillions of fossils sitting there waiting to tell you about things like variation and evolution in the fossil record. So we just need to measure them. And the amazing thing is we use these very same fossils, in my case, my darling foraminifera, to do things like reconstruct the evolution of past climates. So we heard a little bit about the difficulties and the importance of understanding climate dynamics in the past earlier today. Um, but the amazing thing is the climate system interacts with biology because biology is the carbon store for the climate system in, off, uh, in many times. And it's one of the big uncertainties when it comes to understanding climate dynamics today and in the past. What is the response of biota and how does that interact with the climate system? But even though we can draw, this here is actually a curve of um, Oxygen isotopes, which can be interpreted in terms of temperature that go from back when the dinosaurs ruled the day up to the present day. So you can see the long-term changes in the climate system. And the reason why the, the dots are all scattered is because we have so much data, you actually can't see at this scale, the fine scale resolution. So we have this for temperature, we have this for carbon, but we don't have this when it comes to the biota themselves. So we can't tell you, even though the fossils are there, we can't tell you how rapidly these different species are evolving to these changes. So the opportunity is really there. Um, we just need to measure it. And when it comes to 
uh, what can we measure in the fossil record, at least in the open ocean, you actually have representatives of many different parts of the whole ecosystem. So you're not just looking at one group of organisms. You can look at many groups of organisms at once. But to do this, you're going to have to use more tools than we traditionally use. So in the past, when it comes to looking at variation in the fossil record, we do it the way I described with the fish. You take out 10, 20 fossils out of a jar. Oh, I forgot to tell you. These jars of fossils, so each one of these data points comes from a jar like this. And a single jar can have something like 2 to 10 million fossils in it. That's a lot of fossils. But instead of actually measuring them, we tend to just take out 10 to maybe a few hundred and give them a name, and maybe measure one or two aspects of its shape. But instead, what we're doing in my group here is trying to use multiple different methods to measure shape and tie across them with informatics. So um, I've talked a little bit about the, the traditional way of just um, of quantifying shape by putting little points on an object. But you can also quantify shape by taking really resolved um, three-dimensional measures, and that's um, through micro and nano CT scanning. Um, and that's that approach. And that's actually been used uh, to great effect for a lot of um, recent research on the evolution of morphology. But it's difficult to quantify variation because this is so expensive and so slow that you can get a very good understanding of a few individuals, but you can't study the millions or the thousands of individuals that will tell you about the variation within a population, the variation that underlies evolution itself. So what we're doing in my lab is focusing on rapid high throughput approaches, um, semi-3D morphometrics, and other, other faster methods like grain size and shape analysis through high um, throughput flow systems in order to increase the amount of information that we have. And with the genomic analogy, when you measure things by next generation sequencing, there is a bit of a trade-off between the precision of the measurement and the speed at which you get it. And I'm proposing the same trade-off when it comes to morphology. We will get something out of having more information, even if there's more noise in that information. And the final piece of, of why we should just be doing this already is that we actually have methods um, that have already been published and already have been tested for dealing with this high throughput morphological data. So this here is just an example um, from Doug Boyer's group, where they've basically been using automated 3D morphological comparisons to compare teeth. So the teeth that they measured, they just have a, a, a relatively small set of teeth, but they've measured them with micro CT scanning. And so our group is taking these same methods and then applying them to the tens of thousands of fossils that we're measuring with semi-3D uh, semi methods. So although the opportunity is there, the fossils or the living organisms exist, the methods exist, and the tools with which to measure these shapes exist, we aren't really doing it at the scale that we need to be doing as a, as a broader community. So the, a lot of the work in my lab is built around the premise that closing this data gap is doable and well worth doing. And for many questions, it depends on your question, of course, but for many questions, you just want to skip straight to the trait data and look at things like variation and shape. So I'm going to talk about one type of data today. And the key type of data is measuring the shape of my microfossils using um, 2D and semi-3D measurements. So basically, each of these fossils, this is the planktonic foraminifera, single-celled organism. Each one of them is on the scale of one-tenth to one millimeter in size. So these are about the size of a grain of small salt, or quite a bit smaller, in fact. But you can see from this picture that their morphology varies quite a bit. And so there's actually a morphological taxonomy that matches up with, with genetics. So we can actually identify to species what each one of these are. Uh, organisms are. And when you look at these organisms, you can see within a population that their shape varies quite a bit. So what we're doing is we're going to sites around the global ocean today, throughout the Atlantic primarily, and for the last 80 million years to create a database of morphological variation within these fossils. Um, and to start, we're starting in the Atlantic today. And We've been trying to minimize the noise in our data by orienting the fossils and, and prepping them in a certain way. And here you can see one of our slides. And the students that are prepping the slides have been getting so bored that they've been making patterns like Yale <laughs> on my slides. <laughs> um, 
and we had things like running horses and waves. But um, the goal of this calibration data set is to basically deal with the fact that if you just toss fossils on a microscope slide, they have a random orientation, whereas if you organize them uh, from a common orientation, it minimizes the noise. So we're testing to see if we can skip that orientation step in the future because it, it really is quite painstaking. But um, uh, over the last year, we've managed to put together um, about 20 sites at this point, which means that we have on the order of 50,000 individuals that have been measured. But, going, but starting essentially a new approach to measuring phenotypes was a really daunting endeavor. And getting off the ground was helped dramatically by the data infrastructure here at Yale. So what did we do? So we bought a microscope that is better used uh, oftentimes in histology, but we re-rigged it so you can use reflected light. So it's an automatic little robot microscope that steps around and takes uh, uh, three-dimensional slices through an object. We bought a data storage uh, server with 50 terabytes so we could put our data somewhere. And um, we looked into different options for, uh, for storing and sharing this data. And really, when it came to solving all of these problems, at every single step, it was a big, um, there were multiple hurdles because nobody's done, th done this in this way for, for fossils before. So we worked with people uh, in the different microscope companies to come up with the best system for our needs. Uh, within Yale, we worked with a lot of people um, on the storage and computing side. I have to say, when I first started this, I was worried about properly identifying each one of these fossils. Because as soon as you go through a slide, um, I have to go back to this one. As soon as you go through a slide like this that has, you know, a thousand individuals on it, each one of those individuals needs its own ID and its own information with where it comes from. And so I sent an email out to, to Yale's network, and Kristen sort of caught me and said, hey, we have the infrastructure to help you deal with this. Let's get a team together and figure out the best way to put information on your images, to store them, and to make them accessible to the public. So uh, if you're starting out in a new field, I think one of the big takeaway message here at Yale is that there are people here that are actually willing and excited to help you to come up with the best solution. So that was a, a really amazing thing that I've been uh, to have the chance to work with everyone over the last year. And so what we've done up until this point is basically build the informatics pipelines to go from having a slide to having the data out the other end. So if you look at a slide like this, the first thing that we do is we automatically identify all the objects, we cut them up into unique objects, and we smack a label on them. And that label, I don't know if you guys can read it very well, but it basically says, it gives every object a unique name. It tells you what site it comes from. It tells you how large it is. It tells you what time period it lived in. It tells you its latitude and longitude. And you get that for every single slice, every single depth stack. Um, but that's not what most people are going to want when they do their research. They're going to want the derivative data. What's the 2D shape data? Or what's the 3D wireframe data? So the pipeline also includes automatic measures for measuring shape. And we're working on the 3D aspects of it at this moment. So I'm just going to end by talking about the challenges that we faced and the challenges that we're still facing, actually. And one of the big challenges we're facing is that there is no uh, open access data storage um, infrastructure within the United States as a whole for this type of data. There are multiple different resource centers that claim to be something like GenBank, where you can put morphological data, but they're actually not set up for data of this magnitude. So although I have a 50 terabyte server, we've nearly filled it up at this point. So, and um, a lot of the data storage that we have, um, the, the way that we cost out data storage internally requires paying for data on a year-by-year -year basis, which makes a lot of sense given the importance of data curation, but it's very difficult to write into a grant to say that you'd like to pay for 50 terabytes of data for 100 years. <laughs> so the problem of storing data forever is a big one, but I'd argue that it's an important one because one of the brilliant things about the whole genomics revolution was not just what was done with the first set of genetic data, but it was the reprocessing that was done afterwards, and it was this whole ecosystem of bioinformaticians who then learned how to deal with the data as time went on. And you really have to have a big pool of data for people to work on in order to build up that sort of community. So I, 
I'm really quite um, emphatic that we need to keep this data long enough to build up the community to deal with it, and that's a really big problem. <laughs> so recur recurring data costs are, are really prohibitive, um, and it'd be fun to think about alternative data pricing structures that would allow for permanent data storage um, that can be costed into a grant in an upfront ma manner. Um, the second takeaway is that, yes, this data is messy. It's not as perfect as if you orient a fossil or take a, a resolved 3D image, but data volume itself can be transformative. And this is something that re we've really learned from things like astronomy <laughs> and genomics. And this message just keeps coming up over and over again, but data is just data without people. And really, Transforming data into science and answering the biggest, most important questions requires having the support of a broad range of creative, interactive people. And um, I've been really lucky to have that here at Yale, but I'd like to sort of beat the drum that we have to keep this going if we want to keep leading in data-driven science. So big data and measuring the shape of life, we're working on it, guys, <laughs> but we have a lot of outstanding problems that could really benefit from the expertise that's been built up over the decades of working on astronomical problems and genetic problems and all the other network problems that you're dealing on. So there's the opportunity to actually look at the processes that underlie evolution itself, which I find terrifically exciting. But there are really big hurdles um, to, to doing this, and no single lab or no single university can do it on their own. So I'll just end with, this isn't just for tiny fossils. These approaches should be taken everywhere, um, but hopefully by starting it with tiny fossils, uh, it provo provides a roadmap for others who want to do something similar. So, thank you. Hey, good afternoon. I want to first thank the organizers of the Day of Data for inviting me to present some, present some of my research. And I also want to thank all of you for being here. It's a gorgeous Friday afternoon, and you're all inside hearing us talk about data. So very fortunate to have you all here and looking forward to sharing some ideas. For those of you who are not familiar with our research center, the Yale Center for Environmental Law and Policy, we're a joint think tank between the School of Forestry and Environmental Studies and also Yale Law School. We are founded in 1994, it's our 20th anniversary. We are not having a party, unfortunately, but it just occurred to me today that we have been around for 20 years. And we seek to apply academic rigor to real world policy making. So I wanna talk about one of the projects that is our flagship, which is the Environmental Performance Index. And so this project seeks to help policymakers in the real world seek a, a signal through very, very noisy data. And so um, if there's one message that I want to leave you with today is that measurement matters. And it matters for the environment. And so maybe you're familiar with this old adage that you can't manage what you don't measure, and you can't manage well what you don't measure well. Well, what I'm going to argue, and in my research, we actually see many gaps currently in our understanding of many environmental issues. And so measurement is still very salient, and we still need to do more of it for the environment. So arguably, data and information has had salience for the environmental domain since Rachel Carson in the 1960s released her seminal work, Silent Spring. And so in this work, she used science and demonstrated that pesticides were accumulating in agriculture and food change and endangering human health and natural ecosystems. And so by demonstrating their toxicity, she was able to motivate a public awareness campaign in order to raise awareness of this, of this important issue and the danger of pesticides. But if we look at environmental policy throughout the years since Rachel Carson released her work and arguably started this environmental movement in the United States, environmental policy has long been plagued by information asymmetries, data gaps. And so as a result, a lot of our policies have been based on educated guesses, but not hard facts. So I wish I had the problem that Professor Gerstein presented, which is this hairball problem of having too much data and not being able to distill it down. But actually, in my work, it's the opposite. We don't have enough data, and we actually have a lot of gaps. Um, so with the rise of the information age, we're starting to slowly see a shift from top-down command and control types of governance and regulation to those that increasingly emphasize the role that data and information can play. So the command and control is that first bubble, top-down, 
regulation, moving more towards economic market-based measures. So right now, President Salovey is talking about an internal carbon cap for the university. So that's falling into that second wave. But now we're really in this third wave where there's a greater recognition that information, transparency, and disclosure can play a role in helping to drive improvements in environmental policy. And so now we're embarking upon this phase of big data, as my colleagues just mentioned, where data is playing more of an active role, where we can, it can actually drive improvements in environmental policy, and data and information can whole scale restructure processes, actors, and institutions. So this is where our work falls in, particularly on the, the work that I'll, I'll discuss next, which is on indicators. So what, what are indicators? Well, indicators are taking some sort of raw data and quantifying variables through some type of transformation statistically or some type of normalization to then, in the environmental domain, communicate some sort of phenomenon, environmental pressure or state. And so my work looks at the role of indicators as they play in this causal chain of moving from data to information to eventually influencing actors and policymakers and creating some form of knowledge. So the, the lens that my work squarely falls within is um, the role of indicators in the policy process. So what might some of those roles actually be? Well, first of all, we see that indicators and in policy can play an instrumental role. So they can be used as tools to evaluate whether or not programs are performing well or whether or not there are some critical areas of concern. They can also play a conceptual role. So where there's a new idea or trying to connect two disparate concepts together, indicators can actually bridge ideas together. So I have this picture of a molecule because it's interesting when I talk about indicators and data, policymakers, they say to me, I don't want to learn chemistry. I just want you to tell me, am I doing better? Am I doing worse? So no chemistry, no molecules, no science. Decision makers, at least in my work, they don't want to hear it. So they just want to know up or down, am I getting better or worse? And indicators can help provide that information. Um, last, indicators can also play a political role. So I have a picture of Francis Bacon here saying knowledge is power, and so in many cases we see that policymakers use indicators for some political purpose, whether to discredit a particular actor or to boost their particular position. So probably in election cycle you hear a lot of this, statistics, my opponent caused the ec economy to downturn 10%, etc. cetera. So that's another way that indicators are used in policy. So now I want to turn to the project that I lead here at Yale more specifically, which is the Environmental Performance Index, or EPI. I think we might have some public health people here, so I don't want to confuse it with epi and epidemiology, because that's something that gets very confusing on Twitter when I just say EPI. So I wanted to make that clear, talking about environment. And what this is, is a global ranking that we produce biannually here at Yale in conjunction with Columbia University, and we rank countries on how well they perform on high priority environmental issues like climate change, air quality, forest, fisheries, et cetera. So now I'll talk about how we actually use data to create this index and ranking. Well, the EPI measures performance in two policy objectives. So we look at impacts on human health, so that's on the right with the warm colors, and we also gauge performance in ecosystems, so that's uh, the blue circle right there. So looking at these two objectives, we're able to gauge how well countries are performing and protecting human health from environmental harm and also preventing natural resource degradation. And then within these two policy objectives, we look at nine issue areas. So this is what I just mentioned, fisheries, forests, water and sanitation, et cetera. And where the data actually comes in is on the indicator scale. So we look at 20 indicators for every single country. And these indicators, we use what we call a proximity to target methodology. So we take raw data and then we determine a top performance benchmark by which to gauge how close or far every country is to achieving that target. So a question I get very commonly is, well, how do you determine what those targets are? Isn't that rather arbitrary? Well, we try to be objective by looking towards international frameworks, treaties, scientific thresholds, something that's objective that we can objectively gauge every country's performance on. Where do we get our data? We have to look towards official statistics, so um, data that countries report to UN agencies, for example, or we rely on satellite data. Um, in, in some cases, we actually custom compile our own data sets by calling up countries' statistical offices to, to, get, to get the data. So once um, we're able to collect all of that data 
and for every single country calculate proximity to target indicators, we assign a series of statistical weightings at each level, each level of the circle, to develop that one number that represents a country's environmental performance index score. So the size of the wedge in this wheel roughly represents the, the statistical weighting that we apply to each level of aggregation. So for the 2014 index, which was just launched this past January at the World Economic Forum, we ranked 178 countries around the world. So to give you a sense of how global that is, that constitutes around 99% of the global population, around 98% of global land area, and 97% of global GDP. So it's as much of a global picture of the environment as you can get that's really out there. So just taking a look at this map, the higher performing countries are in blue, so probably not surprisingly, North America, European countries perform quite well, and the countries in orange perform poorly. So a lot of Sub-Saharan Africa, we have um, South Asia that performs quite poorly, and a lot of Central Asia as well. Okay, so what are some of the key takeaways from this year's index and this global picture of environmental data and results? Well, what we find is that performance isn't consistent across, country, uh, across countries or across issues. So if you look at results over the past decade, um, issues such as access to drinking water, reductions in child mortality, terrestrial habitat protection have been improving over time and also are doing quite well. So the, the y-axis is zero to 100. So think of a report card with 100 being an A plus and zero being failing, miserably failing. Um, so actually fish stocks miserably failing, which is one of, one of these dark green lines. So there are other issues such as protecting fish species and protecting populations against poor air quality, which are doing very, very poorly. So this is something that we're able to do after we compile all the data and analyze for these global mega trends. Another conclusion that we walked away with is when you have measurement and management aligned, real progress can be achieved. So we call this slide here the tail of two indicators falling off of Dickens. The yellow line represents the proportion of the global population lacking access to clean water, whereas the orange line represents the population globally that's being exposed to poor air. So very, very divergent trends. And that reflects the fact that through this international framework called the Millennium Development Goals, there was a goal identified to, re to have the global population lacking access to clean drinking water by 2015. And in 2011, the world already surpassed that goal. So that's a, a prime example of when you have international systems that prioritize and put a lot of investment into monitoring and managing water, you can achieve, achieve real results. And then another way to look at that is when the two are not aligned, as in the case of fisheries, natural systems really suffer. So this is a plot over the last 60 years of the percentage of fish stocks that are either overexploited or collapsed. And very, very surprising and stark trends here. And it's largely because a lot of governments don't regularly measure and report on a lot of these fish species. So we had to actually work with an independent organization outside of the UN FAO to, to reconstruct the time series of these fish data so that we could get a sense of globally how fish stocks are doing. And it's not a good picture. It's not very optimistic. And last, um, data gaps remain. So I talked about the fact that we don't yet, as I argue, have big data for many of the environmental issues that we would like to gauge for the EPI. So this is a map of where cities report air quality data to the World Health Organization. And you can see many, many gaps through most of Africa. Russia, for example, only has one data point. A lot of Southeast Asia missing a lot of data, and same with, with Latin America. And in fact, we're still missing globally comparable data for many of these issues that we would like to gauge countries' performance on, but because there isn't any data, we can't include it in our EPI. So that includes things like desertification, soil quality, wetlands loss, nuclear safety. So we don't claim that the EPI is by any means comprehensive, but it really reflects as much as the data that we have available, but also the many gaps that we still face. Okay, so another question I often get asked is, well, how do you know that anybody cares about the EPI, and is this actually making the policy impact that you talked about earlier? So I have several theories as to how the EPI is actually affecting and influencing policy. First of all, by developing this ranking, by ranking countries from number one to 178, what we're seeing happen is a race to the top. So countries are competing against each other. They're saying, well, I'm Norway, and Sweden is doing so much better than me. What is it that they're doing that I can also do? So a great example is uh, South Korea. 
Um, in 2002, in our first iterate, one of our first iterations of our index, they performed 136th out of 142 countries. And this was a huge slap in the face to South Korea. They said, how could this be? There's no way we can be doing this poorly. And so they created the 136 Environmental Forum based on their ESI score, and they invited celebrities, policymakers, city mayors, uh, civil society representatives to come together to talk about what they could do to improve their score on this index. Another way we see the EPI influencing policy is the EPI is becoming a platform for change within countries. So by presenting those indicators consistently to every single country, they can make comparisons to relevant peers and understand where they might be leading and where they might be lagging. So a prime example of this is this, this year we broke a story in the New York Times that questioned why the international attention has paid a lot of focus to Beijing's poor air quality, but New Delhi, which has similarly bad air quality, has been ignored. And so using satellite-derived data, this is one of the very few cases in which we actually do have some big data for the environment, we were able to show through our indicators that India's air quality is just as bad as China's, if not worse, on some of our indicators. And this was a huge surprise to New Delhi's government. I came to work one day, and every single media organization had contacted me, The Economist, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, BBC, and it was because of this New York Times story that, I mean, this is a terrible headline. We don't want anybody to be breathing any smoggy or bad air, but it really was motivating for the Indian government. I mean, they were just completely aghast. And I said to them, well, if you don't think your air quality is as bad as Beijing's, cough up the data. But the fact is, is that you don't regularly monitor any air quality in your cities on a real-time basis. And some of our researchers went to their official websites and found that they were reporting, reporting real-time data as old as April of 2013. And this was just this year in January. So it, it was quite shocking to them. And since we called them out in the New York Times, they have released um, or they have plans to release a new air quality index that will link together ambient measures of air pollutants to health impacts because people there also have no idea how bad the air quality is. So some of the Indian policymakers that I've spoken to have said, oh, air quality isn't a problem in India. It's not going to be for another 10 to 20 years. And what I've said to them is, no, it's a problem now. And because you don't present any data doesn't mean it's not a problem. And so th I think that's, a, I think, a, a pretty powerful example for how the EPI is actually playing into these policy debates. Um, third, we see that the EPI is also working to set and inform policy agendas. So earlier this year, we actually had a delegation from Iraq come and visit us. This is at Yale Law School. And we had a, a delegation from Iraq's Ministry of Environment and Ministry of Planning come to us because they were very, very concerned about it, the fact that in 2012, they performed last on our EPI. And they wanted to know how they could do better. So this was literally a week before all the political situation happened and, and ISIS struck. And so if they had waited a week, they wouldn't have been able to come. But this was quite interesting for us because as academics, you operate sometimes in an ivy tower. You have no idea if anyone's paying attention to what you're doing. And this is a case where they reached out to us because they wanted to know how they could do better. And they were putting things on the environmental policy agenda because they were performing poorly in those areas on the EPI. Last, as I mentioned, because we look towards these international frameworks, the EPI can be a powerful tool to help countries track progress towards global goals. So I was just in New York earlier this week because the UN General Assembly is meeting right now to talk about the design of new global sustainable development goals that will take place in 2015 when these old Millennium Development Goals expire. And so because we knew that this process was coming, this week in September, when we started to develop our data sets for the EPI, we were looking towards the proposed sustainable development goals for guidance as to what might be most helpful for countries. So this is one of these data sets that I mentioned that we custom compiled on wastewater treatment. So one of these SDGs that's being proposed is on water, and they want countries to track their percentage of, of wastewater that they treat. Um, but currently, there doesn't exist any other data set out there except for the one that we put together to tell countries how they're doing on this critical driver of freshwater quality. So this was one of, one of my researchers' full-time job for about four months is putting together this data set. So it's, it was a big breakthrough for us as well. Okay, so now is the, the ulterior motive to my being here today, which is a call to action to anybody who wants to help us in this effort of trying to get big data for the environment. And so what, my, I mean, I, I have a, a definition of big data up here, but I think uh, my colleagues have, have gone over sufficiently what we mean by big data. But what I argue is that we still don't have big data yet for the environment. And that's mainly because whales don't tweet, 
trees don't shop on Am Amazon. And even though you have private sector companies like Amazon and eBay, Target, for example, who have realized the value of big data, it's not yet happening or being applied or thought of very much to the environmental realm. So as a result, I, I showed you all of those data gaps. And we're in the process of right now trying to think about how we can fill in some of those gaps. But we desperately need as much help as we can get. So one consideration that, that we're thinking is how we might engage citizens and with the proliferation of smartphones, low cost sensors, citizen science, how we might engage everyday people into helping us source data from the bottom up instead of relying on data sourced from the top down from governments because we know that in our research, governments have variable motivations to not report data, hello India, um, or manipulate data, hello China. Um, so because of that, I, I think that this really calls for a data revolution for us to engage citizens, companies, non-state actors into this effort to help us really understand some of the most critical issues that face the world today, which includes air quality and climate change. And these problems are not getting better, they're getting worse. So towards that end, I just want to point to a couple projects that my team is working on. One is we published this air pollution map from an eco hackathon. So I'm actually hoping that we'll be able to host one of these here at Yale and that many of you will be able to participate. But it's especially on data visualization because we found that something that's very powerful is to actually put all the data in an easily consumed format and let people react to it. So we hacked this map of air pollution data using our satellite data and that WHO data set that I showed you earlier and published the map in the Atlantic, and NASA retweeted it, shared it all over their social media. So we had tens of thousands of people reacting and commenting all over the world on air quality in their country and their cities and saying, well, why is my city this way, or why is my country doing that way? And why, if I'm Russia, is my government only monitoring air pollution in Moscow? So that, this is something that we found has been very powerful in starting conversations, getting people excited about data. And another example that we're going to be ready to launch is we have a couple students who are computer science majors and programmers who have been working with us to translate our very dense scientific findings on data and indicators into a more easily digestible, fun, and attractive way. So they've taken this special issue on the next generation air quality indicators that we publish in atmospheric environment and developing a series of interactive infographics so that people can learn about where the data gaps are, what needs to be done, and hopefully we can motivate political action that way. So I encourage everyone to visit our website. It's epi.yale.edu. I also have a couple of colleagues in the back. Andrew um, presented a poster on the EPI earlier. So if you didn't get a chance to see that, definitely find him afterwards, because he did a very cool interactive display with multiple iPads. So it was quite fun. Um, but yes, please get in touch. And uh, we'd love to hear from you and hear any feedback that you might have about our project. So thanks so much. Thanks to all the speakers. We have a few minutes for questions. So if uh, you want to raise your hand, we'll make sure you're, you're close to a microphone. for the environmental talk. Uh, it strikes me that in the presentation that, that you not only tried to master the data that you had available, you tried to harness the power of the internet to lobby for more data and also to help people understand the data that you had. And I, I think that last piece, have, helping people who are not necessarily expert in the domain in which you're working, understand the data and make it uh, every man's data, every person's data, I, I think is a, a laudable goal. And I'd be curious for you to comment a little bit about the process that you have gone through or your group has gone through to try to get a handle on that. Um, hello? OK. That's a great question. And so I've been at Yale. This is my seventh year now. And I've been running this project for four. And it definitely took a lot of convincing of my colleagues and my PhD advisor that this is actually something that is really worthwhile. And, is I do policy research, so what good is it if I just publish a bunch of dense scientific articles, which I have to do for my tenure process, but at the same time, students who are in our master's program are only around for two years, and so they, and um, many of them are professional degree students, so they're not here to do research degrees, and so I thought about, well, how can we best utilize our students' 
interests and time and skills in a way that will also help them get jobs. I mean, they, they want to go and work for think tanks. They want to do policy research, consulting. Nobody wants to read an academic paper that they've written for a class. They want to know that they know how to do sharp policy analysis, that they know how to use and interpret data s sharply. And so um, from that, I said, I think we need to raise a lot of money to invest in a better website, because our website before, no offense to any statistician out there, but it was a statistician who did our website. And it was, it was good for a statistician, but it was very difficult to interpret a lot of the scatter plots that were included on the website. So um, it's, it definitely, it takes a little bit of, uh, it took, took me a little bit of um, galvanizing my colleagues. But I think once they realized what vision I had and the results and the, the response that we got, I think now it's pretty much selling itself. So we've had a lot of other research centers within our school approach us and say, who did your web design? What students do you work with? Because we pull from students from the art program, from the School of Architecture, from our own school, because it has to be interdisciplinary. And it's fun for the students because then they get to learn skills from the computer programmers, from the statisticians, from the policy research folks. And so it's been, um, it's been, a, it's been a process. It has not been very easy, but I think that now we're starting to hit our stride and get a lot of recognition for what we're doing. But it is very, very challenging because I can't edit blog posts every day and manage um, programming projects. And so I've actually now I've hired somebody who can help coordinate all of the, uh, the outreach and then I can focus more on the research. But it, it certainly is challenging. But I think it's really, really worthwhile. And I'm happy to share my experience if anybody wants to have a meeting because I think it's so worthwhile. I think there's so much great research that goes on here at Yale, but it gets lost within the, the ivory tower. Angel. Uh, so uh, you pointed out, uh, you know, there were obvious, and for obvious reasons, big gaps in, in the, a lot of the data. So it's, right. it's common practice in, like in geology, looking at paleoclimate and so forth, to use various proxies. Yes. Do, do you have, are Lots. there ways to do that here? Or? We have lots of proxies, but they're, they're not very good. So our agriculture category, for example, we have very, very crude policy proxies. So we say, well, have countries banned or restricted their pesticide use according to the Stockholm Convention, which regulates these pesticides. But it doesn't actually say anything about on the ground, whether or not they've actually implemented those commitments. So we have to use a lot of proxies. Even this wastewater treatment indicator is a crude proxy for freshwater quality. So we would like to be able to have comparable water quality for all freshwater bodies in countries around the world. But for a multitude of reasons, that just isn't possible. We just don't have any global indicator of water quality. And so, it, yeah, we definitely rely a lot on proxies, but governments don't really like that. They, they want to know the output measures and, and what is the condition on the ground. And that's why I don't think we're there yet, and I don't think we yet have big data to do that. But that's a really good point. Hi. A um, couple questions. Um, is it possible to use, like, a phone app to measure air quality yet? That's the first question. Second question is, how do you deal with known underestimates from various people? Um, when you don't, when you have to rely on government stuff. And the third really nerdy question is, how did you choose the weights for your various categories? So for the first question, yes, people are designing phone sensors. So there's a Swedish company that has developed some iPhone, uh, I guess like little attachments that, that you can connect to your phone that will measure things like carbon monoxide and peat particulate matter and, and various things. They're about $99 right now, so that's still not, I think, as cheap as it needs to be. But I taught a class at Yale College last spring that was looking at urbanization and environment in China and India. And my students just downloaded some instructions off the internet and built a cheap sensor for about 25 bucks. So I think it can be done, but a huge question is, what is the reliability of that data? How quality is it? And so that's something that we're working on right now to try to, I mean, it'd be great to also include this as part of our hackathon, get the computer scientists and the engineering students and researchers together so that we can manufacture very cheap sensors, ship them all over the world and collect better data. And um, to your other question about the weightings, that is a very hotly debated topic amongst our team and also with external audiences. And so we have to, we, we try to look at the quality of the data and whether or not it's a proxy, if, it, if it's an actual measure or if it's a proxy. So we downweight the proxies. We don't weight them as much as we do the actual output on the ground measures. And then we debate them. We say, oh, is, is the data quality good? Is there any reason why we should be downweighting those? So it, it's very, very subjective. And a lot of countries complain to us and say, I don't agree with your weighting of this, of this issue or that issue. So I, I forgot your second question, but hopefully I answered it. 
Oh yes, bias. Um, that's that's a problem. That's a huge problem. What we would like to do is to eventually publish uncertainty estimates and confidence intervals for every single one of our indicators. But with the government reported statistics, you can't do that because a lot of times when they report data to the UN, they don't report the uncertainty estimates. So it's very very crude. And this is one of the reasons why I think we need to get big data because then when n equals all, right, then you don't have those problems. So, or you you shouldn't have those problems in theory. But yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Mark, when you see these federal mandates for data sharing policies, genomics data sharing policies, as a, as a researcher, do you look at this and say, wow, this is great, or what do I need to do just to get this through the door and not have to spend so much time on it? Well, I, uh, I, th I certainly think that the emphasis on data sharing is a good thing. Obviously, all, all data analysts love when people produce more data and they share it. I mean, that's a general truth. Um, though I do think that um, it is the case that increasingly with data sharing, there be, it is somewhat cumbersome sometimes. And a lot of times, you know, I, you know, collaborate and interact a lot of, with a lot of researchers who are um, working towards those policies, and I realize how much work it is and how very complicated it is. And sometimes you do get the sense that a lot of people think that it's more work to share it than it is to actually generate it or, and so forth. And, and I do think there are times when the data sharing it maybe is not in the best interest, you know, if it's better just to get the answer and, you know, generate another data set and so forth and to go through all the work of trying to share it um, and, and so forth. If, uh, <clears throat> if there's no more questions, we're scheduled for a short 10-minute break. Uh, we'll reconvene for the next session at, uh, at uh, roughly 2.55. Uh, join me in thanking the presenters again.
Atikunda, and uh, I've been asked to uh, start, I guess this is session three. We have uh, two speakers. Uh, our first speaker is uh, Leandro Tesoulis in the blue. Uh, a little bit about him. He's a professor in the Department of Electrical Engineering at Yale, and his research uh, interests include uh, computer and communication networks, uh, with an emphasis on uh, developing models and algorithms for complex networks. Uh, architectures and protocols for wireless systems, as well as exploring sensor networks and novel internet architectures. In addition, he has a, a rather vast experimental platform for, for conducting his research. Uh, Leandros joined Yale about four weeks ago. <laughs> so he's brand new, and I think he's still unpacking boxes. So welcome. Our next speaker is uh, Peter Schott. He's a professor of economics at the Yale School of Management. He's a research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research and a special sworn status researcher at the US Census Bureau. And his research focuses on how countries, firms, and workers respond to globalization. He joined Yale in 1999, so I'm guessing most of his boxes are unpacked by now. So, so welcome, Leandros. Thank you. Thank you, Sekar. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm uh, glad to be here and uh, have the opportunity to give this talk. Um, the flavor of my talk uh, will be a bit uh, different than what we have heard until now. Um, our uh, research is focused on uh, communication networks, that is, on uh, how to manage the transport of data from uh, where they are generated to the users. and. Uh, I'll present uh, a few problems uh, related uh, to current uh, challenges for uh, mobile networking and uh, how we address them. So uh, we'll start with uh, some uh, background and uh, motivation of what you will hear. And the motivation is uh, the explosion of uh, mobile data the last uh, a few years and uh, the diagram here uh, shows that, and as we see, the main reason for um, the data, the mobile data explosion is essentially the smartphones and uh, all the videos that uh, uh, either streamed to the mobile user or they are recorded and uh, uploaded by the user. Uh, so this is uh, some current data, uh, the 2012, 13, and uh, 14, and some uh, projected uh, um, numbers for the data growth as uh, they are uh, uh, predicted by a study performed by Cisco. So we see that uh, there is uh, an average annual growth of uh, 66%. And uh, as we'll see in the next uh, slide that is much faster than uh, the mobile network capacity is growing. Um, the capacity of uh, the mobile network uh, is growing uh, f uh, uh, by various actions of uh, the operators. First, uh, there is uh, some increase on uh, the available licensed bandwidth then uh, there is a continuous additional deployment of uh, new cell sites and uh, there are improvements of uh, the wireless technology itself that allows to push more bits per hertz. Now uh, all this adds up to an uh, average uh, annual growth that is of the order of uh, 29% that is uh, far behind than uh, the increase in mobile data. So uh, uh, that stresses the mobile operators quite a bit, and they, are look, they look to all kinds of uh, alternatives uh, to deal with this explosion. Of course, there are uh, developments on the wireless technology itself. Currently, um, uh, we are uh, using um, 4G networks based on the LTE technology. Um, and there is underway uh, research for the next uh, generation of uh, uh, mobile wireless technology, what is called the 5G technology, but this will take a while. It's a technology that uh, um, will be based on the 60 gigahertz uh, band and will provide um, 
a very significant uh, increase of the capacity. But until then, and this will take um, a few years at least, uh, there is an urgent need uh, to deal with um, the, in the increasing demand for uh, capacity. And uh, I'll present uh, three approaches we have uh, considered uh, recently uh, for uh, dealing with this problem. And the first one is uh, what we call data offloading. What do we mean by data offloading? Uh, typically, mobile uh, services are provided by uh, cellular base stations owned by the mobile operators that operate in uh, the license spectrum, which is licensed to the different operators. Now, in addition to those, there is uh, a proliferation of uh, other means for wireless access, more specifically the Wi-Fi access points, which are omnipresent nowadays. And they can be of three kinds, uh, the residential access points owned by individuals, uh, enterprise access points, uh, as well as uh, access points deployed by different kind of operators which are provided for service to the users. Now, uh, these access points uh, operate in uh, an unlicensed uh, spectrum band, and uh, they are much uh, cheaper in many ways than uh, uh, wireless access through the license spectrum to the cellular operator websites. So, um, one approach for uh, dealing with the increase in the capacity is uh, to try to use uh, to use to the extent possible uh, these other means for wireless access, that is uh, access points and femtocells, and uh, offload a bit uh, the cellular base stations. Uh, now, this offloading is happening in many ways. Uh, for instance, the mobile operator themselves uh, deploy their own uh, access point networks, and perhaps you have uh, seen some of it uh, already moving around. For instance, AT&T has uh, deployed uh, 32,000 Wi-Fi hotspots, that is 32,000 uh, access points, uh, primarily in uh, heavy traffic areas. Uh, in addition, there are... Uh, other companies like uh, Phone, uh, who have uh, their own uh, deployed uh, access point network. Now, uh, besides those, the vast majority of access points we see, they are uh, uh, residential access points or enterprise access points owned by individual entities. And uh, the big opportunity will be if there is an effective way to... Uh, exploit the available capacity of those access points for offloading. Uh, what do we mean? Uh, if you turn on uh, your uh, Wi-Fi interface of um, your uh, smartphone, wherever you are, you will see uh, typically at least a dozen, a dozen or more uh, networks available, but they are all locked uh, because they belong to individuals. If there is a way to make them available somehow uh, to you and uh, have the mobile operator save the capacity by directing you to those access points instead of serving you directly, that will be a big game for them. And uh, we studied uh, some ways to do that. And uh, we came up with uh, a method that uh, essentially views this interaction of uh, the access points and uh, the different mobile operator uh, operators as a market uh, where the operators uh, try to buy in some sense services by the access points and the access points uh, try to benefit somehow by the fact that they offer their capacity to the operators to uh, redirect the traffic. So in a typical scenario, we may have uh, a number of uh, cell site antennas belonging uh, to diff different mobile operators, and uh, they 
operate in the same area with a number of access points, each access point belonging to different individuals. Uh, now, uh, each uh, cell site, from uh, a technical point of view, may uh, redirect uh, their uh, mobile users to a number of access points who are within reach. And, uh, uh, and at the same time, each access point may provide uh, the, uh, this kind of service to different cell sites in the sense that uh, it may serve uh, uh, mobile users from different operators. And uh, the question is, what is uh, an effective way of assigning uh, access points to mobile operators? Uh, effective from two points of view. One point of view is uh, to do the optimal allocation of mobile uh, users to uh, access points and uh, offload, let's say, cell sites which are uh, heavily utilized and uh, they are uh, in capacity and they cannot uh, serve adequately their users. And uh, at the same time, uh, uh, satisfy other uh, efficiency indicators, like for instance, uh, try to offload mobile users which are at the periphery of the cell of uh, a cellular operator because those users are most uh, costly in serving them, both uh, in terms of consumed bandwidth and energy. Uh, now, at the same time, uh, the access points should, ha should have some uh, uh, incentives for providing their excess capacity, even though it is uh, free for them. Uh, the fact that they are providing should give uh, back some benefits. So uh, these incentives should be somehow uh, proportional uh, to the benefit they will offer to the mobile operators. And the best way to do that is to create a market. Now, uh, it turned out that some uh, uh, more traditional ways for doing that, like uh, different types of auctions, uh, like the VCG auction or the McAfee auction, uh, are not efficient for that particular case because uh, they, they will require, in general, an intermediate broker that may need uh, to invest in the market, that is to put uh, uh, money or some kind of utility in the market. And the best way to do that was uh, to use uh, uh, a double auction, uh, which is an extension of uh, a Kelly mechanism for uh, the network utility maximization. So we came up uh, with uh, a setting for this uh, double auction where uh, both uh, the mobile network operators and the access points are used as uh, are viewed as bidders and uh, they bid based on uh, the price on some uh, prices offered by uh, an intermediate broker. Now it turned out that uh, the scheme uh, was effective oops skip this, uh, in the sense that uh, uh, it is uh, amenable to a distributed implementation through an intermediate broker that uh, emits, uh, let's say, scalar signals uh, and allows an iterative exchange of bids between uh, the participating bidders. And uh, it turned out that uh, uh, it converges to some uh, uh, allocation of uh, access points to uh, cell sites, which is socially optimal, socially optimal with respect to the utility functions which are selected. Now, uh, by a careful selection of the utility function, both from the side of the mobile network operator and the access point, uh, this uh, double auction mechanism uh, may converge to a different, um, let's say, equilibrium points. And uh, the challenge for uh, the designer is to select those uh, utility functions appropriately. Now, um, I'll skip to this kept us busy um, the last couple of years, as you see, for the related publications. 
I'll skip um, to the second uh, setting just to give you a flavor. Um, I'll skip a few, a few, fly, a few slides. Uh, I would just uh, um, would like to let you know that uh, in uh, a week time, in October 8, I'll give uh, the same presentation, the full version, one hour of it in the Yin seminar. So if you got interested from what you hear today, you are welcome uh, on October 8 in the Yin seminar. So um, a second problem we considered is what is called the user-provided network. And it is, uh, uh, we try to address the same challenge from, but from a different way. That is, uh, uh, instead of uh, leaving uh, the game of capacity to the cellular operators that try to capture access points, we view uh, the mobile user itself as uh, uh, a potential network provider. Uh, that is, uh, the smartphone that the user carries may act uh, both as a, a gateway to the internet as well as uh, a relay to the user. And uh, by having uh, uh, the users assume those three different roles, that is uh, uh, consumers of service or relay or gateway in an appropriate way, they may provide service to each other uh, without uh, uh, with being transparent to the network. And the question is uh, how to do this effectively by mimicking uh, schemes that uh, have been adopted in uh, other domains for a similar purpose. For instance, uh, um, the Airbnb is an example, right, of uh, a similar type of um, uh, interaction, but in a different domain. Now, uh, some uh, recent advantages in networking, like the software-defined uh, networks which are available today, uh, provide all the technical flexibility for adopting such schemes and implementing them. Let me give you some uh, examples of how such a scheme will work and what are the challenges. Uh, here, for instance, we see uh, three smartphone uh, carriers uh, in the first picture that uh, uh, may act either as uh, consumers of service, uh, which is the client here, or as uh, intermediates for uh, providing uh, connection to the internet. Uh, so uh, the two smartphones which are labeled gateways, they have a direct connection to the internet, one through uh, a cellular connection and the other through a Wi-Fi connection. And uh, the third user benefits uh, from their own internet connection to have uh, 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 to have uh, his own uh, internet connectivity through them. Uh, in the second picture, uh, we have uh, a two-hop SAT scheme where uh, the client smartphone accesses the, in the internet through a two-hop connection to the smartphone that has uh, a direct access to the internet through um, uh, through his uh, cell connection. And uh, in the other two pictures, we see two other scenarios of such uh, role exchange between relay and the gateway, uh, which have uh, some, uh, uh, eff uh, which, have, uh, which, which provide uh, eventual uh, internet connectivity to the final client. Now, uh, as uh, a network evolves and the smartphones move around, their connections, uh, their direct connections to the internet change, both in terms of availability or quality. So different potential scenarios of clients, relays, and gateways become possible. And uh, the question is, uh, which scenario will be adopted each time such that uh, the internet connectivity is efficient in terms of uh, speed and energy consumption. And uh, it's also fair, fair in the sense that uh, 
each user take its turn serving the other user and uh, we don't end up in schemes where some users always act as gateways providing both capacity and energy for internet connectivity while other users uh, always benefit by uh, having internet connectivity as clients without uh, spending money from their own uh, cellular connection or energy. And uh, we came up with uh, a scheme to do that. Um, I will just um, mention some uh, highlights of the scheme. First, uh, the scheme is based on uh, the NAS bargaining solution as the underlying conceptual framework for exchange of services. It employs some uh, virtual currency uh, to deal with uh, uh, to deal with the problem that uh, at different uh, time instances, time instances, different users have uh, different. Uh, uh, quality of internet connections and uh, they, pro they can provide service or obtain service. And uh, furthermore, uh, the NASBAR gaining solution in that particular case um, naturally provides uh, a distributed means for uh, implementing it and uh, keeping track of uh, which users have benefit for uh, how much time and how much uh, each user owes to the other for the future. So uh, it turned out that um, uh, this scheme works uh, well and um, oops, I'll just want to show you something. And uh, it turns out that it fits well with uh, a very um, a recent framework that uh, is available by Open Garden, which provides a technology for doing that, and uh, the credit scheme we proposed, uh, it can be adopted by the Open Garden framework for regulating the user access. So uh, I'll take just a few minutes to say a few words about the third problem, which again, tries to address uh, the same challenge from a different viewpoint. Now, uh, the viewpoint is the following. Um, again, we need to deal with uh, the rapid capacity uh, demand, the increase of uh, the capacity demand. Uh, and this is a problem that is faced by the mobile operator itself. That is, the mobile operator, uh, in its effort to increase the infrastructure capacity, it uh, deploys uh, cell sites of uh, different nature. That is, uh, some are uh, 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 large cells, some are uh, micro cells or pico cells in the sense of the cells uh, with a periphery of a few 10 meters. Uh, but this uh, requires uh, an excessive infrastructure for connecting all those cells to the internet. And uh, a problem then is that uh, a bottleneck is created on how all these cells will be connected to the wired infrastructure. So a method uh, to deal with this bo uh, bottleneck is again an implicit one uh, th that takes advantage of the fact that uh, a lot of traffic nowadays, especially uh, downlink traffic from the network to the user, uh, is repetitive, that is, a large number of users are seeing the same video or uh, a large number of users in the same location access the same data. So uh, a natural way to deal with it is uh, to add storage at uh, different stages of the network and in particular close to uh, the base station itself. So a uh, novel... Uh, Mobile network architectures have storage at uh, all these different uh, levels and the challenge is uh, how to effectively use this storage. That is, uh, what traffic we should store at each particular uh, uh, storage cache that is available at different uh, uh, parts of the network. Now, uh, in order to 
evaluate this, uh, there is a number of considerations. One is uh, the likelihood that a certain piece of information will be needed at uh, a particular point of the network. And uh, this can be predicted to a large extent uh, by considering uh, the social network structure of the mobile users, that is the characteristics of uh, uh, the access characteristics of uh, the friends, let's say, of a specific user. Uh, another consideration is uh, the service cost of uh, the different connections, that is, uh, certain links are more expensive than others and I uh, would like to use those uh, as little as possible and that uh, um, somehow influences the kind of uh, data that uh, will store in the caches uh, that uh, uh, offload those links. And uh, another consideration is uh, the service policy itself, that is, uh, we need uh, to give uh, priority. Um, I mean, certain uh, types of data have priority over the others, and uh, those should be given priority in storage in the local caches as well. So um, all these considerations should be taken into account in uh, determining, uh, in determining essentially whether a piece of data that is delivered to a user will be kept at the local storage of uh, the base station at the same time or will, be, or will just be uh, neglected. So uh, we studied this problem and we came up with uh, some, uh, uh, some uh, strategy for determining whether a certain piece of information should be kept in each cache. And uh, this strategy is uh, the result of the solution of uh, an optimization problem. Uh, the challenge was uh, how to make this uh, strategy simple to implement uh, such that it is attractive to a mobile operator since uh, the direct solution of uh, the optimization problem uh, was uh, not amenable for uh, an easy implementation of the mobile operator. So uh, we looked in uh, some uh, uh, approximation uh, methods to the optimal strategy that uh, made possible uh, an efficient implementation by the mobile operator. So uh, I think I'll um, stop here. I just wanted to give you a flavor of uh, the type of uh, work we are doing and how it is uh, maybe remotely connected to uh, the uh, the data problems, uh, the data issues you have seen in previous talks. And um, I will be available for any questions you may have later. Okay, uh, uh, thanks for having me here. Um, again, as, I guess a different kind of presentation. This is more about um, data that's gonna become available, not my own data, but data that's gonna become available here at Yale through a, uh, what's known as a research data center. Um, so I thought, uh, uh, when you use census data, every presentation you do has to have one of these, so I thought even though there's nothing in it that's using census data, I would put one of these up. Um, you have to put up one of these disclaimers all the time. Uh, so I would thought I would take you very briefly kind of through um, uh, what RDCs are, what you might get out of them, and why um, uh, they're about to be a lot easier to use uh, for YALEs than they uh, were before. Um, so what is an RDC? An RDC is a research data center. Um, the U.S. Census Bureau and increasingly a lot of other agencies um, in the U.S. government um, have been placing data available, uh, uh, what administrative or survey data available 
um, for the use by for use by researchers. And um, these data are actually never leave uh, Sweetland, Maryland, which is where all the servers are. Um, but increasingly, the census is allowing uh, centers to pop up around the country, um, which point to those data. Um, so Research Data Center is a physical location outside of the Census Bureau that uh, allows one to access census uh, data, as well as uh, census is now taking on the role of archiving data from other agencies. Um, and uh, not just anyone can walk in, they're highly secure locations, um, uh, multiple passwords and IDs to get in, um, but uh, researchers who can become qualified users of the data are allowed access uh, to these data, and the great thing about an RDC is uh, they're open 24-7, 365. So you, with access, you can go in whenever you want. Um, so that's what an RDC is. Uh, what kinds of data does an RDC contain? So there's a really broad range um, of information available. Most of the data, I'm most familiar with the data uh, in the first um, uh, bullet there and as an economist using a lot of the economic data. Um, but think of anything you know of that census collects, uh, the people census, the business census, uh, demographic data, lots of different surveys. Um, these data are made available inside an RDC at the level at which they're collected. So public data sets might summarize, for example, the number of firms that exist in an industry. Um, the economic census, if you access it through an RDC, allows you to see the, uh, align the data for every uh, establishment of every firm that reported information. Um, so tremendous, uh, tremendously useful data for certain kinds of uh, research. Um, and then there's uh, similar kinds of data available for demographers, for um, healthcare, et cetera. Um, so I'm not going to go through the data sets, but um, they're re relatively easy to find a list of which data sets are available and kind of the variables that they contain. Actually, I should say the <laughs> one of the interesting things about the census is what's available publicly and what's not. So actually, I think the variable names actually are not disclosable. So one of the funny things about writing a proposal is you have to say what data you want to use without actually having the list of the variables that are available. And the way you kind of get over that hurdle is you work closely with the administrator of an RDC who kind of coaches you along about the data that might be available. Um, so for example, if you click on one of these data sets, it wouldn't tell you all the variables in there. It would kind of give an overview of what information is contained in that data set. Um, so that's what an RDC is. How did Yale get an RDC? Uh, so right, the green dots on this map here are uh, the locations of all of the current RDCs. Census began, uh, originally there was just one RDC. It was at Census uh, around the time that I was on the job market in 1999. That was the only place pretty much you could access these data. Um, since then, uh, census has been building out this network. You can see it kind of roughly corresponds to concentrations of academics around the country. Um, and Census is interested in building out this network even more. Um, uh, and an RDC is a main uh, kind of uh, uh, center for accessing the data. Census, as part of its model of expansion, has also been allowing uh, branches to be established under an existing RDC. Yale has been a member since 2006 of the consortium that founded the New York Research Data Center. Uh, Princeton's in that, Columbia's in that, the Fed is in that. Um, that's located in Baruch College. Uh, so currently, I go down to New York once a week to use the data there. Um, uh, we applied uh, successfully to become a branch of the New York RDC in New Haven. There's another branch of the New York RDC in Cornell. Um, and uh, with generous funding from Kohl's, we're going to have this branch RDC show up on Hill House in one of the econ department buildings. Um, it's, if you, if you, uh, the cost is about $200,000 to set up this branch. That's mostly due to um, the costs within Yale of making the space secure. Um, and then about 50,000 chunk of it is IT equipment that we get from Yale. Servers, that, I mean, uh, dumb terminals that kind of point back to um, Washington. Um, the floor plan, uh, I'm not sure how interested you are in the floor plan, but the thing is the center looks like this. The top of it is an, an office for the administrator that has to oversee the branch, and then that bigger room is a space with six terminals. Um, six terminals, depending on whether you've done stuff like this before, may seem like a lot or a little. Uh, the New York office has uh, eight terminals, and I go down there. I've almost never seen it full. We're hoping that six will be a pretty good number, um, but we'll see how that goes. Um, the key thing to realize, if you don't really know it, is that since Yale is a member of an RDC consortium, anyone at Yale actually can access the data uh, for free, uh, given that we're already paying the dues for that. And that'll be true for the branch as well. So really the only cost for the user is to kind of get a proposal approved by the Census Bureau. 
Um, by the way, I wanted to put this slide in. We need an administrator. Um, and so if you have any ideas uh, uh, around the room, please let me know or Sandra Greer know. Uh, our administrator, the, the administrator of a typical RDC is a relatively senior fellow. Usually it's a PhD. The one in New York is a PhD in economics, for example. Um, we only need a junior administrator, someone working 20 hours a week. Um, the hitch is that uh, that person who is the administrator has to be an a census employee. They, they're not going to be a Yale employee. And so the way this works is we're looking around campus for someone that might be interested in this job. Uh, it's 20 hours a week. It's very flexible. Most of the time you don't have to do much. Um, uh, um, and the way it'll work is we'll identify a candidate hopefully within the next month or two. And then we specify the parameters of that individual and give those parameters to census. And then census hires that person after a search for that individual. Um, uh, and then that person becomes a regular census employee and is on an employee track uh, within census. Um, so any ideas would be very welcome. Um, so that was my little pitch for an um, administrator. OK, uh, now you know what an RDC is. How can you get access to an RDC? Um, as I said, these are proprietary data. They're governed by a whole host of laws, which if you get access, you have to learn about the laws and all the ways you can be punished by violating them. Um, so I won't bore you with all those details, but it's, it's restricted by law. And one of the things that you may not be that familiar with, but which is an integral part of getting access to census data, is your, your research proposal not only has to have the usual intellectual merit, the census propo the proposed research also has to have a benefit for census. And the reason for that is, by law, census can only kind of provide access to these data if they're in a part of an effort to improve the quality of the data at census. And so when one writes an a proposal for research at the Census Bureau, a big part of what you write, in your, well, a big in terms of um, importance, not so big in terms of words, uh, part of the proposal that you write is how you're going to benefit the Census Bureau. Um, and they have these great quotes on their website about this. Uh, and they're, they're quite, I mean, listening to the presentations today, um, they, they should sound very familiar. Uh, you know, Census collects all of this information, and one of the best ways to figure out if the information is correct and makes sense um, is to give it to users and see what they find. And uh, if you have proposed research, you'll be using the data uh, and in part checking the quality of the data because of all the things that you're looking for. Um, and so they take that, um, that's taken pretty seriously. Um, and I should say it's not that hard to uh, come up with ways to um, improve uh, census's data to put into proposal. And again, when one develops a proposal in conjunction with the administrator of an RDC, uh, they guide you along in terms of how to word this. Um, okay. And then, uh, then there's the normal, the rest of the bullet points there are the normal uh, criteria. Another consideration uh, is the, again, I said the major cost of getting involved with census data is actually getting the access. And this varies. The time it takes from kind of deciding you want to start working on a proposal uh, to getting the proposal approved and then getting your security clearance for using the data, which isn't that onerous but is a step. Um, it takes about a year. That, that can sometimes get longer. That sometimes gets shorter depending upon staffing and how things are going in DC and whether there's a budget crisis, et cetera. Um, but think about a year, uh, half a year to a year to get access. Um, if you want more information, I put these up. Uh, if you want more information, you just Google Center for Economic Studies Census Bureau and you'll get all these websites. Um, they'll describe all of these data sets. Okay, that's mostly what I was going to go through. Uh, I have appendix slides if you want to know more, but I figured I would leave that for questions either in this forum or you can come up afterwards or send me an email or something and I'm happy to uh, give you more info. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, excuse me. Do you provide access to high-performance computing form of Yale at the same time on the same stations to use? I mean, for analytics to uh, run application to execute on different yes. analytics. Do you have? Do you provide uh, access to high-performance computing on the same stations in order not to copy data or s such a thing? So uh, all of the IT infrastructure is provided at Census. And uh, so they have uh, the server network and all the software that is most often used, you know, Stata, MATLAB, whatever. 
Um, I wouldn't characterize it as a high-speed computing network, and there's no way to kind of take the data from where they are. So, it, you, you know, you're kind of using the, the IT infrastructure that they have, and you're actually using it on the networks that are holding the copies so of the data. So what sort of, uh, you know, high-performance computing farm do they provide? Uh, the Census Bureau, I mean. Yeah, I, I'm not sure about the technical details. It's kind of, I think, a standard Unix type setup. It's not one that's hyper, you know, like the high-speed clusters that we, I think yeah, because it's not like that. Data without analysis ability. I mean, they could always add that. I think if there were enough demand to, to, to do that, they would add it. Um, right now, it seems to be pretty adequate. I mean, given the, I've been doing research there for like 10 years, it seems pretty adequate for the, the demands that I've had. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Follow-up question: <laughs> How big is this data? Oh, um, uh, okay. So there are five, I, I can tell you about data sets. I know the, there are five and a half million private establishments in the United States. Um, so one of the data one of the data sets, the LBD, which tracks all private establishments in the United States, has about five million observations. You know, and then a whole bunch of fields for that observation across years go back to 1977. So data sets range. The data sets I work with about a gigabyte or so when you put things together. Um, no problem kind of manipulating those data sets. I think uh, you can't always do that, for example, in one statistical package, but you could always move to SAS or something if it gets onerous. So is uh, that kind of... Excuse me, yeah. again, a follow-up. So um, you mentioned that yeah, yeah, they provide this AHRQ data, which is HCOP data for uh, probably all of these states. Yeah. And just for one state, California, HCOP data that I'm working with, yeah, one of the three databases, it gets like uh, seven gigabytes for just four, four years, five yeah. years. So for the entire United States, it should be like more than 100 gigabytes or 300 gigabytes. I, I don't know. but So I've, pe I've seen people running jobs where they've, for example, you, to the extent that I can see the memory being pulled, it's like 150, 200 gigabytes that they're using uh, for those projects. They run those projects. I'm still doing my project, which is smaller, and it seems to work relatively I fine. I mean, I've never used that stuff, so maybe those, you know, there are researchers at Yale who are using those data set, I think, in public health. I'm not sure where you are. And so they might know better, for example, what, the, what that experience is like when they put all those things in one file or try to manipulate them. So we are in our uh, Center for Outcome Research and Evaluation, and we obtain data by uh, directly from uh, a HRQ hmm. organization. Uh, so I don't know much about the medical data, but I, uh, I mean, so I don't, I can't characterize what's there, and I can't characterize the user experience. Okay. But um, I could find out more, or point you to where to find out more if you need to. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Um, I have a quick question about the restricted data and what you can uh, what you can do with it, if anything, outside the terminals that you were talking about. So, does all the analysis happen at the terminals, or is there a certain point in the process of analyzing the data where it is anonymized enough that you can, you know, take it on a flash drive and do your own work with it? Um, so, the way it works is anything that they figured out how to anonymize, they usually make into some kind of public use data set. Um, the way it works is all your analysis, uh, which is not anonymized, you can work with at the census. And then you have to, um, any results of that analysis that you want to take out, but not the data, you can't take the data out, have to pass disclosure. The rules for disclosure themselves are not disclosable. So, um, <laughs> but I, to give you a sense of, you know, if I run regressions of how firms have reacted to something, I, you basically have to not be able to in any way identify a single firm. So if you're doing the kind of high-level stuff that I do, it's never really an issue. The, the users that run into issues are if you want to kind of summarize things happening at the census block level or something where there might be like a few people living there, that's an issue. So the basic rule is you do your analysis there and then you present results in an aggregate enough way that you can pass disclosure. So regressions and regression coefficients are usually fine. That goes, you hand those in along with the disclosure report and any analysis of why it doesn't violate disclosure. It goes to a disclosure review board they bless it or they don't. If they bless it, they send you the stuff. And then th think of that as getting a bunch of regression tables in the mail, like in Excel or something like that, in the email. Okay. Great, thanks. Hi. 
Hi, so Leandros, I have a question for you about, uh, so you're in the Department of Electrical Engineering, but you're a YINS affiliate. And what we understand YINS is doing, what we've heard presentations last year at the Day of Data was a lot about human social networks. So how do the sensor networks that you're talking about sort of relate to that? Is it really transferable? Like the network of a sensor is the same as the network of a person. Or are you going to be working more on human social networks too? So what are you going to do at YINS? Uh, well, um, I think it, it happens in many levels. First, uh, at uh, the abstract levels, so the, the models, uh, the network models for um, the interaction of humans in social networks and uh, the network models for interaction, let's say, of wireless devices have um, a lot of common aspects. Um, for instance, the questions of how they scale and uh, what are uh, the attributes that affect uh, the scaling uh, are uh, answered by the same uh, mathematics, essentially. So the, the abstract models are uh, similar. Uh, the other is that um, there is uh, a lot of interaction between the two uh, in uh, uh, the real world as well. For instance, um, a uh, current trend in wireless networks that is uh, cognitive uh, radio, as it is called, which is uh, which tries to find very uh, effective ways for using uh, the radio spectrum, uh, taking into consideration interdependencies between the different devices, uh, can uh, exploit uh, a lot of input that is generated from the social network, that is. Uh, relationships of uh, people as uh, they uh, can be deduced from the social network, they, uh, they can provide uh, uh, information on uh, how likely it is uh, one uh, to try to access uh, the radio spectrum at the same time with somebody else. And this is information that is uh, very useful for uh, the design of uh, the radio access protocol itself. So this is just uh, two examples of uh, how the two are um, related. And uh, not only those two, uh, for instance, the presentation we have seen earlier by Mark Gerstein uh, pointed to, uh, to some other uh, attributes uh, which uh, relate uh, the networks that uh, appear in the genomic, uh, in the, um, genomes with uh, the network the networking structures that uh, capture either the social networks or uh, the communication networks so uh, I think that's a main idea for the creation of the Institute is uh, to focus on these commonalities and uh, take advantage of those to progress uh, all these different fields Okay, if there are no more questions, there is a snack break. So if you were looking for snacks earlier, they are now in the hallway. And we will reconvene promptly at 4.05. Thank you uh, to Professor Schott and Tessulis, who gave our last session. And at 4.05, we'll be back with Kathy O'Neill for our final keynote. Thank you.
Um, I will be introducing our uh, second keynoter, Kathy O'Neill. Um, before I do, I do want to remind everyone that there are evaluation forms on the tables. Please fill those out and you can drop them off at the box on the way out. Um, Kathy O'Neill is director of the LEAD program in data practices at Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism, and she is employed as data science consultant at Johnson's, Johnson Research Labs. She attended UC Berkeley as an undergraduate, earned a PhD in mathematics from Harvard, and afterward held positions in mathematics departments of MIT and Barnard College, doing research in arithmetic, algebraic, geometry. Yes. She's co-author of the book that was mentioned today already, Doing Data Science, Straight Talk from the Frontline. And also very importantly, she's author of one of my personal favorite blogs, mathbabe.org. And if you don't look at it, you should. And here's Kathy, thanks. Thank you. Oh my god. I don't know about you people, but I hate this room because I can't see people around here. And I mean, and I, I love the uh, organizers, don't get me wrong, but the room isn't very good for interaction. I'm a very interactive person, so please feel free to come sit at this chair over here or close by or, or motion to me because I don't like speaking by myself over here. I'm feeling lonely already. Don't make me cry. Okay, so I worked in arithmetic algebraic geometry. That was really pure mathematics. And then in 2006, for some ridiculous reason, which I might go into, and you can ask me to go into, I decided to become a quant at a hedge fund exactly right before the credit crisis. Um, so I entered and got a front row seat at the dysfunction that was our financial system from 2007 to 2011. Um, and then I left in disgust. But I, by the way, just want to say I loved the data. Oh my God, I fell in love with data. It was very sexy. I loved the analysis. I loved feeling like I was learning stuff. I did love other aspects of finance. I'll bring, it, bring them up a little bit later because I do think we have lessons to learn from finance. Um, another thing I want to mention is that I think data science Big data, we've all complained about the rhetoric around that, and I'll, I'll, do, I'll do the same. Um, kind of started in finance, not really, it started in a lot of different places, but um, when people talk about big data and data science, I think, well, finance was the first data science. And other people might say, no, astrophysics was the first data science, and I would say, well, you know, a lot of astrophysicists became quants on hedge, uh, at, you know, hedge funds on Wall Street. There was basically no data science there was no analysis really of data on Wall Street until like the Black Shoals and stuff in like the 70s and the 80s and the bond market. So, and then all these scientists came to, to, to um, Wall Street and they started trying out different things from their different fields. And so it was like the first, I guess what I'm saying is the first interdisciplinary data-oriented science happened on, on Wall Street. Um, so that's one of the reasons I'm gonna say we can learn lessons from finance because that failed spectacularly in certain ways. In other ways, it didn't. So after that, I left. I went to, I decided to like do something good for the world, so I went and worked as a data scientist. It took as much work as rewriting the, my title on my resume to get a job in an um, in advertising startup tech company in New York City where I was analyzing um, the propensity to click on ads for people who you know, had Macs versus PCs. And by the way, people who have Macs have more money. Did anyone know that? Um, so after a few months of working in data science, I was like, holy crap, this stuff is really interesting and also kind of alarming in, in various ways. So I got kind of into thinking about it in a meta way rather than just doing my job. I wanted to think like, what is this? Is this a thing? To what extent is it a thing? Can we define it? That's where I wrote that book, Doing Data Science. It was an effort to try to describe the thing that is data science and whether it deserves its own field. Um, my conclusion is that it does, um, but we can argue about that. Um, and then I started also being kind of just like a, a skeptic, a data skeptic, which is actually a hard, a hard road to, to walk down if you work in New York City around a lots, lots and lots and lots of um, venture capital funding. Um, so we'll talk about that a little bit, but just to, to make the point that um, there's, there's a lot of Kool-Aid being drunk around there. So 
guess who likes skeptics? Journalists. Journalists are actually kind of awesome in that way. They might actually go overboard and like negative news more than they should. But one thing that was cool about recently being hired by the Journalism School at Columbia to start a data journalism program is that they were like totally embracing my skepticism for the first time. So that was kind of nice. So that was what I did this summer. I was the program director for a data journalism program that turned journalists into data journalists. That was the uh, attempt anyway. And I think we um, did a pretty good job. We had some amazing projects. We taught them Python. We taught them how to do data scraping. We taught them how to manipulate data. We taught them how to use algorithms. We did everything on the EC2 Amazon cloud. Um, we had instances out there. We made them bigger when we had bigger data. Um, so the way I tell my husband the, the summer went was the first half of the summer, we, we, we taught them to think of themselves as gods because they came in thinking that anyone who could do data analysis was a god. And the second half of the summer, we taught them that they weren't gods because the second half of the summer, we f focused instead on skills, we focused on other kinds of literacy. So I think of this functional literacy as like skills like can you do Python? Can you write a code? Will it work? Will you get an answer? Can you clean code? Can you put things in pandas data frames? The second half of the summer we thought about, well, what else could you have done? And how would that have changed the result? And we talked about to what extent are the default settings on Excel forcing you to think in a certain way? That was, um, it was a really great, experience and I was um, happy to sort of not only teach a group of, of young bright-eyed bushy-tailed journalists how to how to do stuff but how to think about stuff and so that's one of the reasons I'm here because I think that's an important part so I was asked to come pitch a Yale um, data science Institute that's what I'm gonna do and I'm also gonna actually tell I'm first gonna tell you why I think you should have one although you already might know, but I'm gonna tell you why I think you should have one, and I'm gonna be very passionate about it because that's what I do. And then I'm gonna tell you like the ticky-tack details of stuff because I interviewed a couple people over at IDSI, at Columbia Institute for Data Science and Engineering, which has had ups and downs. It was announced to exist by Bloomberg, I wanna say three years ago, but it's something like two years ago, and it's, it's taken a while, and we'll, we'll talk about why that happened. So, why? Okay, here's the thing. When I went into um, the hedge fund, it was like really, really intense and proprietary, and I wasn't allowed to talk to anyone, including my own office mate, about what I was working on. I was working with Larry Summers on some, some project. I'll tell you guys now, but not after the talk. Um, just kidding. Uh, but we had, one thing we did have in our group, which was the futures group, was like this kind of, weekly seminar on on ways of thinking about modeling um, run by my boss Steve Strong who is really really a very good modeler and he was a Bayesian so we talked about um, prior beliefs and what were our priors and just like the young woman who talked about the um, epi score or epo score or whatever it was um, she talked about downweighting data that you are less certain of we did that we also downweighted data that was old. Um, that the, the extent to which we downweighted data on you know, what was the half-life of a, of a piece of data, like if it's a week old, is it old news, or d it, does it depend on the market? Is it different in bonds than it is in commodities? So that kind of thing. That's the kind of conversation we'd have. And we called that lambda often. When we were downweighting old data, we had this kind of we're, we didn't even take averages of things. We took um, you know, averages weighted by the, the sort of downweighting lambda variable. So that was called our, you know, lambda, and it was considered our belief in how much we lost interest in, in the data as it got older, as it became less certain. This is called a prior. This is called, I actually should have said, the, I should have said the overburdened lambda, because what I'm going to do here is I'm gonna demonstrate that I then went into data science and I found two other ways of imagining the same parameter called lambda in a totally different context, but it was exactly the same thing. It was lambda. It was even called lambda. So there, there was some kind of like magical undercurrent of understanding that this is all the same thing. But I found in machine learning that people did 
I think it was called ridge regression. And then there was another, maybe a different part of computer science that they did, they did L2 regression. Okay, those both had lambdas. And I don't remember which one is which. Um, but they were, they were two different names for the same thing. And it, was, it, it ended up being in exactly the same usage as I, I would have used my belief lambda in a, in a regression, in just a simple multivariate regression. But it was thought of in a totally different way. So, so it was thought of, for the most part, so I'm gonna skip ahead in, in one for one slide for a moment and thought that you would use it as a, a insurance that your algorithm would converge. So you had some kind of, you had some kind of, I think of it geometrically because I'm, I'm a geometer, but you have some kind of space and you're using some kind of Newton algorithm to try to find some minimum and you're like, you know you're gonna find the minimum, but is it a global minimum or is it a local minimum? And you're like, well, if you tune lambda, if lambda's high enough, then it's forced to be convex and then it's a global minimum. So whatever I just said, I, what I mean to say is, lambda was used, the same lambda, used as a way of ensuring that your algorithm would finish. It's called a convergence insurance, I call it. Then, at the, it, the, some of the same people would turn around and they would say, well, that's, that's how we know we have convergence, but actually we use lambda to tune, our, to optimize our algorithm. So we, we sort of test our algorithm for different lambdas and we see which one gives us the most accurate result, and that's our lambda. So it's actually a hyperparameter that people use to tune their algorithms to optimize it for their results. Does that make sense? Same lambda. Now, I just wanna make the point that this lambda, which was being tuned to optimize your results, was definitely not the same lambda we used at least in theory, to sort of state our belief. Because you, you know, when you state your belief, you're not supposed to tune it afterwards. Um, so I thought that was pretty interesting. Because I'm like, well, this is, it's always called lambda, but it's, it's really literally meaning three different things to three different fields coming into this, into this mishmash of space called data science. And I think we can learn from each other. So another example I came to, and I call these technical overlaps. This is the last one I'm, I'm sure of. It's a technical overlap, and it's an interesting one, and it's overburdening one poor little um, Greek letter. Um, but the second one, I'm not really sure of, but it's so fascinating to me. I was doing um, a talk. I went to Berkeley to give a talk, a math colloquium, and I, I gave a talk about recommendation engines because they were like, well, can you talk about something from data science because everyone in math wants to learn data science. So I was like, okay, I'll talk about recommendation engines. And one of the things I wrote about in my book is, I don't know if you guys heard the, about hunch.com. It's kind of a fun story. You go to hunch.com and, and, and you get asked 20 yes or no questions. And at the end of 20 questions, they know everything about you. And it's like really, really depressing because it means we only have 20 dimensions of interestingness like, you know, basically, chick flick or dick flick. You know, like, basically, that's with the first one. Are you a man or a woman? That, and then it gets, like, less interesting from there. But then, but then that defines you pretty much, pretty much accurately. After that, they tell you what kind of iPad you want or whatever. They tell you what phone you want, and, you, and they're right. It's really frustrating. So that's a recommendation engine um, that I learned about using alternating least squares. It's called the latent factor model. And then I was like looking around for other recommendation engines to show the mathematicians in Berkeley. And someone from Spotify, who's a friend of mine, um, told me, oh, you should use the ones we use. They come from this paper um, from Google, that Google News, if you guys know what Google News is. Um, <coughs> everyone knows what Google News is, but I don't think anybody uses it anymore. But anyway, so they actually used, there's, two, there's a couple, it's a really great paper actually, beautiful. But one of the things they use is a latent topic model. The other thing is a co-visitation model, which is also very sexy as a model, uses min hash. Um, but anyway, going back to the latent topic model, um, that, so the latent factor model, well, let me start at the latent factor. The first one requires you understand um, the sort of eigenvalues, eigenspaces of, of matrices. You sort of, you rank, you sort of sort the eigenvalues in, in terms of size and you take the biggest ones, and those are the most important ones in terms of your variance. And so it basically depends on a factorization of matrices. So, but then at the end of the day, you choose a number 
of um, a number of dimensions that you actually give a shit about. And if you're hunch.com, it's 20. And th then you're like, I give a shit about 20 things and then I can infer the rest. Okay, so the first 20 dimensions of human nature are important than everything else is trivial. It's just idiosyncratic, I should say. Um, then, okay, so then I looked into this paper and I thought I understood the latent factor model pretty well. I looked into this paper, I found the latent topic model, which was, it had some technical name, PLSI, which you can look up. And it was based on a statistical model with various assumptions about um, distributions and stuff. But at the end of the day, you chose 20, uh, you chose a number, could be 20, and then you did, and then you had the same number of variables as you had in the latent factor model. You, I could even tell you how many variables, like basically two very elongated rectangular matrices of size 20 and the number of people involved, or 20 and the number of items involved. So in the case of Spotify, you're, the items are songs and the people are people. And in the latent topic model, the items are news articles that you may not have read, you may have read, and the people are people. So you have these two really long matrices and this ch the choice of 20. And then you have some arithmetic to update this when you get new data. So in, in like the, they were presented in very different ways. They, they were optimizing to very different looking things. One of them was multiplicative, one of them was additive. But at the end of the day, I was like, you know what? I think these are the same algorithm. I just think that if you, if you make specific choices for um, for this distribution, like Gaussian or whatever, I think this will come down to the very same algorithm. And when I gave this talk in Berkeley, I just asked the audience, is this the same algorithm or not? And some guy who's a fifth year graduate student in statistics is like, yeah, that's the same algorithm. And he gave me a reference, but I couldn't understand it. So I'm not really sure it's true, but here's my point. My point is it's probably true, or if it's not exactly the same algorithm, it's really close and it's coming from machine learning on the latent factor model, or even mathematics, I'm not exactly sure, versus statistics, pure up, up and straight, straight up statistics. And it's like, we should know this. We have these really large companies depending on these algorithms that are essentially the same thing, or, um, or, or if they're not, it's an interesting fact that we should be talking about, which no one is talking about. Okay, so I'm guess I'm, what I'm saying is that there is technical overlap in at least in industry, and I'm sure in academics as well, that uses different language, that uses different, even different assumptions, but but they're the same technical thing. And the fact that they came, they were, they people came upon them in totally different ways, is what makes them interesting. Okay, now I'm going to tell you why we could never do this. We can never. It's like get scared. Okay, it's never going to happen. I'll explain why. So I spent, as I told you, the summer working in journalism uh, at the journalism school, and I was doing like a data journalism program for journalists, and I was constantly talking to the computer science department because many of my students are now taking computer science classes. And basically, and I'm not gonna, this is an exaggeration, and I apologize to anyone who gets offended by this, but everyone in journalism hated me, and everyone in the computer science department hated me. And I'm cool with that because I've got a thick skin, but there is a clash of cultures, and it's real. So let me explain what I mean. Journalism, and I'm just, I'm gonna, it's cartoonish what I'm saying, okay? But just, just there's an element of truth to what I'm about to say. And I'm, again, not saying it to offend, I'm saying it to clarify. But journalists care about the human story, human face on the story. What is, who is that person that, who's the victim? If it's, there's no victim, there's no story. And that's not always true, but in traditional journalism, it often is true. They think of the data person, generally speaking, as a service person, somebody who like does the infographic and like gets paid by the hour. <laughs> in computer science, you have the complementary blind spot, where you have people who are focused on fast, um, efficient algorithms, large scale, um, you have, it's very macho. Um, you have to really understand like, you know, web protocols to even get coffee in the lounge. <laughs> um, and they're just like, why? Human messy stories, individual stories, why? Who cares? Not relevant. So I, I, what I'm saying is like to try to 
to try to bring together even those two departments for the sake of this e emerging field of data journalism, it's not easy. But at the same time, well, so this is my obstacle slide, so I don't have to, I don't have to give you the good news yet. Um, let me give you another example, though. And this goes to um, a, a woman named Noemi Eladad, who's in bioinformatics at Columbia and is also heading the um, health center at the um, Institute for Data Science and Engineering at Columbia. So I interviewed her because now I have journalistic approaches to everything, which is fun. Um, so I interviewed her this week about this talk. And I said, so how's it going? Uh, it's he's three years old. How are things? And she was like, well, things are looking up. But at the beginning, it was really hard because there was this culture clash between bioinformatics and computer science. And I was like, well, tell me about it. And I don't want to make the inf CS guys bad guys, by the way. I love computer scientists. My parents are both computer scientists. But she was basically said a similar kind of thing. Um, she said, you know, the computer scientists are like, well, you know, th at the beginning, not anymore, at the beginning, the computer scientist approach was we don't need to know the health stuff, the medicine. We know how to mine data. Just give us the data. Stop talking to us. Just give it to us. We will do it. And we will solve medicine. <laughs> And then the people um, in medicine were like, these guys don't know anything about the context. They don't understand missing values. They don't understand the bias. Um, they don't understand the difference between this population and that population. And I already know how to do my analysis. Leave me alone. So we have the same kind of complementary blind spot in the cultures um, and cul complementary values. So. It's a real thing, and that's within academia. So if, if you wanted, and I, I don't want to just have a data science institute at Yale for just academics. Like Theoretically, ideally, it would include people from industry, and it would include people from government who are doing civic data stuff and with open data and all that stuff. And we've heard that from them today as well. And we have that same problem there, is that you have this complete, you have the blind spots, um, and you, you value different things. Um, and and I don't I don't mean like I get paid for this I don't get paid for that I that's the next slide <laughs> this slide I mean you actually dismiss the other person's expertise so part of a data science institute is creating a community where you talk enough about what your actual actual problems of your analysis are until you have respect for that person's expertise because it is a question of respect. Um, and by the way, just to give away um, the ending of that story with Noemi, she told me that in the last year and a half, um, people have been writing large grants together from the medical school and the engineering school, and that through the grant writing process, and sometimes they got the grant, sometimes they didn't, but when they got the grants, especially starting to actually work together on these large-scale projects have given them an immense amount of mutual respect. So those initial problems are fading away, so they can be overcome. However, I'm gonna, I, that doesn't keep me from having a second slide of, of obstacles. And by the way, again, raise your hands if you disagree with me or want to add something, because I like interaction. Um, I just want to make the point that I've been an academic, so I know what the problem, the actual limitations of an everyday life as an academic are, and that you're, you're incentivized to think on a daily, a daily basis of publishing papers, um, and getting funded, whereas if you're a policymaker, you want to, or yeah, somebody in government, you're you're actually trying to affect policy. So I worked to the um, I worked to the mayor's office under Bloomberg for six months in health and human services, working with um, homeless data. So I can talk about that, but like it's a very different approach to what you decide to talk about, um, or what you avoid talking about. I think is a better way of approaching that. Um, to when you're in, a, in when you're working in proprietary startup land, which I did um, for a few years, sometimes it's a marketing technique. You do it, sometimes you are literally just the quant in the corner, as you know. Hey, we got quants; they're PhDs right there. Um, sometimes, so sometimes you just have to exist, and that's 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 not really data science. But other times, when you do, do actual data science, what leaks out is um, is more about PR than than, than really about science. Um, and sometimes you, you actually are trying to inform the public, and we saw an example of that, again, with the environmental score, which was great. But I just want to make the point that all the people that I wish would come and be part of the Data Science Institute at Yale, or whatever you call it, um, they all have different metrics of success. 
So it's it, it would you'd have to find a way through you know however it gets funded or however people get brownie points or however people get what they want. You have to figure out a way for everyone to have a reason to be there. And and of course part of it would be that they they learn how to uh, do better science. So here's the thing. The really urgent reason we need this is because there is no, nobody doing it quite like you could do it here. You guys have Yale Law School, which is an incredible place. Um, they already have something called the Internet and Society Center. Um, so they're already talking about ethics and standards um, for, da for, for doing data in, in industry, but it could be a wider discussion as well. We have an incredible amount of complexity going on. It's, it's almost impossible for non-data experts to understand what's actually happening in Google or Facebook, um, and it affects policy. So I went, to, um, a, I went to a House subcommittee meeting on big data and analytics about a year ago, and I was really unimpressed with um, the people that were talking there and their, their approach to explaining how big data was important and how everybody doesn't mind their privacy violations. And it was staffed by the head of research at IBM um, and other um, industry representatives. So it was, it's just a lopsided discussion here. I'm not saying those people don't deserve to talk. I'm just saying that what the policymakers are hearing is incredibly biased towards commercial interests. And that doesn't have to be true. Um, I'll just say that again. <laughs> Commercial interests. This man said that privacy is dead, and like he shouldn't have the last word on that. He has too much money coming in to think otherwise. So we should have some people thinking about data in a critical way that don't get rich off of it. Don't get rich off of um, uh, obscuring what's actually going on. I also wanted to, if I'm not radical enough yet, let me just say, um, I really think we could take some lessons from the financial crisis. The way I look at the financial crisis, as I said, the finance was, the, was big data, was data science before, um, before data science was a term. And one of the things they made up, uh, there's a lot of ways you can think about the financial crisis, but one way you can think about it is that it was a siloed mistake, that we had different characters who were aware or semi-aware of bad things happening in the mortgage market. But we, in particular, well, but not nobody was aware of everything. That's one of the problems, unless, unless there were people who were aware of everything, in, in, case, in which case, fuck those people. But most people were just aware that what they were doing locally was kind of sketchy, but they were making a lot of money off of it. And they didn't, they didn't think, they didn't have to think um, in a lo more global sense. So it was a question of siloed information, and in particular, and the most massive silo was between finance, Wall Street and the regulators. And that's a mistake, I think, that cost the, 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 the people of this, the taxpayers, the, the people who lost their homes, et cetera, that was, a, a, that was the repercussions for that. So I guess what I'm saying is I think what we can do when it comes to big data, data science, is we can make better science, but we can also make sure that we are not like screwing the average person with the big data models that we already have by keeping in touch with who's actually working on the data and keeping in touch with regulators and policymakers about what that actually looks like and what the real risks are. And I have seen progress on this front. One of the most um, impressive things I've seen lately is Obama's big data report um, with Podesta, who went around the country and talked to people about various civil rights um, violations that are potentially happening with big data. So uh, great to see that, but it's like just one report, and we should have an institute devoted to that. Or not only to that, but that should be one of the things that, so where is that conversation gonna happen? I mean, that's another way of looking at it. It's not gonna happen at Facebook. Facebook is spending millions of dollars lobbying against the European privacy laws. It's not gonna happen it's gonna happen in an institution, but it has to be an institution that has enough actual information about the way data is used that they can have an informed discussion. So I, I feel like a, an institute, maybe in a, a center in the law center, but maybe here, um, I mean, maybe at the Yale Data Insti um, Institute could 
invite policymakers. Well, I'll get I'll get to that in a second. So, what would a data science institute look like? So, what are the I, I'm I'm kind of a party planner, so the first thing I think about is parties with um, wine, but we could have a colloquium first. Um, <laughs> it has to be a community, is what I'm saying. You, it's it, the way you get people to figure out. I use lambda for tuning parameter. Oh, I use a lambda for that. You know, the way you do that is you get people to talk to each other, and the way you get people to talk to each other is you you get them together in the same physical location and you talk about your research. Um, and you also you also share food and wine, and you promote cross disciplinary research with um, support um, from grants. Um, from you know we we've seen today a lot of a lot of potential re, um, support for this kind of thing. So that's awesome. You need a place a space to work in. So the Columbia um, IDC has like they're building out space in the northwest corner of the of campus. Um, t right now, they don't have space, so it's not absolutely critical if, as long as you get to like rent rooms and stuff at, in, on your campus. Theoretically, ideally, you'd have conferences devoted to this stuff, um, you know, with really good speakers that know how to cross disciplinary lines and know how to like think a little bit higher level about what works and what doesn't work in their field, like a, a kind of a what are those words, the survey papers, but survey survey talks, I would love to see that, about data, like um, data management and data analytics in a given field. And again, I think workshops for policymakers, because the policymakers are not actually bad people, they're just really busy and don't have any details at all. So the lobbyists tell them what to think, because that's what lobbyists do, but lobbyists are, you should think about it this way, lobbyists are performing a function that other people could perform, which is giving them information that they want to hear. They love to hear information from people who are academic and trustworthy. <clears throat> or they might not come themselves, but they'll send their aides, and, and congressmen's aides are really smart. Um, I think there's a huge need for educational initiatives, which a data science institute would provide that would be probably the easiest thing to set up actually is setting up you know masters and phd programs um, at least the very the first semester you could you could hire some people to teach graduate classes i actually think that um, this concept of numerical and computational literacy should be at the core of the curriculum and for undergraduates the stuff i did with my journalism students this summer i could have done with freshmen at college and it would have helped them it would have helped them in a lot of ways so I don't see why 18-year-olds aren't doing that, and I don't see why Data Science Institute wouldn't um, wouldn't take the initiative on that, and it would be a really popular popular class, I would expect. I also think that, you know, I, I, you heard me talk about this um, interaction with the public. The public is at uh, is a stakeholder here, and I think the stake the the some of the public really wants to understand this stuff, and where are they going to go for that? So it's not just about your, the undergraduates, although I know this is a very undergraduate-focused campus, um, which is great. I also think that the general public should we should have like um, information for the general public on how, you know, what is it, you know, what does Facebook actually know about you, and what are they allowed to do with that? That something you could Google for, but it would be a lot more um, interesting and effective if we had like really good speakers explaining that. I think the, um, a data science institute would ideally provide resources to ac the academic researchers, so this would be another reason for them to want to be part of it. Computing infrastructure, we talked a lot about today. Um, we have basically ad hoc solutions to computing problems in every department, if not every research lab, and the question of how to think about that in a more holistic sense and like how to solve that problem, um, probably save money overall. I don't know how the, the actual funding would work with that. <coughs> you need a few staff to organize the colloquium and the wine. Um, I said you need space, you need money. I mean, ideally you'd have, so um, Columbia started out with $50 million, um, although that was all fake in various ways. Um, I think in, in the following sense that um, they, they didn't actually get any money from Bloomberg, they just got like a decrease on their sewer taxes 
for like 15 years until it was worth $50 million or something. Um, so it, it's kind of a weird situation. But I, the, the point is that you can hire people for the institute. Um, and you could do it one of two ways. You could hire people for the institute, like you could hire a person be part of our institute, or you could hire someone in electrical engineering or in computer science or in um, biometric, uh, bioinformatic research, and then it'd be joint with the institute. That's the model they use at Columbia. And then just for people who are interested, I also found out that they, when they have grants coming in, some percentage of it gets siphoned off into the um, institute. So that's how, it's all about the money, I know that. Um, also, the way they do it in at, um, at ITSE is they have um, outside partners, so they, they have like partnerships contracts that they've now, they've now um, firmed up, where they have like certain things they offer, larger companies like IBM or GE or Accenture, and they have different kinds of contracts for startups, because startups want different things than big companies do. And they also offer different things. So big companies offer money. They want things like expertise in a certain general area and education in that area. So they might send some people from IBM to Columbia to learn about this kind of field. Um, and startups um, want to take students to get um, internships. And they want to be able to call someone up and ask them a very specific machine learning question, which is a very different kind of ask. Anyway, so but. Establishing those kinds of partners would be an important part of an um, institute for data science. Um, and you know, it's a different ecosystem in New Haven than it is in New York City, I realize that. But I, I think there are partners. It just might be more on the side of policy or a different, a different um, industry than, than exactly the same thing in, in New York. So this is where I get to the part where I don't really have opinions, but I do think these are important questions to ask. Um, so how would you actually set this up? Like, who would it even be included in this? I mean, from my experience in journalism and um, data science and mathematics, I, I, I'm getting more and more to the point where I think a broad definition is good. Like, you do want people from all sorts of departments that are interested in this. Now, at the same time, you probably don't want to just get everyone in the room and say, hey, what do we do? You want to have, like, some projects in mind or you might have themes, you might have like, for these two years, here's what we're gonna do. Like here's an idea, for, for three years we're gonna focus on people who actually analyze the data and how do we analyze the data, how do we collect our data and how do we manage our data. And then the next three years, like we can talk with people who don't analyze the data but we, they do interact with the results of our analysis. Like not, not the medical researchers but the doctors who use the results of our analysis, and that would be a different project. And the three years after that, you might want to interact with, um, you want to bring in people who are impacted by your analysis, because there's all sorts of different ways of thinking about data science and how it interacts with the world. And of course, you could th be thoughtful and set up your data inside its institute to be itself data driven, so you could see what works and what doesn't, and what, ins what inspires people and what brings in grants, and what actually seems to in a long-term sense, um, create um, good research. So a couple lessons I got from Chris Wiggins before I left. Any kind of, and he's on the executive board of ITSE. He's also on the education board and on the entrepreneurial board, so he set up partnerships with, on, with the startups. Um, any kind of mission that you create, mission attached to a data science institute has to be novel. Has to, there has to be something you offer that, you don't see at Cornell, um, the, the new Cornell Tech, or you, NYU, which also has a new thing, or it's a, um, it has to be coherent, it has to be doable, I didn't write that down, but it has to be doable. Um, and, as, and there's an inverse relationship between size and velocity, so one of the reasons at the end that it's a took three years to start making progress is because they started out massive. Their first um, campaign was to hire 75 faculty. So that you know, as, if you try to do boil the ocean, it takes a while. So I don't know what that means. It might it, all it means is you have to be patient, depending on how big you want to be. Also, obviously, there has to be a good incentive structure in place. As I think I might have said, the funding for ITC went into the engineering school, and all the schools are siloed in terms of their money. So there's the arts and sciences, there's the medical school, and you ha and they had to think pretty hard about how to get medical 
researchers interested in doing this, and it, it's about money. And finally, I just want to make the point that, well, earlier from one of the speakers, we um, heard this idea that, that when the data from different fields sits next to each other, we will magically find connections. I don't think that's true. Going back to my original examples, people use different vocabulary, even if they've come to the same mathematical or analytical approach, they use different words. I was thinking once of um, building a huge network of mathematics papers, like connected, in directed graph, like this one was referenced by that one, and this is referenced by that one, or maybe not um, just explicit references, it would be even better if I just said topics. These are related because they have some of the same, using natural language processing to say these are the related to each other in topic. And then I realized that that wouldn't actually get me where I wanted to go because what I really want to go is I want to say when are two math, two math papers related in ideas? That's not the same thing as words. And that's the, what we've learned is that people who come at the same ideas but they have totally different vocabulary. That's not going to happen through a machine learning algorithm. That's only going to happen through a community. So the connectors, so, Ella, so Noemi told me that in the last three years, she's, she's become the connector between the medical school and the computer science department. She knows everyone there. She knows what they do. And when someone needs to know who can I talk to that does this, she knows who to go to them to go to. So you need connectors. So I just want to thank Chris Wiggins and Noemi for my interviewing um, them with annoying questions, and I'd love to take questions. Thanks. So we'll have a respondent first and then oh. take questions if we could. So uh, let me introduce to you Steve Gervin. Steve is the Deputy Provost for Science and Technology, as well as the Eugene Higgins Professor of Physics and Applied Physics. His academic research is in theoretical quantum physics. His portfolio includes a long list of things, including central campus science departments, the School of Forestry and Environmental Studies, the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences, and collaboration on science strategy with the School of Medicine, and a good partner for me in working in high-performance computing. Steve? Uh, well, thank you, Kathy, for uh, <clears throat> making an interesting case for, um, for Data Science Institute. Uh, let me start by saying I've met a large set of mathematicians and a large set of people persons, and until today the intersection was a null set. Um, so I'm pleased to, pleased to meet you. Um, so you've, I mean, I was struck by sort of the, the one slide where you used the word urgent um, uh, about ethics, standards, policy, and complexity, and, and perhaps universities are the last place standing that can try to sit down and think about some of these important topics and in a way that's... Um, as unbiased as possible. It's certainly true that we're the last bastion for basic curiosity-driven research that has no apparent, like most basic research, no apparent applications. And yet, decade after decade, uh, surprising applications do appear often on a rather long time scale uh, inconsistent with um, corporate budgeting and federal annual budgeting processes. Uh, and of course, a place like Yale that has very strong humanities and uh, 12 prof uh, professional schools, and excellent law schools you mentioned, um, is a place that can think about some of the implications for the human race for some of these uh, amazing tools that the scientists and engineers and uh, entrepreneurs are creating and unleashing on us. Um, and I, one of my hopes is that um, we can find a way to, to bridge the gap between the humanities and the sciences and engineering. Uh, we, there's a stupendous gap 
Uh, and there are, we are programs in digital humanities and there's some humanists beginning to think about statistics of use of words in different books and so forth on ancient texts. Um, and we have a computing in the arts program, but we still have a, you know, a tremendous gulf. I mean, when we, we had a Yale College faculty meeting about grade inflation and an economist gave a brilliant committee report saying um, that, you know, when you have inflation in economics, you change the currency. And so let's switch from a letter grade system to a numerical grade system and people won't be able to exactly map between them and it'll be fine. And, and the human, humanist responded that I, I don't treat my students as numbers. So we have a we have a lot of work to to get the whole Yale community interested in uh, statistics and numbers. Um, so I think um, I had some slides, but I, I don't need to show them. I, my last slide, I, a few slides about the data that's pouring into Yale, um, uh, brought to you by the evil side of Moore's Law, namely the automated machines that can generate the data faster and faster in the huge uh, telescopes and the Genome Sequencing Center that does a human exome every eight minutes uh, and so forth. But we are, my, my final slide was on a topic sort of related to your um, proposal here, which is we, we have under discussion, active discussion, the creation of a, a Yale Center for Research Computing or Computational Science, which could have uh, a big overlap with uh, the proposal you're making. And we have an eye on some space and uh, even has an auditorium in it. Uh, and we're thinking about a colloquium series and getting people together uh, to talk is, is, and learn about each other's um, research problems and finding commonalities or stealing tricks that people have learned from other fields. Uh, is an incredibly important activity in such things. So uh, I think I have more, uh, just that bit of commentary rather than questions for you, and let's let the audience ask the questions. Thank you again. Uh, it's more, this is more of a suggestion than a question. But uh, it seems to me that several people, including Kathy, have commented on one of the ways to bring multiple disciplines to the same table and get them to start struggling with communication is to have a junior faculty member or a fellow who's trying to do a project that's at the interface between those two groups. I would say another way of doing that, not competing but a complementary way, is to try to be, to have teams trying to solve a problem together. Uh, and comparing and contrasting the approaches they might use from the disciplines that they were trained in. Uh, because then all that language issue begins to be quite apparent, but also you begin to understand how the mapping works between those two different, two or three or four dif different disciplines. So I, I really uh, liked your going through all the um, elements we need for data science to here. I thought that was fantastic. Uh, but one element I was thinking about is one of the things we really need for data science is we need data. And what data would we work on in this data science institute? I mean, where would that data come from? Because, you know, I hear all the time about all these interesting things that Google and Facebook are doing or that all the wizards on Wall Street are doing, but I, I don't know where, where to get that data. And, you know, I, I think where, where do we get data to do interesting things in data science? Well, there's two ways of thinking about that. It's a great question. Um, one of them is that the people who are involved in your, in your center would already have data because they already have projects. But another answer is I think you get it from Facebook. No, because, I mean, Facebook has a terrible PR problem right now because they're so proprietary and they're doing well, relatively um, questionable ac activities. And I think if you said, you know, Oh, like a public call for for examining certain things about the way they act, I think they would probably give it to you because they'd want to clear their name. 
I mean, I think, I think that's the kind of thing you should do if you had an institute. You should be challenging Facebook to show that they're not doing something that's wrong. I think having an institute would also create a, a library of data, so to speak, I mean, and also an understanding of where and how one goes about getting that data, whether you're talking about EMR data or Facebook data or, I mean, you learn from each other about how to break through the barriers, I think. I, I, thank you. I mean, and I think the librarians here have already explained that they, they want to help curate that library of data. I also wanted to mention that I didn't put into my slide deck that um, an institute like this would not only give us a way of collecting data, but probably an opportunity to build tools for research that don't exist but should, that would promote um, the kind of collaboration that would be useful in an institute. So I'm, again, that, that's something that would be novel. I don't think that's happening anywhere else. Um, for the most part, most of the other um, institutes that I know of are in some sense like vehicles for NIH and NSF grants <laughs> more than places where they're actually building tools. So I, I like to say that I couldn't have done my data journalism program without the IPython notebook. It's a tool which is minimal. It's, it, it's got to get better. It will get better. But it's a, it's a great tool. And so it's the first step towards something that we could make that's really excellent, that would make research interactive and collaborative. Yeah, I was just going to say, um, in regards to partnership with external organizations, I think that's key to really making such a department a success because, to your earlier point, you really need that practical or that real life data to analyze to, to really understand um, how things will work in the, the real world, so to speak. Um, my background is in baskets and supermarket retail analytics, and it's very hard to practice sort of data mining on those millions and billions of rows of data without actually using the actual basket data that has come from a you know a, a retailer. So I think um, having those partnerships is really key to to making such a uh, an enterprise a success. Yeah, I'd like to throw in that if you make the data science institute to some extent kind of like a consultancy, that's what consultants do. That's the model of consultancy, which is that you you get paid to do jobs. You don't own well, the, the question of IP should be separate, but you, you basically learn on the job how to do certain things and, and, and then you know how to do them. And then you can even build your own product to solve that problem once and for all, once you've done this, the same. But in any case, that's another way you could learn, not only learn techniques, but also get access to data. Yeah, I did want to throw in that I, I really think that the law school is just such an incredible resource because at the very least we were talking last night um, about the, um, the medical records um, and I think it was Eben Moglen and his group that um, sued to get the VA open sourced, like the VA system of medical record keeping open sourced and like, um, I mean, so in other words, Lawyers are a partner in in doing this the right way, and at the very least, to have them on your side so you can threaten to sue if people do something wrong, or to get FOIA requests, which is Freedom of Information Act requests, which is a trick I learned in journalism school. Um, yeah, uh, the if you were to have a data science institute, the thing I would want from them would be. I guess maybe the consultancy aspect, to be able to come in and say, I have data, I need to know how to archive it and curate it and make it accessible to others. Can you people help me? Is that, I didn't, I'm not sure I really saw that on your slides. Is that part of what you see as being the function of that kind of institute? Well, certainly it's, um, some basic education in that arena would be part of the educational initiative. I mean, part of it, any education in data science would be that kind of thing. But in terms of whether there would be actually a service where you can, I think that's what the librarians already are. But I don't know that that's enough. Well, th but they're going to up their game, so it's cool. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I, have a, I have a question 
on uh, on the potential for collaboration between uh, academics and industry when it comes to things like IRB, um, especially you mentioned the Facebook studies that have been very controversial. And something that I'd been thinking about is what if the tech industry set up its own IRB? Um, and it seems like what you talked about, some of the unique things that Yale has when it comes to interaction with policymakers might allow it to influence or talk about best practices um, in a way that you know there's either a board that's set up or just guidelines that are created in this data science center. Um, so just to get your thoughts about something like that and what role Yale, Yale could play. Well, I absolutely agree with you that that's another great um, example of how perfectly situated are for that kind of thing. The current state, of course, is that people opt into the rules on Facebook or OkCupid, and then there is no IRB to to board to pass. Um, the conversation has like evolved recently because of the I don't know if you guys have looked at the OkCupid data scientists book called Dataclism. He's gone on like NPR a bunch of times, like laughing in the face of the concept of opting in. He's like, nobody reads that, nobody understands that. Um, he's you know playing a dangerous game, which I'm enjoying because I feel like at some point policymakers are going to have to say, actually, no one understands that, and nobody reads that, and it's insufficient. Maybe that's but that's the conversation a data science institute should hold with the public and with policymakers. That is absolutely. And by the way. Policymakers can't hold that conversation by themselves because they don't understand data enough. So I just wanted to, to say one more thing is, so first of all, it was really great that you mentioned the LISP, which is actually called the Information Society Program, and really, I think, is frankly thinking a lot about these data science issues. And I just I wanted to, to just follow up a little bit on the question I asked previously about where the data is going to come from. I, what I see in academia is there's this interesting dynamic where there's a tremendous amount of biological data and also data from, say, astronomy and natural sciences. But most of the driving force in data science is the people in the commercial world, you know, hiring these people in the financial world or the retail world, advertising and so forth. And whereas we, we can't actually study that data because it's all locked up and proprietary. And I was wondering if there's some way of thinking about how to train students on available natural sciences data, but sort of make them valuable for that commercial world. Because it seems that's what ends up happening. I mean, I think Phil Bourne kind of pointed this out too with the Google bus type of thing, and how to think about that process. Well, you know, I certainly think that um, the education initiatives I, I was talking about, in, in my mind, do, do that, that they fulfill the role of setting up students to be useful um, for a job like Google. And having said that, Google is like its own universe. And um, you know, the statisticians at Google don't even work with raw data anymore because they have such an amazing infrastructure. They only use higher level languages, um, like R. Um, so it's, it's kind of weird. I mean, and then you have other things like startups that do things like scrape the web and have completely unstructured data. Um, I guess what I'm saying is it's just so varied. It's hard. It would be hard to pre to prepare students for everything. So, um, but I do want to just. I guess it's a great moment to go back to earlier today when I heard some. Maybe it was you talking about Stata versus R. Like I, one of the things that you do have to be, you just have to be scrappy as shit when you work in data science, right? So you just. I learned SQL over two days because that I needed to do something with a SQL database. You just have to learn everything. And you have to just get used to the fact that whatever you've gotten really good at is going to be old hat in a year, which is one of the reasons like when I see people talking about Hadoop, 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 I'm like, that's not, that's not what I'm going to be using next time I get a job in industry. I don't know what it's going to be. It's going to be on the grid. It's going to have aspects of Hadoop. It's going to be parallel. It's going to be fast. It's going to heat up the world's water, but it's not necessarily going to be called Hadoop anymore. Excuse me. My, uh, my understanding is that, the, uh, and I, I have a question on that uh, for you. So my understanding is that the main problem in data science, in speci specifically in academia, is not, neither the data nor, nor the algorithm. So we have frequent, a lot of different very good data sets, and they can be used in one or another way. 
And uh, we have a lot of different algorithms, and the real potential of them remained mainly untapped. So I think the most important problem is, as you put it very well, is a kind of subject matter experts in between of different domains and disciplines. Like in medicine, between uh, medical studies and computation. And well, in computation, between compu uh, those who do computation and know about algorithms and software engineers who can help to create a build and, uh, and a build up a more sophisticated and you know combined set of algorithms instead of just a few line of algorithm to do one task. Yeah, so I'm just going to make a really short pitch for my book called Doing Data Science, which just not because I get the commission, although I do, um, but because it the first chapter or two, I think, we talk about building a data science team. And it's crucial, in fact, that you, you don't, first of all, you don't think of it as a project. It's usually you're building up a, a code base and you have layers of models. You know, you have, this model will tell you whether they click, this one model will tell you whether they buy, this model will tell you whether, this other model will take those two models and to, to decide whether they're, they're clicking and going away and not coming back and buying, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and in order to do that, in order to assemble a team, you, f you find people who are good at different things. You have a domain expert, you have somebody who's good at communicating with the business people, you have, you have someone who's good at algorithms, you have someone who's good at coding, you have someone who's good at making it fast, you have someone who's good at collecting the data overnight that you need. And So it's a team effort in a way that I'm not sure it's, it's thought of the same way in research, but maybe it is, depending on the field. Questions? Thank you, guys. So that is the end of our programming for today. Thank you all very much. Our official end time is 5.30, so if you want to talk amongst yourselves or take more food, more coffee, thank you very much for coming. Uh, please fill out your evaluation forms, because that can help us a lot with next year, since the provost said apparently we have an annual event now. That makes it true. So please help us make next year's event better by filling out the evaluation forms and putting them outside. Um, thank you very much. <laughs>